This is Audible. Dark Harmony, The Bargainer, Book Three, written by Laura Thalassa, narrated by Susanna Jones and J. Ben Markson. For those who dream, keep at your magic. Stars, hide your fires. Let not light see my black and deep desires. William Shakespeare, Macbeth. Chapter One. I stare down at my hands for the fiftieth time since Des and I returned from the Flora Kingdom, looking for something that indicates that I'm different, changed, immortal. I press my palm to my heart. Beneath the steady thump of it, I feel something else. Something magical and mysterious. Something that wasn't there just days ago. My connection to Des thrums beneath my touch like a second heartbeat. The two of us now magically bound together. I slide him a coy glance. Des sits along a thick stone railing, his back resting against one of the columns bolted into the rocky island above us. The two of us linger on the lowest balcony of Somnia, one of the six floating islands of the Night Kingdom, and the capital of the Bargainer's realm. I'm angry at you, you know, I say, though there's no venom to the words. The Bargainer's eyes are closed, his head tipped back against the column. I know. I watch him as he sits on the very edge of the world, the dark night. Beyond him, in the distance, I can hear the chittering laughter of pixies riding the evening wind. You never asked me if I wanted to live forever. My voice catches on that last word. Technically, I'm not going to live forever, but it might as well be that long. Thanks to the lilac wine Des fed me, I'm now looking at a solid four hundred years of life, if not more. What will the Earth look like by the time I actually kick the bucket? How about the other world? Need to talk to Temper about how freaking long fairy lifespans are. The bargainer's eyes open, his glittering silver gaze looking fearsome and fey. He gives me a hint of a smile, though there's no humor in it. Cherub, you seem to be forgetting the fact that you were dying at the time. I was dying, and he was unwilling to let me go. He reaches a hand out to me, and his magic tugs me towards him. I frown as I'm ushered to his side. Des taps my mouth. Tell me, Callie, he says. His voice is like honeyed wine as his hands fall to my waist. Don't you want to spend more than just a few decades with me? Of course I do. That's beside the point. I'm upset that I never got a chance to decide my fate for myself, and now the future looms endlessly ahead of me. Des lifts his inked arm into the air. Out of the night, a luminescent blue smoke coalesces, solidifying more and more as it snakes its way to the bargainer's hand. By the time it reaches his palm, it's a glowing cord. I've seen this stuff before. Spun moonlight. The bargainer manipulates it in his hand, working the eerie substance until it's not just a cord, but an elaborate necklace. I narrow my eyes as he brings the unearthly jewelry to my throat. That's not fair, I say as he clasps it behind my neck, even as my fingertips reach for the necklace. You can't just pull one of your pretty fairy tricks and buy out my forgiveness. But he can, and he has, and he will do so again. These neat little tricks of his have made me forgive a lot. The bargainer turns on his perch so that his legs straddle mine. He pulls me in close, my hips fitting snugly between his thighs. My pretty fairy tricks are what you like best about me, he says, his lips skimming my mouth as he talks. His gaze drops to my lips. 
Well, that and my di- Dez! He laughs against my skin, his warm breath drawing out my goose flesh. Slowly, the laughter dies from his features. I lost you once, Callie, he says, and those seven years nearly killed me. I don't intend to lose you again. My gut clenches at the memory. Even now, I can feel the ache of his absence. It was a wound that never healed. Des presses a hand to my heart. Besides, is this not worth it? He doesn't need to elaborate on what this is. Beneath his palm, I feel the warmth of Des's presence, not just against my skin, but within me. It feels like I'm being kissed by pale moonlight, like the stars and the deep night rest under my skin, and I know that makes no sense. But there it is. His magic even has a sound. It's a low melody, the faint notes just beyond my reach. It makes me feel the same breathless excitement I used to feel at Peel Academy when evening was coming and Des was coming with it. We were once mates separated by worlds and magic. Separated no longer, thanks to the lilac wine. There are other perks that came with the wine. I now have the ability to make my claws and scales and wings appear and disappear at will, and I can sense fey magic in a way I never could before. Of course, there are drawbacks, too. Fairy gifts always have drawbacks. I'm still coming for you. Your life is mine. The bargainer catches my wrist, examining my bare forearm. Three hundred and twenty-two favors. A lifetime's worth, he murmurs. I follow his gaze. It's weird looking down and not seeing the bargainer's bracelet. The skin there is paler than the rest, and I admit my arm feels naked without the weight of all those black beads. I'd worn that bracelet every day for nearly eight years, and overnight it disappeared. It was a lifetime's worth of beads, but in the end, it was even more than that. It was a life's worth. Those beads brought me back from the edge of death. And now I have to wonder if from the very beginning, Jess's magic somehow knew it would come to this. If all that debt and all those years of waiting were its way of gathering magic, so that one day it could prevent my untimely death. Or maybe I just got really, really lucky. I lower my wrist so that I can look the Night King in the eye. Anger aside, thank you. My words come out rough. Thank you is a pitifully small show of gratitude for what Des did. Because in the end, he saved me. Again. For once, I'd like to return the favor. Dez's hand tightens around my forearm, and he brings my wrist to his lips and presses a kiss there. Does this mean you forgive me for the lilac wine? Don't push your luck, fairy boy. Cherub, hasn't anyone told you? Getting what I want has nothing to do with luck. I deal in favors. Chapter Two not a slave anymore, I see. My shoulders hike up at that voice. That voice. Last time I heard it, I was in the Flora Queen's sacred oak forest, my life bleeding out of me. And now it's at my back. We meet again, Enchantress. The Thief of Souls says. I feel the monster's fingertips trail like velvet up my arm. Your wings are gone. He leans in and breathes me in. And is that fey magic I smell? Could it be that the mighty Night King gave you the lilac wine? Don't act like you're surprised, I say. The thief had deliberately orchestrated a situation where I'd drink the wine and become fey, all so that his power could hold dominion over mine. Before then, his magic didn't work on me just as it didn't for all humans. 
What can I say? He responds. Fairies in love can be terribly predictable, I'm afraid. The thief comes around to my front, and I finally get a good look at him. He's as I remember him from my dreams and that brief moment in the woods. Jet black hair, inky upturned eyes, pouty mouth, alabaster skin. Like all the other fairies I've met, he's beautiful, almost unbearably so. Not for the first time, I wish that evil looked as it should. I step away from his touch. The night shrouds us on all sides, but even in the darkness, I can make out the twisted oaks that surround me. My stomach drops. I'm back in Mara Verdana's sacred oak forest. Could have sworn I'd left this place. Off in the distance, I can hear the faint notes of a fiddle and the snap and crackle of a bonfire. The smell of wood smoke carries on the breeze. There's something under the smell. A scent that's somewhat sweet. If only I could place it. The thief of souls walks over to a tree, his boot scuffing a root. This, I believe, is where you fucked the Night King. I feel bile rise up my throat. Jesus! Had he watched us? His gaze meets mine. How do I know that? He glances at the tree trunk again. The normally rough bark is coated in a slick substance. I have eyes everywhere. As I watch, the thief presses a hand to the glistening bark. Within seconds, whatever coats the tree trunk now spills onto the thief's hand, the dark rivulets snaking between his fingers and down his wrist. And now I place that strange scent. Blood. It drips from the tree the thief touches, and now it's smeared across his hand. The thief gives me a small smile, his eyes glinting in the darkness. I begin to hear the slow patter of rain. Only, I'm not sure it's rain that's dripping from the tree's boughs. As I watch, the oak in front of me starts to groan and tremble. The thief eyes me up and down. Fey magic suits you well, Enchantress. I confess that I'm eager to see how it interacts with my own. Around me, the trees crack and splinter, making wet, popping noises. One by one, the trunks peel open like banana skins. Nestled inside each is a sleeping soldier, all of them still as death. Blood oozes down their skin and drips from their tattered clothes— the oak next to the thief ruptures, revealing a bronze-skinned fairy. The thief touches the soldier's cheek, and for an instant his face morphs into that of the sleeping man. Then the illusion is gone, and he's himself once more. I shudder. I've been waiting a while for this day to come. He says distractedly, still staring at the soldier. He drops his hand and turns his full attention to me. Tell me, Enchantress, can you make a man, any man, fall in love with you? Not just enchant them for a time, but truly conquer their hearts? My skin's pricking. The thief leaves the soldier's side, pacing towards me. Around us, the sound of wood splintering and blood dripping swells until I feel I might go mad. All at once, the woods fall eerily silent. Without warning, my siren flares to life, triggered by some pressing, unknown fear. My skin brightens, illuminating the thief's face in the dark night. His eyes take on a fascinated sheen. Yes, he says almost to himself. I bet you could. He closes the distance between us. I do miss the days when I thought you a simple slave. Perhaps when you were mine— I'll pretend you still are one. He catches one of my wrists. You'll wear metal cuffs and a collar like the slaves of old. And then you'll be my enslaved enchantress. And together we'll see just how close you can come to making someone like me feel affection. He dares to threaten us. 
Never again will we fall under his yoke. I hope you can manage it, he continues, more for your sake than mine. I'm not known for being gentle with my playthings. Just ask Mara. I stare at him for a long moment, my claws sharpening, barely staying my siren's violent tendencies. Then all at once I release my hold on her. My free hand moves almost without my noticing it. I strike, swiping at his face. My claw tips tear open the skin of his cheek in four evenly spaced lines. Almost immediately blood begins to drip from the wounds. The thief looks amused. I don't get any warning before he throws me against the tree he'd been towing only minutes before. I let out an angry shout as I hit the bloody trunk, my chest pressed up against the sleeping soldier, my eyes staring at the man's bloody face. Behind me, the thief pins me in. Normally I like my women docile. He whispers against my ear. But you? You all enjoy fighting. Breaking. His words are decidedly sexual, and I remember all those female soldiers and the children he'd forced upon them. I grit my teeth, my nails digging into the tree trunk. Never, my siren vows. We will kill him first, and we will relish it. I hear a moan on the wind and the trees shiver, their leaves beginning to fall from the branches like tears. In front of me, the soldier's eyes snap open. Oh, shit. The thief leans into my ear again, his lips brushing the sensitive skin there. Enjoy the carnage. I do hope you survive it. The screams rip me from my sleep. I jerk up in bed, wide awake in an instant, my breath coming in startled gasps. Not in the Queen's Oak Forest, not pinned to a rotting tree, not in the thief's clutches. The dim lamps hanging above me illuminate the bargainer's otherworld chambers. I'm safe. For now. The screams filter back through my awareness. Then again... Dez stands at the foot of the bed, his talon-tipped wings spread out, looking like one of Hell's angels as he stares at a point above my head. I follow his gaze, but there's nothing there. My eyes meet his as more shrieks vibrate through the bones of the castle. There's something about the sound, like it's one voice coming through many mouths. I remember my dream, the male soldier's eyes opening... Something cold skitters up my spine. There are no sleeping men here in the Night Kingdom. I try to reassure myself. And it's true. There are no sleeping men here in Somnia. But a thousand feet beneath us, an army's worth of women lay sleeping. The screams filter in through my thoughts. At least the women were sleeping... I'm pretty goddamn sure they're now awake. Chapter 3 All at once the screams cut off and the silence that follows is somehow even more ominous. What in all the worlds? Des and I are still staring at each other. One second passes, then two, three, four. It's so terribly quiet. Perhaps I imagined it all. But then a wave of shrieks start up, trickling in like the beginnings of a storm. First it's a single alarmed shout, then another, and then it's several. They sound so very far away. The bargainer closes his eyes for several seconds as though the sound pains him deep. What are the chances I could persuade you to hide somewhere safe? He asks, opening his eyes his voice silken. Hide somewhere safe? What exactly does he think is going to happen? I kick my sheets off, swinging my legs out of bed. Zero, I say. His throat works. I can't lose you, cherub. For a moment, the crafty bargainer's pain is transparent. Not again. I can still see his face as I slipped into that final darkness, 
You are not leaving me, Callie. It's still so fresh. Des shudders his expression, the softness dissipating from it as though it never was. Black battle leathers materialize next to me. I stare at them, my mind racing to catch up with the situation. You remember your training? Des's voice doesn't sound quite right. It's not mocking or teasing. He sounds far too serious. There's only one reason he'd think to ask me that. We're going to have to kick some ass. I nod. Good. He stands, his brows furrowed as he takes me in. If I can't hide you, I will simply have to unleash you. Unleash me. Said like I'm an unstoppable force. Methinks he might believe in me a tad too much. More screams filter in from the depths of the island, near where the sleeping women have been left to rest. In my mind's eye, I can still see those soldiers in their glass coffins, each one buried with a weapon. I've been waiting a while for this day to come. I suck in a breath, realizing now what Des already has. All those women were laying at the core of the island, waiting like bombs to detonate. And tonight, the Thief of Souls just lit the fuse. Des's magic brushes against my skin, and the skimpy nightgown I wear melts off my body, the fabric pooling around my hips and leaving me bare-breasted. Before I can so much as cover myself, the drawer of the nearby armoire opens and out floats an entire outfit. It drifts through the air, then settles on me, the fabric parting like butter as it touches my skin, molding to my body before stitching itself back together. More of Des's magic. Then come the battle leathers. Then my boots, each one slipped on with a little help from Dez's magic. He watches me the entire time, his eyes fierce with resolve. I will destroy the world before I lose you again, they seem to say. I'm sliding out of bed when the final piece of my outfit floats over to me. The belt that holds my holstered daggers wraps itself around my waist, the labradorite hilts of my blades gleaming. Dressed and armed within seconds. The bargainer isn't fucking around. It's only once I'm ready to kick ass and take names that his own gear rushes through the air at breakneck speed, fastening onto his body faster than I can follow. His leathers, a sword, a pair of throwing knives, a dagger strapped to his ankle, and another that circles his bicep. Dressed as he is, I'm pretty sure he could make women spontaneously orgasm with just a look. God, now is not the time for my filthy thoughts. The screams are getting louder. In case you missed it, Des says, those soldiers who slept beneath my castle are now awake, and they mean to overthrow my rule. I don't ask him how he knows this. My heart pounds a little faster as Des essentially confirms what I feared. The female soldiers Karnon imprisoned and abused are now our enemies. These women aren't civilians. Then I King continues. They've defended this kingdom for decades, centuries even. They will not hesitate to hurt you, and they will not show you or anyone else mercy. When you come across one... Go for a kill shot, and do not waste your remorse on them. I assure you, they won't waste theirs on you. My wings are itching to reveal themselves as adrenaline spikes my blood. The bargainer turns from me, his eyes closing. He bows his head as if in prayer, but I can feel the thrum of his restless energy as it builds within him. It sings across our bond and vibrates along my skin— the shadows billow about the room. I barely have time to register what's about to happen when Dez's magic explodes out of him. Darkness sweeps across the room, blanketing the world around us in an instant, shaking the very foundations of the castle. It overwhelms my senses until I'm no one and nothing more than a pinprick of thought in the vast expanse of darkness. And then I'm not even that. I've been here once before— the last time Dez's magic blasted out of him, Karnon, the Fauna King, and hundreds of other fae died. I 
steel myself for that same outcome. But when the darkness slams back into Dez, the screams haven't quieted. The bargainer staggers back, his face incredulous. I can't kill them. The sleeping soldiers, he means. I don't know what's more shocking. That Dez was ready to single-handedly end the attack, despite the soldiers being Night Kingdom Fey, Or that it didn't work? I've seen the power he wields. If he wanted to, he could destroy entire cities with his will alone. What could possibly be strong enough to withstand that sort of magical attack? My eyes moved the weaponry strapped to his body. Better yet, how are we supposed to defeat what Dez's power alone couldn't? The screams are filling the night, stealing my breath from me. They're moving fast, he says, and they're headed our way. And we're to meet them in combat. I take a deep breath. The last time I fought an enemy was only days ago, and that hadn't ended too well. Here's to hoping I do a little better tonight. I shake out my hands as I begin to move, heading for the door. Dez's form flickers disappearing for a moment only to materialize directly in front of me. His intense eyes lock on mine. You know I trust you, respect you, and above all else, love you. But gods give me grace, Callie, I will have a reckoning with you if you go rogue on me. Ye of little faith, I only did that once, and that was the time the foe Des and I faced was Temperance Temper Darling, my best friend and sorceress. I'm not going to go rogue on you, Des. Just so we're clear. Reluctantly, he steps out of the way, and then the two of us are exiting his rooms. The floor shivers as we stride down it. There's a rumbling in the distance like a storm coming to call, and the air carries the faintest hint of something cloying and foul. What is that smell? I ask Des as I follow him through the castle. Our immediate surroundings are far too quiet. Dark magic, he says over his shoulder. I raise my eyebrows. I can smell magic? That's not normal. Fey magic, Des specifies. And yeah, apparently you can. All right, I guess I can roll with that. Footfalls pound up the hall. Dez's wings flare protectively, but the individuals that turn the corner are some of Dez's royal aides. Where's Malachi? Dez demands, clearly interested in talking strategy with his general. The aides look at each other, perplexed. Haven't seen him, one of them says. Check the sorceress's rooms, I say. Temper undoubtedly has Dez's general chained to her bed. I'm not the only one with a taste for fairies. The bargainer runs a hand through his white hair. How many soldiers are stationed here on Somnia? He asks one of the aides. Eight hundred and fifty. There are a few hundred more on the other islands. The rest are stationed at the borderlands or on peacetime leave. Des rubs his mouth. I know what he's thinking. We're outnumbered. There are easily over a thousand sleeping women beneath this castle. If they're out for blood, they're going to overtake us. Call in as many reinforcements as you can, Des orders. Send all night soldiers to the palace. The previously sleeping women are going to try to take the castle. We can't let that happen. I glance out the nearby row of arched windows. Bursts of light are flashing across Somnia like the bulbs of a camera. With them come screams. So many screams. The aides incline their heads, and then they're off, storming back through the castle to carry out the Night King's orders. I note that none of his men tried to linger and guard him, nor did they try to sequester him away to wait out the battle. In that regard, fairies are different from humans. Or maybe the battle-tested Dez, with his war cuffs and his darkness, is just different from other leaders. The bargainer begins to stride down the hall again. Get those daggers ready, cherub he says over his shoulder. We're going to face the women head on. I reach for my weapons with shaky hands. It's one thing to spar with Dez, another to prepare for true battle. My skin shimmers as the siren bleeds into me. 
With the change comes a vicious sort of confidence I was missing a second ago. I pull out my blades, the etched faces of the moon glinting along the length of the metal. The daggers are a familiar weight in my palms. Deeper in the castle there's a rumble, followed by an explosion. Then more screams. Besides Dez's aides, we see no one. That, more than anything, has my claws sharpening and my wings manifesting. We're hunting predators. The shrieks get louder as we move down the palace hallways, heading ever closer to the main entrance. And then we turn down a corridor that's not abandoned. Several fairies are fleeing our way, their eyes wild and their clothes bloody. One of them has the wherewithal to stop when he sees the king. Your Majesty, he pants. Please don't go that way. They're slaughtering everyone in their path. The bargainer's gaze slides from the man to the hall. Get yourself to safety, is all Dez says, and then he's striding forward once more. The man spares me a hasty glance, and then he takes off like a jackrabbit. Dez and I head down another hall towards a staircase. More fairies flee past us, and the screams are getting louder, closer. I tighten my grip on my daggers, my tense wings hiking up behind me, my skin glittering under the sparking wall sconces. As we descend the staircase, the scene below us slowly unveils itself. My blood chills at the sight. There are bloody bodies scattered across the floor, their eyes glassy. Across the landing, a female soldier closes in on a palace aide, her battle axe raised above her head. She's going to cleave the man in two, just as it appears she has these other unfortunate souls. In front of me, Dez disappears. He materializes between the two fairies just as the soldier brings the axe down. I swallow my scream as he catches the weapon by its handle. The aide ducks out from behind Dez and runs off. The Night King clucks his tongue, looking completely at ease as the soldier yanks the axe against his grip. Didn't anyone tell you that it's poor taste to kill a man indoors? The soldier growls in frustration as she tries to dislodge the axe from Dez's hold. When that doesn't work, she swings at him with her free arm, her fist closed. Dez shimmers out of existence just long enough for the blow to pass through him and the soldier to stumble off balance. He reappears, kicking the soldier square in the chest, the blow throwing her off her feet. She hits the ground hard, and I can hear the audible whoosh as her breath is knocked from her lungs. Her axe slips out of her grip, skidding several feet behind her. It's all that blood, Des continues, prowling towards her. Easy enough to get it out of the floor with a little magic, but spirits love to cling to the last of their lifeblood. No one wants a ghost haunting their house. The soldier bares her teeth at the Night King, scuttling back to grab her axe. She snatches it up just as Dez closes in on her. Casually, the bargainer steps on her wrist, the bone breaking with a sickening snap. The soldier screams, the sound more an animalistic cry of frustration than actual pain. That's the spookiest part of it all. She's so hell-bent on carnage that her pain takes a backseat to it. Another fairy, a nobleman by the looks of his attire, sprints onto the landing from another flight of stairs, a soldier at his back. She pauses, lifting her bow and knocking in an arrow. I don't fucking think so. I cock my arm back and throw one of my daggers. It flips hilt over point. With a wet thump, it lodges itself into the soldier's throat. Holy shit. I wasn't expecting my aim to be that good. And oh god, I just mortally wounded someone. The thought sits like a stone in the pit of my stomach. The woman stumbles backwards, her hand going to her bloody throat. With every beat of her heart, more and more crimson liquid spills from the wound. It reminds me of my stepfather, of the penchant I have for nicking that particular artery. I expect to hear the soldier let out a pained cry or to see fear in her eyes, any indication that there's a person residing in that body. But when her gaze finds mine, there's nothing behind those eyes except cold, calm detachment. Grabbing the hilt of my embedded dagger, the soldier rips it out of her throat. 
God damn, that is way too hardcore for me. Before my eyes, her wound begins to close. Are you fucking serious? I mean, I know that only seconds ago I was horrified at her death, but now the bra just needs to go. She begins stalking forward, my weapon in her hand. I tighten my fist around my remaining dagger, adrenaline pounding between my ears. Halfway to me, she hesitates, and her hand goes back to her neck wound. As I follow her movements, I realize that beneath all the blood, the wound is still open. I don't know why, but it stopped healing. She doesn't get any more time than that. Before she or I can do anything, Des manifests in front of her, sword in hand. In one clean motion, he skewers her. Her eyes widen as he removes his bloody blade from her stomach, and a moment later her knees give out. The soldier's glassy eyes stare up at the ceiling, and her mouth opens and closes until the last of her life drains out. The bargainer kneels down and takes my blade from her hand. A moment later he vanishes, only to wink into existence right in front of me. He hands me my blade. You did good, Cherub, he says, his eyes shining as he takes me in. I wet my mouth, my eyes moving to the soldier. Being good at killing is no compliment. My siren preens at it anyway. Des grabs my jaw and gives me a quick kiss, and my siren? She sings at the taste of my mate on my tongue and the scent of blood in the air. Once the bargainer releases my jaw, his gaze lingers on my face a moment longer. Reluctantly, he turns away, stalking through the palace once more, heading for the sounds of screaming. Taking a deep breath, I follow after him. We pass several more fallen fairies as we make our way through the castle, their deaths gruesome, violent. My warring natures can't decide what to make of it. Part of me feels nauseous and horrified, and part of me is filled with vindictive bloodlust. Make them suffer. Make them pay, my siren whispers. The next sleeping soldier we come across lingers in a dim hallway, crouched over a body, I squint at her form. Almost all the sconces are snuffed out in this corridor, like the light can't bear to witness this horror. The soldier's head snaps up, her eyes glinting like a cat's. Her face is splattered with blood, and the knife she wields is doused in blood, the crimson liquid coating the blade, the hilt, and most of her hand. There's no way the fairy beneath her is alive. The bargainer is on the soldier in a second, sword in hand. In one clean, swift stroke, he lops off her head. The thing hits the ground with a sickening thud, the soldier's body joining it a moment later. A pool of dark blood spills from both. I stare at the head. Its eyes are still blinking. Oh, my sweet lord, why are its eyes still blinking? And holy hell, its mouth is opening and closing like a fish gasping for breath. I can feel my siren pressing upon me, growing ever more excited at the sight and smell of blood. I want it all, she whispers. Their pain, their power, their very lives. Mine to savor, mine to take. A part of me wants to wrap my siren's viciousness around me like armor, but a larger part of me is just as disturbed by her as I am at all the carnage. I don't want any part of me to thrive on these violent deaths. So I do what I've always done. I keep her leashed as best I can. Forcing myself to move, I head over to the civilian sprawled across the ground and kneel at her side. Her eyes are closed, her face is slack, and her neck is a mess of bloody tissue. And then there's all the blood outside her body. No human could survive that much blood loss. But then, this isn't a human. I see her chest rise and fall and hear her take a laborious breath, the sound broken and ragged. Des kneels down next to me, and he places two fingers against the woman's forehead. I can taste a hint of his magic in the air as it settles around the injured woman. Her eyes flutter and she shudders out a breath. What did you do? I ask. The bargainer stands. I took away her pain. 
The rest her magic will have to fix on its own. I am no healer. I remember the last soldier I fought, the way her wound began to close only to stop healing. If the soldier's magic couldn't heal that wound, can this woman's magic heal hers? Unlikely. The thought filters in from a new part of me, the part that drank the lilac wine, the part that's now a little fae. I can sense the fairy's magic slipping outside her body. It lingers in her spilled blood, and it's evanescing into the air. That magic seeps into the walls and the ceiling, and then it's no longer this woman's magic, it's the castle's. What had Des said? Spirits love to cling to the last of their lifeblood. This woman's magic is slipping away from her. Will her soul slip out with it? Will I be able to sense that, too? I don't stick around long enough to find out. We leave her there, once again making our way to the main entrance of the palace. The closer we get, the more bodies begin to stack up. Here the sounds of fighting are almost deafening. I can tell by the noise alone that a battle rages in the great entryway of the palace. Rather than heading there, Des takes us to a staircase that leads farther down. Where are we going? I ask. The dungeons. The dungeons? I echo. Why? We come to a thick door made of hammered bronze. I can feel a ward humming off the thing. He turns to me. Wait here, love. Des! But he's gone. Chapter 4 I adjust my grip on my daggers, then shift my weight from one leg to the other. I stare at the metal door ahead of me, the sounds of fighting at my back. My heart is jackknifing in my chest as my adrenaline zings through me. One minute ticks away, then another. The battle above me is calling to my siren, luring my dark nature. My wings flutter and resettle with my agitation, and my skin still glows as bright as ever. I begin to edge away from the door, feeling the pull to return to the fighting. The sane part of me is not all that gangbusters to kill more people. But I can't just stand here while innocent fairies— The bargainer returns to my side, stopping the thought in its tracks. In his hands he holds a stained wooden box. I glance between him and it. Seriously, what is going on? Des leans down and whispers to the box in what I'm assuming is old Fay. He pauses, listening, then speaks some more. As he speaks, I can sense the container's enchantments unraveling. Once they dissolve away, Des stops speaking. For a moment, nothing happens. Then the lid springs open. I can't help myself. I lean forward and peer inside the box. It's... empty. Until, of course, it isn't. Shadows I didn't notice at the bottom of it begin to stir. These don't look like Dez's shadows, which thicken and coil like smoke. This shadow is a two-dimensional, paper-thin thing that moves. A bony shadow hand reaches from the depths of the container, its fingers gripping the edge of the box one by one. It pulls itself out, slithers down the side, then drips from a corner onto the floor. My breath stutters. I've seen this creature before, in Dez's throne room. A bog. I'd watched the creature eat a fauna fay who thought it would be a good idea to gift the King of Night a bag of heads. Bet the dude regretted that decision. Remember our deal. Dez tells the shadow monster. Deal? Only the bargainer could have struck such a thing in the sliver of time he left my side. And with the bog, of all things. Yes, my king. The hair raises on my forearms when the creature speaks. I'm staring at a living nightmare. Literally. The bog eats its victims alive, and in the long time it takes to digest them... Those fairies are cursed to live out their worst nightmares. Only the other world could be home to such a frightening monster. And now Dez has set this thing loose. The bog begins to move, then hesitates. 
I still, as I feel it, notice me. Not a creature I want to catch the attention of. A tempting adversary, my siren whispers because she has no sense. Dez steps in front of me, his wide shoulders blocking out the bog. Better kill whatever thought is running through your head, he growls. Look at the Night Queen again, and you'll find out why your comrades fear me. Night Queen? And all shall fall under my thrall. The siren in me is dying to be set free. Understood. The bog hisses. I just barely catch sight of its form as it slithers back the way we came. Dez and I follow it back up the stairs. By the time we make it to the palace's main entrance, there are dozens and dozens of fairies locked in combat, their wings flared wide behind them. Some of them are civilians, but many of them are soldiers defending the palace from other soldiers, former comrades now pitted against each other. My eyes sweep over the rest of the gilded entry hall. The place looks like a slaughterhouse. Bodies are scattered across the floor, most of them servants, nobles, or aides, essentially fairies who weren't trained to kill. There are fallen night soldiers as well, but even in death, it's hard to tell whether the soldier defended or raided the castle. I stare, shocked at the chaos. Amongst it all, I see the bog slithering about, swallowing up one traitorous soldier after the next— I have no idea how it knows friend from foe, but I figure Dez ironed out those details with the monster before he let it loose. Swords are clashing, arrows are flying, blood is spraying. Dark magic fills the air. I can smell it, taste it, feel its oily nature clinging to my skin. Dez pulls me in close, stealing a quick kiss from my lips. Stay safe, love, he says. His eyes dip to my glowing skin and his grip tightens. I feel his hesitation, the glamour and our bond keeping him at my side. Somewhere underneath his armor he wears three bronze war cuffs, awarded to him for valor. The thought of those bands comforts me. There's nothing I have to show him that I'll be fine. Just as I open my mouth to speak, an arrow whizzes by my head. Acting on aggression and instinct, Dez withdraws his sword, the weapon ringing as it's released. He spins towards the melee, his eyes scanning the room. The moment he finds the archer, he vanishes from my side, leaving me alone. The world has a hollow feel to it, the shrieks, the smells, the sights. Ours to save her, the siren whispers. Join in. Let's take part in it until there's enough blood to swim in. I take a step, then another, drawn by the twisted pull of the battle. Around me, several fairies' eyes catch on my shining form. A soldier closes in on me, her eyes bright but her face impassive as she lifts her sword. I look at the weapon and my blades suddenly seem small and paltry— no match for this woman with her quick reflexes and her bloodlust. Let her try to kill us. Then again, I happen to know a little someone who fits that bill pretty well. Normally, I'm careful to contain my siren, even when I use my magic. Now I let that control slip just a little. I feel her laughter bubble in my chest. This will be fun. As soon as the soldier swings her weapon, I move, my body bending and dipping to avoid the hits. My movements feel fluid, like water rolling down a river. I duck, spin, and with a swift thrust, shove my daggers up into her belly. It's an impossible strike, one that even a week ago I wouldn't have been able to make. And now I have to wonder if, along with long life and a sense for magic, the lilac wine gave me other fey attributes— such as agility and precision. I yank my blades up her torso, cutting through flesh and other softer things, before I draw back. The soldier staggers back as I withdraw, but not even the wounds I inflict are enough to stop her. She attacks me again. I block the first blow, but I'm not quick enough to entirely avoid the second one. I feel the blade of one sink into my leathers, then bite into my skin— 
I cry out and spin, my dagger pointed out. The weapon cleanly slices open the woman's neck. Yes. My siren laughs up the carnage. I'm opponentless for all of five seconds, and then another woman is on me, her curving blades glinting wickedly beneath the light of the giant bronze chandelier above us. Bending my knees, I spring into the air, the thick strokes of my wings forcing me up. Several feet off the ground, I tuck my wings tight against my back and drop onto the soldier, burying my dagger in her neck. Her curved blade arcs through the air, the point skewering me in the thigh before she falls limp onto the floor. I collapse on top of her, hissing at the wound. A shaky hand goes to my thigh. I grind my teeth against the sharp pain. I think it's deep, definitely deep enough to make walking a problem. I push myself off the dead fairy, nearly crying out when I place weight on my leg. But just as soon as I feel the full force of the injury, it begins to close, the blood trickling off. Fay magic at work. Another perk of the lilac wine. Once my wound heals, I jump back in the melee. Across the room I spot Malachi and Temper, the latter with a crazy smile on her face as they fight the sleeping soldiers. And far above us, Dez fights in mid-air, his enemies dropping from the sky— the soldiers keep coming, and it takes all my focus to fight them off. By the time I reach the main entrance of the castle, the smell of magic and blood coats the air like perfume. I'm dappled in the liquid, wearing it like another layer of armor. Hard to believe that I agonized over one single death for years. By the end of the night, if I'm still alive, my death count will be in the double digits. The fighting spills into the courtyard, and bursts of fey magic light up the night as fairies draw on their power. I briefly sheathe my daggers as my gaze moves over the landscape. The human part of me is trying not to heave. The grounds are strewn with glassy eyes and gutted bodies. Soldiers are killing soldiers, civilians are getting cut down, and the formerly sleeping women are out there in droves alongside their spawn— now that the night has come, those creepy casket children have cast off all pretenses of innocence. Their tiny bodies feast on prone fairies, their eyes glowing with unholy malice. It's madness I can't make sense of. Dez lands next to me and grabs my hand. He looks like a savage, his battle leathers bloodstained and his pale hair speckled with the fluid. It's unnerving just how much the look suits him. You good? He asks, his eyes bright with concern and ironically fade to light. Fairies and their feral hearts, the siren whispers. He's enjoying this almost as much as we are. His gaze drops to my lips, his other hand reaching for my shining skin. I wet my dry mouth and nod. I'm fine. To emphasize my point, I will my wings away. They don't disappear immediately, and even once they do, it's a struggle to keep them concealed. It's a waste of an effort. The Night King's still staring at my lips, looking entranced by them. Around us, the air thickens with static electricity, raising the hairs along my arm. I look around, trying to figure out its source. Dez tears his gaze from my mouth, his eyes moving over our surroundings. Something bad is coming. Boom. The ground beneath me trembles and debris flies into the air as something on the other side of the palace explodes. A moment later, I feel a wave of dark magic slam into me, knocking me off my feet. Jess catches me before I hit the ground, and the two of us share an intense look. A fresh batch of screams rise from the other side of the castle. I was wrong. Something bad isn't coming— it's already here. Next to me, the bargainer's wings appear at his back, expanding ominously. I'll be right back, Cherub. With that, he vanishes from my side. Dez! I can still feel the press of his hands against me, but he's gone. My eyes move towards the back of the palace where the screams are coming from. That's where he went. I sprint towards the back of the castle, my heart pounding wildly. There's pressure near my shoulder blades, my wings fighting to reveal themselves. 
Ignoring the sensation, I run down one of the cobblestone paths that winds around the palace, the stones smeared with blood. Ahead of me, a dead fairy lay sprawled across the pale grass, her arms stretched wide, her eyes glassy. How many lives have been cut down in a single night? Too many. We'll make our enemies pay for the slight. Fairies flee past me, some taking to the air and some sprinting on foot, all of them running from whatever it is that caused the explosion. When I round the back of the castle, I come up short. I have to lock my knees at the sight in front of me. Dear God, the circular annex that contains the Night Kingdom's royal portal is in use, its double doors obliterated. Row after row of gore-covered soldiers pour through it, their eyes vacant. They march onto palace grounds, their uniforms carrying the symbol of the Night Kingdom. The sleeping men. There are dozens and dozens of them, and more are coming with every passing second. I stagger at the sight of them. I'm going to die. I'm going to die, and it will all be for nothing— Finding Des only to lose him, spending an agonizing seven years without him, enduring Carnon, nearly dying at the green man's hands, drinking the lilac wine. None of it matters anymore because an army of possessed soldiers want to wipe the Night King's people from the face of the earth, and I will be just one more casualty. Ahead of me, Des stands very, very still. Even though I can't see his face, I swear I can sense his despair. The numbers were against us when it was just the sleeping women attacking. With the men? They're insurmountable. The soldiers begin to break ranks, fanning out to attack anything that lives. I'm one of those things. So is Dez, and so are the few fairies scattered around us who have decided to stay and fight. The bargainer gives a rallying cry and then disappears, reappearing in the middle of the sleeping soldiers long enough to deal out death before disappearing and reappearing again. He glances over his shoulder at me, his eyes wild. Hide yourself, Callie, he cries as soldiers close in on him from all sides. I don't have the will to move or the fear to flee. Even my siren is quiet. She won't whisper the truth. We can't possibly win this. There are a handful of soldiers for every one of us, and those odds are only worsening as more sleeping soldiers spill out from the portal. And once they're done with us, they'll move on to other fairies, perhaps until none are left standing. This is no battle, it's a butchery. And I don't want to bear witness to it any more. Stop, I whisper, my voice harmonizing as the battle unfolds. I blink as my vision blurs. Already soldiers have caught sight of my glowing skin. They're sprinting towards me, weapons brandished, as though I'm some great and terrible threat. The sleeping men begin hacking into what loyal soldiers and civilians remain standing, cutting them down in seconds. Stop! I say louder. No one's listening. Of course they're not. They have more important things to do, like trying to stay alive. But I can't leave it alone. I'm coming apart, and this might be the time that does me in for good. Stop! I shriek, like a madwoman. To my wonder, they do exactly that. Weapons stop clashing. Fairies stop moving. Everything goes utterly and absolutely still. I touch my throat. Nah. I look at the night fairy nearest me, who's only yards away. His foot is lifted as he stands frozen mid-stride, blade in hand, his face intensely focused on me. Even from here I can smell the foul odor coming off of his clothes, the scent like death decided to go dumpster diving. You, I say, pointing to the soldier. Give me your sword, I demand, opening my palm. The fairy unfreezes and sedately walks over to me before handing me his weapon. My fingers close over the sword's hilt, and a wicked smile blossoms on my face. I can fucking glamour fairies. Hold on to your tits, world. Callie is back. Chapter 5 I can freaking glamour fairies. 
before I drank lilac wine, that wasn't the case. I should have realized the elixir reconfigured this aspect of my magic as well as the others. My eyes moved to my mate. To my shock and horror, maybe a smidge of delight. He's also frozen. Des, I call, my voice melodic with my power. Come here. The bargainer vanishes, reappearing at my side an instant later, an eyebrow arched. Other than that, he's placid, all except for his eyes. His silver eyes sparkle in a way that is wickedly excited. I release you from my glamour, I say. I've clearly gotten rusty on this whole glamour thing because it's not just Dez who follows my command. A few sleeping soldiers, including the one who just handed over his blade, now jump back into action. Honestly, Callie, newbie mistake right there. Dez is on the soldiers in an instant, cutting them down with his sword before they can get a chance to strike. Once they've been dealt with, the Night King rolls his shoulders as if to shake off my magic. So that's how it feels to be glamoured by a siren, he says, the corner of his mouth curving up just the slightest, like I've been caught by my balls. He comes in close his smirk growing. The whole thing was horribly invasive. I rather enjoyed it. The conversation is so vastly inappropriate and out of place that I let out a laugh, the sound melodic. His eyes move over my glowing features. Beautiful creature, he murmurs. You were irresistible before. He reaches out with a hand, grazing my jaw with his knuckles. I don't quite know what to do with myself now. Tez leans in and kisses me, his lips lingering. The sound of heavy footfalls breaks the spell. I draw away from the bargainer, turning towards the portal. More sleeping soldiers are marching through. Soldiers, stop! I say, my magic thick in my voice. The sleeping soldiers halt in place, their bodies filling up the doorway. You've done it, cherub, Dez says, surveying the prone fairies. You've become someone to fear. Chapter 6 It takes several hours, but eventually I manage to incapacitate all the psycho-sleeping soldiers and the casket children who were wreaking havoc on Somnia. By the looks of it, the soldiers were staging a political coup. Excuse me. A failed political coup. Thank you, Glamour. We round the guilty up, remove their weapons, and lock them in the dungeons. Right now my Glamour is making them placid, but once it wears off in a day or two, their bloodthirsty tendencies will return. Now Des and I head through the palace towards the dungeons. I open and close my palms as we go. I'm a little nervous, which is ridiculous. What I'm about to do was my idea. The fairies we pass stare at me. My skin has long since stopped glowing, so I know it's not the siren drawing their eyes. Why are they looking at me? I finally ask Des. He pauses to glance at me, then at the them in question. You really don't know? Des asks, raising an eyebrow, his gaze returning to mine. I shake my head. Cherub, he says a small smile playing at the corners of his lips. You're the enchantress who stopped an army, the human who has the power to ensnare their will if she should choose to. They are awed and afraid of you, which is the highest compliment a night fay can give you. Eventually we leave the curious eyes behind, descending down the same staircase we took only hours ago, back when Des released the bog. The two of us stop at the familiar hammered bronze door. With a brush of Dez's magic, the door swings open, revealing a long hallway that descends into darkness, the wall sconces not quite able to beat back the shadows. Inside, armed soldiers, these ones not possessed with the unholy desire to bash in as many brains as possible, Some by the time we arrive at the dungeon proper, were deep beneath the castle. I can feel the walls of this place pressing in from all sides, the sensation reminding me of when I was Karnon's prisoner, trapped in one of his many subterranean cells. 
I take a deep breath. Pretty sure that experience has given me claustrophobia for life. The sleeping soldiers are crammed into dozens and dozens of cells, and even though hundreds of them were killed, there's almost not enough room for the ones that remain. As we pass by the cells, I note that the fairies are still caught in the hold of my glamour. They stare straight ahead, their faces impassive. Don't know what's creepier, their true nature or this catatonic state they've fallen into. In the last cell, a single soldier is housed. She stands inert in the middle of the chamber, her flame-red hair falling in spirals down her back. Des, our escorts, and I all pause in front of the cell, taking in the fairy. She's oblivious to our attention. The bargainer's hand falls to the back of my neck. His face is impassive, but I can tell he's not thrilled with this little plan of mine. He doesn't, however, try to talk me out of it. Open the door. Des commands the guards, not looking away from me. The iron bars screech as the door opens. The red-haired soldier doesn't so much as glance at the door before I slip inside. I stare at her for a long moment before I let my siren surface. I release you from my glamour. I expect the soldier to attack me, but she doesn't. For several long seconds, nothing happens. Then the redhead's eyes slide to me. My muscles tense. I'm waiting for her to strike. Instead, she begins to pace back and forth, back and forth, her gaze growing distant. What is your name? I ask my voice melodic. I don't have a name, she responds. Everyone has a name, I insist. I don't. Not anymore. Losing a name is such a tiny injustice compared to everything the thief has done, and yet it's what gave her an identity, and he took that from her. What did it used to be? I ask. She pauses for so long, I'm sure she'll never speak. Muriel, she finally says, the magic coaxing the answer out of her. And do you know who I am? Muriel pauses, then slowly nods. You're the Enchantress. We are allowed to hurt you, but we are not to kill you. Not yet. He wants you alive. My claws sharpen at that. They weren't allowed to kill me? I remember how hard I fought and how vicious my assailants were. None of them seemed like they were holding back. Who wants me alive? I ask, even though I damn well know. My master. Fucking thief. The cell darkens. Apparently the king of the night is not too happy about that either. And is your master... The one who woke you from your sleep? He called, and we answered, she says, continuing to pace back and forth, back and forth. Why did you attack your comrades, Miriam? I ask, my voice lilting. She frowns when she hears her name on my lips. I don't know. She keeps pacing. What do you mean you don't know? I get that this woman's mind has been fucked three ways to Wednesday, but surely she has a better explanation for all this carnage than I don't know. We do our master's bidding, she says. Nothing more. And what does your master want? I probe. I don't know, she says distractedly. Getting nowhere. Who kidnapped you? I start again. Can she remember that far back? Some of these women have been sleeping for years. My elder brother. She replies coolly, still walking back and forth, back and forth. Her brother? I don't think I heard that one correctly. He's been dead for well over a century. Des says from the other side of the cell, my eyebrows rise and I spare my mate a glance. He knew this woman's brother? The soldier's eyes wander to the bargainer and there they rest. 
Slowly, she tilts her head, like recognition is upwelling from the depths of her memory. You, she breathes. You held me once, long ago. Come again? My skin flares with agitation. I glance between the two of them. Is this broad seriously admitting to what I think she is? He made love to me then, under the stars. My claws elongate. She is! Let's eviscerate her slowly, my siren says. It will be fun. It's a strange feeling to be jealous of a woman who, in all probability, slept with your mate centuries before you existed. A woman who's now nothing more than a shell of herself, her mind and body commandeered by the thief of souls. And yet, I still feel the hot burn of it. Des folds his arms, looking unamused. He doesn't try to explain himself to me, which is probably a good thing. Doing so would make him look guilty as fuck, and it wasn't like he cheated on me. But damn it, I want a little groveling. Is that wrong? He will grovel. The siren insists. All right, if she thinks groveling is kosher, it's probably wrong. But that doesn't mean I disagree with her. I force myself to refocus on the task at hand. Des had mentioned that Muriel's brother died a little over a hundred years ago. It takes me a moment to do the math. Not my strong suit. But once I do, I realize that the timeline doesn't work. Female soldiers started disappearing a decade ago, not a century. How could your brother have kidnapped you if he was dead? Janice had a twin, a twin who died. The thief had told me in the Flora Queen's woods... The first time you met him, you were really meeting me. Muriel's vacant eyes focus on the ground. I don't know. This vexing answer again. I had hoped. Muriel begins, then she falls to silence. Speak to me freely, I command her. Slowly, her eerie gaze shifts to meet mine. It's dark here. Very dark. The back of my neck pricks. Are you in the Night Kingdom? I ask. Yes and no. I wait for her to say more, but she doesn't. What do you mean by that? It is very dark here, she repeats. I want to rest. Why can't I rest? Do you know where the thief is? I press. You'll never find him. So everyone keeps saying. Is there anything else you can tell me? I ask. Secrets are meant for one soul to keep. I sense rather than see Des stiffen at her words. The corner of Muriel's mouth curves up. He's watching you, Enchantress. Always watching you. My master has developed a taste for slaves. My siren pushes through. You can tell your master I've developed a taste for evil fuckers. I breathe, the words harmonic as they roll off my tongue. Have him come find me. I'm eager to see him again. I'll teach him then what it means to be my bit. I wrangle my siren into submission and regain control of myself. I walk a fine line, using my glamour and trying to keep her worst tendencies at bay. The cell darkens again, and suddenly Dez is in the cell with us. Interrogation is over, he says. Before I can protest, the iron door swings open and I'm whisked out. I swivel back to face Marielle just as it clangs shut. One final question. If I let you out now, what will you do? Her eyes fall on me. Conquer. Chapter 7 Dez broods next to me, the hallway we walk down darkening with his presence. You could have let me finish the interrogation, I finally say. I mean, he's not the only one who's in a ripe mood. I have blood caked in my hair. I'm running on half a night's worth of sleep. 
My bones want to give out from post-battle exhaustion, and I needed coffee hours ago. You walk on thin ice right now, Callie. The bargainer growls. I swivel to face him, his words riling me up. I'm the one on thin ice, I say, my voice rising. You're the one who screwed the prisoner. Brought that up sooner than I intended. Two centuries ago, Dez says. Do you expect me to give you a formal apology for every person I've slept with? Because if so, I damn well better receive the same from you. You are insane. The Night King disappears from my side, only to reappear in front of me, his body blocking the way and forcing me to stop. You goaded him. He growls. You goaded the Thief of Souls to find you. He runs an agitated hand through his hair, the movement exposing one of his pointed ears. Can you not see? This is the same reason I stopped taking you on my bargains when you attended Peel Academy. I'd glamoured a man back then, too. A man who, ironically enough, knew information on the Thief of Souls. He'd been willing to die rather than share his knowledge. And still I made him talk. I still flush at the memory. And now the bargainer is essentially saying that in all that time I haven't changed. I take issue with that. I'm already in the thief's line of sight. I will not let that monster provoke me without provoking him back. A muscle in the bargainer's face ticks. He steps in close. You want to know a secret, Cherub? He asks, his voice dropping low. Earlier this evening, when I tried to stop all those sleeping soldiers back in our chambers, it didn't work. There was that moment in his bedroom when I thought he'd bleed into the darkness and end those sleeping soldiers just as he had Karnon and his men. But he hadn't been able to. Do you want to know why that wouldn't work? Dez asks. He doesn't wait for me to answer. The darkness is loyal to its own. It won't hurt another fairy that wields its power. I feel the first thread of unease at his words. That means the thief is one of my kind. He's a night fay. My knees go a little weak. A night fay? One who is impervious to Dez's magic? He is not impervious to ours, my siren whispers, her voice seductive. The king of the night cups my face. I am mad with fear for you, he says, his voice pitched low. It feels like the wheels of fate are pushing you closer and closer to the thief, and nothing I do can prevent it. That terrifies me. To hear Dez admit to being afraid? It's like that moment as a child when you see an adult cry for the first time. Like the person you depended on to have their shit together really doesn't. It's the kind of thing that shakes your world. I am sorry you had to hear about my... Past the way you did, he says hoarsely. I think this is an apology. He leans in close, his lips a hair's breadth from mine. But I will admit, I greedily drank up your reaction. With that confession, his lips press against mine. It's stupid how fast his kiss can banish my frayed nerves— he kisses away our discussion, his taste and touch consuming my thoughts. And even though the day is a mess and I'm a mess and the other world has gone to crap, for a few blissful seconds, everything is as it should be. All I want right now is a shower, coffee, and bed, preferably all at the same time. Don't tell me it can't happen. I'm in the other world. Impossible is this place's middle name. But am I going to get what I want? Nope. Instead, I have to freaking adult it, which means hauling my butt into some random room in the castle and making sense of the clusterfuck that is the present state of affairs. Well, 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 look what the cat dragged in. Temperance Darling, my best friend, colleague, and fellow troublemaker, calls out as soon as we enter. She sits alongside Malachi and several fey officials, her ankles propped on the table in front of her. Her eyes move over me. And damn, girl, looks like the cat didn't just drag you in. It had a little fun with you, too. 
My relief at seeing Temper alive is quickly eclipsed by her words. I spare my bloody battle leathers a glance before I take in Temper. She wears a white jumpsuit, and that outfit is pristine. Next to her, Malachi looks stern, his scar especially stark beneath his eye patch. He keeps opening and closing his hands, and I get the distinct impression that he wants to hurt something. As soon as he sees Dez, he stands and crosses the room in a few quick strides. He brings his friend in close, slapping him on the back. I move to the seat next to Temper. You could take a few tips from him, I say. She waves the comment away. Hugs are for pussies. I let out a little snicker, grabbing the cup of coffee resting in front of her and taking a sip from it. Hey, bitch, that was mine? Aww, I say, giving her a precious look. Does someone have trouble sharing? I take a long drink from it. Temper's eyes narrow. Careful I don't hex that coffee to splash you in the face every time you drink it, she says. I smile over the rim of the coffee. Careful I don't glamour you to tell Malachi how you really feel about him. To be honest, I don't even know if my magic works on humans anymore, but she doesn't need to know that. Temper shakes her head. That's low, Callie. The two of us fall to silence, watching Dez and Malachi grip each other's shoulders and make all sorts of man-oaths about dying by the blade to protect one another and yada, yada, yada. Malachi is just being excessive, Temper says. We heard hours ago that you two were okay. She nudges my shoulder with her own. Heard you can now glamour Faye. She puts her fist out, and I bump my knuckles against hers. Fuck yeah, my girl. Daz and Malachi speak in low tones for a little longer. Something the Night King says causes Malachi to chuckle, and something the general says draws Dez's eyes to me, his gaze intense enough to make my stomach flutter. He pulls away from his friend and heads over to the table, taking a seat next to me. His hand falls to my thigh as he nods at each of the advisors seated at the table who've also been waiting for us. A few of the advisors cast me in temper curious looks. I doubt they're used to having humans, former or otherwise, at these meetings. I'm glad to see everyone alive and well. Des begins as Malachi takes his seat. Let's get straight to the matter. The Night Kingdom fell under siege tonight at the hands of our own people. What do we know about the situation? And thus the talks begin. The group of us rehash what we already know. A bunch of sleeping soldiers woke up from their long slumber, each possessed with the need to kill and maim and conquer— then we tally up the dead and wounded, then note the damage wrought to the kingdom. We were not alone, one of the advisors says. We received reports from the other three kingdoms that they too were attacked. My dream floods back to me in all its vividness, of the thief standing amongst those poisoned oaks as they splintered open. I don't know where the line between fantasy and reality is anymore. The kingdom of Flora fell. The advisor continues. The kingdom of Flora... fell? The phrasing conjures up images of those giant cedar trees toppling to the ground, of the earth swallowing up the palace whole. It doesn't do the truth justice. An entire city was likely cut down. All those people just... gone. I can't process that sort of devastation. Not when we were just there. I danced and drank and reveled alongside Flora fairies. They might not have been my favorite people, but now knowing the deadly task those sleeping soldiers set out to accomplish... How many died? I ask. The room is silent, and the advisor looks helplessly at me while another shakes her head. Too many. All those sleeping men. The kingdom never stood a chance. Malachi tosses a sheet of parchment into the middle of the table. We've heard rumors that Mara got out in time, but the same cannot be said for the rest of Flora's citizens. Dez flicks his wrist and the parchment slides his way. The bargainer's eyes skim the notes. Fauna is gone as well, Malachi continues. 
though from our reports few died. There was no resistance for the soldiers to crush. There wouldn't even be a palace to invade. All of that was wiped clean when Dez rescued me from Karnon. The Kingdom of Day has defeated its foes for the time being, another advisor adds. My gaze moves to the table in front of us. Painted onto it is a map of the other world. The mainland has been completely captured. The only places left unconquered are the kingdoms of day and night, those that float in the sky. Temper leans forward. How did that pretty boy king manage to defeat them? Malachi frowns, and it might be my imagination, but I'm fairly sure it bothers him that Temper thinks that Janus, the king of day, is in fact pretty— particularly when it's so obvious that Malachi isn't pretty with his eye patch and scar. Clearly he doesn't realize that his ferocious beauty is just as appealing. But now's not the time to tell Malachi that pretty was never Temper's type, or that Dez's general should be more worried about Temper ravaging his man bits to death than her having a wandering eye. She's loyal to a fault. I imagine we'll find out soon enough, Dez says tapping his fingers on the table. His gaze moves from person to person. The conquered kingdoms will regroup, and then they'll turn their sights on us. He says grimly. My mate's glamour can't save us all. We need to figure out another strategy. This time, I want to be ready for them. After Dez deals out official orders, he dismisses his advisors, leaving just himself, Malachi, Temper, and me in the room. If we're going to defeat the Thief of Souls, the Night King says, we need to do more than simply have a good defense against his forces. We need to figure out once and for all who and what he really is and where he's hiding. What if we went after Gallagher, I say. Gallagher nicks. The formerly dead Night King is somehow decidedly no longer dead. Back in the Flora Kingdom, he'd been responsible for luring soldiers into the woods, and he'd been there the night I nearly lost my life. If we find him, I continue, we might find the thief. Temper swings her legs off the table. Girl, one problem with that little plan of yours, we don't know where he is either. I mean, it ain't like he's standing outside flashing his titties and begging us to capture him. I give my friend a look. I guess it's too bad we aren't P.I.s who specialize in finding people. Temper harumphs. Dez stands, leaning heavily against the table. His eyes meet mine, and he gives me a slight nod. We should check Gallagher's crypt at the very least. Cherub, Dez says, his silver gaze raking me over. Care to pay my father's tomb a visit? So I can kick that fucker's corpse in the balls? Love to. We don't visit the tomb right away. Instead, the two of us return to the King of the Night's chambers. I can feel the weight of this long evening settling on my shoulders. Silently, Dez comes up behind me and begins to unfasten my battle leathers. I'm sorry he says softly, loosening buckles and untying straps. For this war, for putting you in the thief's crosshairs, for making you endure last night. None of that is your fault, I say over my shoulder, my words quiet. Maybe, he muses. His quick wit is gone for the moment, and I get a taste of another side of Dez, one that feels old and wise and battle-weary. He pulls my leathers off my shoulder and places a kiss there. Despite the solemn circumstances, goosebumps break out along my skin. He removes my top and his hands skim down my arms. The bargainer's hands slip farther down my body, and his magic peels away the last of my clothes and the last of his. Let me take care of you, cherub he says from behind me. For the life of me, I don't honestly know what he means by that. He's taken care of me every single day he's been in my life. But I nod anyway because being taken care of sounds really, really nice right now. 
Without another word, the bargainer scoops me up and carries me into the bathroom. The tub is already filled to the rim with water. Scattered around it are lamps that flicker with starbursts of light. A balmy night breeze flutters in through the arched windows. Des walks the two of us into the tub, sitting us down in the warm bathwater. I swallow as the liquid turns pink. All the while, the king of night holds me close, cupping my head against his chest. I don't know why, but this is the moment all my courage and bravado falls away. So many people died tonight, all of them victims in one way or another. Some of them I killed myself. The proof of it is discoloring the bathwater. The Night King must sense my shifting mood because he says, It's all right, Callie. It's all right. We're just going to rinse off the blood and dirt. I close my eyes and my shoulders begin to shake, and it's stupid, 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 but I begin to cry against him. I feel sixteen all over again. Sixteen and broken and desperate for the bargainer to fix me, even though that was never his job to begin with. But he did fix me. He picked up each broken piece of me and put me back together, and he loved my cracks in a way that only he could. And then seven years passed, and I grew up. I believed that all those fragile parts of me were gone, but here we are again, me with blood on my hands and thoughts of dead Fay and that fucking thief all filling my head. I lean my forehead against Dez's chest and silently cry against him. He doesn't need a confession from me to know what's wormed its way under my skin. He cradles the back of my head and holds me to him. I sit there in his arms, keeping my eyes closed so that I can't see the discolored water. Des begins to hum. I pause for just a moment, recognizing the melody. He used to sing the same song under his breath back in my dorm room. At the sound, my sobs quiet. Because Des is here, comforting me as he used to, and even as I mourn the evening's horrors, I savor this. He holds me a little longer, and then he grabs a washcloth and begins to scrub my skin, raking the cloth up and down my back, then moving to my arms. He carefully runs it down my wrist and over each finger of mine, all the while humming that same song. I take in a shuddering breath and watch his ministrations. You don't have to clean... Cherub. With one word, he stops my weak protest in its tracks. It's quiet for a few minutes as my breath evens, the only sound the slight splash of water as Des scours my body. This is... Des begins, then starts again. In my imaginings we did this. I scrubbed the world's filth off of you until you were just you in my arms. Stop, I say, my voice breaking. I had almost put myself back together, but Des's words are going to pull me apart again. The washcloth gets to my face and he tilts my chin up. You saved my people tonight, Callie. You saved them. Who knows how many more would have died if you hadn't been there. I stare into his moonlit eyes. I've never seen anything more beautiful or fearsome than you beguiling those fey. You are a force of nature. I swallow. You're no longer immune to it. I'd seen firsthand what my glamour could now do to Des. I'm delightfully terrified of the prospect. Our sex life has just gotten ten times kinkier. He has no idea. I glance at the water. I don't know what magic the bargainer is dealing out. But the bath's water is now crystal clear. Whatever blood once sullied it is no longer visible. Des sets the washcloth aside and brushes his thumb along my lower lip. Give me a wish. He says out of the blue. Why? I ask. Because I want one. Demanding fairy. I raise my eyebrows. And what's the cost? I ask. He taps my nose. So jaded. I wish you had a little more faith in me. My eyebrows hike up farther. 
So you're giving me a free wish? Hmm, perhaps free is not the right word. That's what I thought. He plays with my hair. But you'll like the repayment. That I promise. I don't doubt it. Fine. I want coffee. Out of all the wishes in the world, that's the one you go for? Des looks distinctly unimpressed. I really want a cup of joe, all right, so sue me. My brief taste of tempers wasn't enough. I tilt my head back and forth, weighing his words. You're right, on second thought, maybe I should wish for another boyfriend. A cup manifests out of the ether and into Des's hand. All right, baby siren, he says, cutting me off. I see how you're going to play your hand. He presses the mug into one of my palms. I grin at him, the last of my earlier sadness vanishing with the action. Going to have to remind you later of why there will only ever be me, he murmurs. My grin widens and the bargainer leans in and steals a quick kiss, the action causing some of the blessed coffee in my mug to slosh into the water. As always, Des tastes like sin and wicked thoughts, and I'm almost more interested in drinking him up than I am the coffee. Almost. Once the kiss ends, I lean back against the rim of the tub and gather my knees to my chest. What was that song? I ask, taking a sip of my coffee. Des is appraising me like he wants to eat me for lunch. What song? The one you were humming just now. Recognition sparks in his eyes. For my lost love, I dream of thee. I set my mug next to one of the glowing lanterns. I like it, I admit. He gives me a soft smile. I'm glad you do. My mother used to sing it to me when I was little. That confession, freely given, I note, sends a pang through me. There's a soft spot in Des's heart that belongs to his mom and his mom alone, and for the hundredth time I wish I could have met her. What's the song about? I ask. The bargainer's expression turns a little melancholic. A man loses the love of his life, and he yearns for night because in dreams they're reunited, he says. The two of us are quiet for a moment. Well, that's a fucking bummer, I finally say. That's the song he's been reassuring me with this whole time? That's like chasing away a nightmare by telling someone a ghost story. There's a beat of silence, and then Dez's laughter fills the chamber. Yeah, Cherub, it really is. Chapter 8 I glance around me at the sun-scorched earth. This is not what I've been expecting. I mean, I'm not sure what I had been expecting when it came to Gallagher Nix's resting place, but I think I assumed it would be somewhere in the Night Kingdom, and that a cemetery would be involved. To be fair, the place feels about as morbid as a cemetery. After I'd had coffee, a bath, and a wink, uh, okay, a fuck-ton of sleep, Des and I headed off to visit the tomb of Des's father, which apparently is this wasteland of a place. My eyes sweep over the landscape again. The dry, dusty earth stretches out for miles and miles around us, only interrupted here and there by a boulder. Off in the distance, some craggy cliffs rise, looking just as barren as the land. The wind whistles a lonesome, loveless tune as it tugs at my hair. It's more than just the austere look of the place. There's something about this land— like colors seeping away and the senses are dulling. It feels as though the earth itself is sucking the life out of me. What is this place? I ask. The banished lands. Des says, squinting at our surroundings. Is a section of land that divides the flora and fauna kingdoms. This is where exiled fairies go. You know what? I didn't even know fairies could be exiled. I assumed fey rulers just made their criminals disappear. I guess you learn something new every day. And you buried your dad here, I say, 
putting the pieces together. The bargainer stares at the landscape, a troubled expression on his face, before his gaze meets mine. This is as close to desecrating his body as I could get, he says. The admission sends a shiver through me. Des is so good to me that I often forget just how ruthless he can be. Night's falling here, and for once since I met Des, the darkness doesn't feel welcoming. I take the bargainer's hand. Show me where your father is buried. We cut across the landscape, Des leading me towards an unassuming cluster of stones, the biggest of which is as large as a car. When we get to them, Des lifts his hand, his expression grim. Down our bond, I sense the pull of magic, and then I feel it around us, saturating the parched air. With a groan, the massive stone in front of us drags itself aside, revealing a small and crudely made pit. For a while, the bargainer simply stares down into the inky darkness, his face expressionless. I lick my parched lips. Is this my father's resting place? Des says, his eyes never wavering from that hole in the ground. As far as burials go, this one is pretty much the equivalent of giving the dead the middle finger, a final fuck you to send them off to the afterlife with. So I guess it's fitting for his a-hole dad. Why give him a tomb at all? I ask. I would have thrown his carcass to the wolves. Believe me, I didn't want to. Des takes a deep breath, then tears his gaze away from that hole. A sardonic smile pulls the corner of his mouth up. After Gallagher died, I left his body out for carrion to eat, he says. But no creature would touch it. When that did not work, I set his body to sea, but the waves returned it to me. I stare at him as he talks. Sensing his restlessness, my own unease is growing. I tried burning his body. He rubs his lower lip. It was impervious to flame. I tried to vaporize his remains, but they resisted my magic. My eyes dipped to that hole in the ground, trying not to get spooked by Dez's words. There are only three types of souls whose bodies can resist returning to the earth. Those that are too powerful for it those that are too pure for it, and those that are too corrupted for it. One guess which category Desmond Flynn's father falls into. Eventually I brought him here. The bargainer's eyes returned to the pit. It killed me to give him even this, a hole in the ground. He deserved so much worse. From the stories I've heard, that Gallagher had slaughtered all his heirs in a bid to keep his throne, I can't help but agree. Dez releases another breath and steps up to the edge of the hole. He kneels, studying its depths. Then in one smooth motion he lowers himself into the darkness. Oh, sweet Jesus, we're going down there. Of course we are. Really don't want to. Maybe I can just linger topside. Don't tell me you've developed a fear of the darkness now, cherub. Dez calls from below, his voice echoing. Ugh. Fine. I move up to the hole, sitting down at its edge and letting my feet dangle into it. I squint into the shaft, trying to gauge how deep it is. From the shadows, two hands wrap around my ankles, and with a swift jerk, I'm yanked into the darkness. Before I have a chance to shriek for dear life, Dez catches me, and I'm sure he can feel the drum of my heart pounding against his chest. Oh, my God, I say, breathless, my skin brightening seconds too late. Why would you do that? Dez laughs into the darkness. You are much too tempting to toy with. His eyes drop to my lips, caught in the glow of my glamour. And to resist... He leans in, but before he can kiss me, I press a hand to his mouth. Uh-uh. I chastise him, glamour in my voice. You don't get a kiss for that. At my words, he pulls away a little, his eyes bright. What do I get? He says, the corner of his mouth curving into a mischievous grin. A spanking. 
my siren whispers. Let's make him give himself a spanking. He's been a bad boy. I almost laugh at the thought. You get the pleasure of avoiding my siren's wrath. She wants you to spank yourself. The appropriate reaction is to be horrified at the thought. Too bad the bargainer is decidedly inappropriate. His face fills with gleeful surprise. Naughty thing, he chastises. And right here in my father's grave, too. Now he does give me a quick kiss. Maybe later I'll appease your dirty thoughts. In the dim light cast by my skin, I see him wink at me. It's enough to mollify my siren. With that, Des releases me. Watch your step, he advises. There's a tricky staircase you'll need to maneuver. On second thought, it'd probably be best if I carried you. Before I can say or do anything else, his magic curls like smoke low in my belly. I feel the tug of it drawing me close to him. This is repayment for the coffee, isn't it? I say as the magic courses through me. That or Des really likes stirring my siren into action. Because where a second ago she was settling back down, now she's pressing against the underside of my skin, eager to take over completely. I told you repayment would be fun. Des says, a smirk in his voice. Ha! Huh. This is not really what I had in mind when I made that wish. Consider this foreplay, baby siren. And still his magic tugs at me, getting more insistent with every passing second. All right, but I want to ride piggyback, I state. I didn't realize that you called the terms of repayment, he says smoothly, scooping me up. Now that I'm in his arms, the magic relaxes. Of course, if you want to ride me from behind... His tone is undeniably sexual. I won't protest too much, though it's not my favorite position. God, he's in rare form today. He moves me to his back, and I wrap my arms around his neck, breathing in his smell as his hair tickles my cheek. His hands hook beneath my legs, and he carries me down the winding stairway and deep into the ground. The air down here is thick like molasses, heavy with protective wards meant to keep intruders out. It's a shock to feel so much magic concentrated here when the land itself seems parched of it. Des utters a phrase in old fay, and just like snapping one's fingers, the magic parts, letting us through. Ahead of us, mounted torches flare to life, illuminating a small chamber. The walls, ceiling, and floor of it are nothing more than packed dirt. Right in the middle of the room, sitting on a natural bed of rock, is a rough-hewn stone sarcophagus, Maybe it's the spells that still thicken the air, or maybe it's the sight of the stone coffin, or maybe it's simply the fact that this is the tomb of a man so evil the earth won't corrupt his body. But a wave of vertigo washes through me. If it weren't for Dez's hold on me, I would have slid off his back. Gently, Dez sets me down so he can lift his hand towards the sarcophagus. His magic briefly thickens the air— then stone grinds against stone as the lid begins to slide off the coffin. An old, sour-tasting terror I used to feel whenever I thought about my father now rushes back. But it's not my stepdad who's frightening to me. It's the possibility of what's beneath that stone slab. A body that cannot decay. A man who's back from the dead. The lid comes off hovering in the air before slowly lowering itself to the ground. It lands on the dirt with an echoing thump, dust billowing out around it. From where I stand, I can't see into the coffin. I creep forward, Des at my side. I hear the bargainer's swift inhalation of breath, and then my eyes land on the inside of the coffin. There's no rotting corpse, nor is there a perfectly preserved body— there's nothing here at all. Gallagher Nix might have once rested here, but he does no longer. The sarcophagus is empty. Chapter 9 I stare up at the stars, 
my body stretched out along the thin pallet resting on the dry earth. The night here in the banished lands is so clear the heavens sparkle above us. Next to me, Des leans against a boulder, one of his knees bent in front of him, ruminating. He's not angry or surprised, just lost in his own mind. In front of me, our fire crackles. Its flames flicker from rosy pink to pale green to lilac, then buttery yellow. And the smoke that rises into the night sky is cast in dusty pastels. The whole thing is a kaleidoscope of color captured in heat and light, and it's putting out a shit ton of magic. Why it looks like that is a secret Des hasn't divulged. Yet. How long do you think your father's body has been missing? I ask. Des shakes his head. No more than a decade or so. I raise my eyebrows. I've checked many times over the two centuries since his death. He explains. I've been perversely curious whether the Earth would one day accept him. I should have known some other sort of fuckery was afoot. Resurrected kings, possessed soldiers, and a body-snatching thief. It sounds nonsensical. Perhaps if I wrote it out, I would understand it all better. Do you have a notebook and a pen? I ask the bargainer. In response, he snaps his fingers, and from the ether he produces a pen and a pad of paper. I take both from him and smooth the paper on the ground. Uncapping the pen, I begin to write. Des peers over at what I'm scrawling down. When I don't say anything, he asks, What are you writing? I pause my eyes moving to his. A timeline. Here is what we know. Your father and the thief are somehow connected, I say. If we start from the beginning, your father was once simply a king with a lot of consorts and kids. He probably wasn't the best dude out there, but he wasn't always murdering his young. I pause, just to make sure I have the story straight so far. Des gives me a nod, looking vaguely entertained. Then at some point, I say, moving my pen down my timeline. He heard a prophecy about losing his throne, and he murdered his children as a result. I scribbled a note in. You, his one remaining son, then overthrew him. I paused to write in the facts. And shortly thereafter, you discovered his body wouldn't decay, so you put him in a tomb. I draw a long line to show the time elapsed. Over a decade ago, his body was still entombed. I fill that out on my sheet. Now his body is gone, and he is very much alive. Once I've written it all out, I stare at the sheet. And I'm not sure this exercise produced a single answer, except that the Thief of Souls began kidnapping soldiers roughly a decade ago, essentially during that shadowy period of time where Gallagher Nix might or might not have been entombed. There could be something to that. My gaze moves back to the beginning of the timeline, around when Gallagher Nix heard a prophecy and began killing his kids. That was the first domino flicked, the one that set in motion everything that led to us sitting here in the banished lands, an empty tomb only a stone's throw away. Have you heard the prophecy yourself? I ask. The corners of Dez's lips pull down. It's been lost to time. Well, there goes that potential lead. A flask materializes in the bargainer's hand. He takes a deep swig of it, then wordlessly passes it to me. Des is not usually this open to sharing alcohol with me. Before he can reconsider the offer, I take the flask from him and bring it to my mouth. I wince as soon as the spicy spirits hit my tongue. There's magic in the drink. Magic that strokes my throat and tickles my stomach. I pass the flask back. It's too quiet here, he admits, his gaze skimming our surroundings. Something is amiss. Something is more than a little amiss. A man came back from the dead. Des, why are we still here? I ask softly. I haven't pressed the issue up until now because I wanted to give my mate time to work through whatever emotional turmoil is running through his head. 
And yeah, I get that an empty tomb is not a huge surprise, given that Des fought his dad back in Flora's forest. But between keeping me alive and then defending his kingdom from an army of possessed soldiers, the King of Night has probably been a little too preoccupied to actually process that fact. That being said, this was supposed to be a quick adventure. See Gallagher Nix's resting place, then go. But now we're lingering. And maybe that wouldn't be a problem, except that, despite the drink, I can feel this place sapping away my strength bit by bit. And Des has a distant, troubled look on his face, like each second he's moving farther out of my reach. He takes another swig from his flask, passing it back to me. Someone here must have seen what happened to the body. He replies, I'm going to have a little chat with them. A little chat. Right. That's a bargainer euphemism if I've ever heard one. I swallow a shot's worth of other world spirits. Oh, that sits well in the stomach, before handing the flask to Des and glancing around us. There's not a single spark of life anywhere within eyesight. Not an animal, not a plant, and certainly not a fairy. Besides us, there's no one here right now just as there likely was no one here the day Gallagher's body disappeared from its tomb. But even if there was, shouldn't we then be looking for them? They will come to us. I'm seriously not following. Dez smirks at me, no longer looking so distant. Have you been feeling a little parched? Yes, I say slowly. What does that have to do with anything? There's a reason we banish Fay here. This place is devoid of magic. A long-ago battle reaped every last drop from the land. And magic, Cherub, is a fairy's lifeblood. With his flask, the bargainer points to the bonfire, which is doing such an excellent job of shoving off the cold that I have to scoot away from it. That right there is putting out magic in spades. Magic that Fay will be drawn to. The smoke gives off a perfumed scent, like burning rose petals. And I suddenly get it. The fire was literally sending out a smoke signal, carrying magic off along the wind, coaxing magic-starved Fay towards us. So we're bait, I say. You decided to make us bait. The bargainer's gaze sharpens on me, his pale eyes changing color as the flames dance in them. You're not bait, love. The fire is the bait. You're an iron manacled trap set to crush willful fairies. Yes, my siren says. He understands. Jess's eyes move to the fire and his gaze unfocuses. I think that maybe he's going to add something else, but the seconds tick by, and soon it becomes obvious that his thoughts have returned inwards. I don't think I've ever seen the big bad bargainer fall into himself. In my mind, he's the deal-making, door-busting, tatted thug I met eight years ago. Not this. Des. We all have roles to play. I'm used to being the vulnerable one, the lonely one, and the bargainer is used to being the tough, secretive one. The problem is we aren't actors and this isn't a play. We're flesh and blood, and even a fairy as strong and capable and old, and I mean old as Des, sometimes needs to be weak. And it's okay to be weak and upset. I've stared down those emotions at the bottom of many a bottle. I think that's where the bargainer is, even though his stoic expression gives away nothing. His kingdom is compromised, and his father is alive, and maybe all sorts of old emotions he thought he buried are now resurfacing. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. But in case I'm not, I get up and close what little distance there is between me and Des. I sink down on his lap, my thighs on either side of his hips. His gaze sharpens, and he stares at me with those intense, pale eyes of his— He's hard to look at because even after all this time, he's still so ridiculously pretty. He closes his eyes, and when he opens them, there's so much turbulence in them. So much. An immortal's worth. I touch the corner of his eye. I've got you.
I say, and then I kiss one of his cheeks, and then the other. Wordlessly, he pulls me to him. Cherub. He brushes my hair back and cups my face. I'm not sad. I'm so very, very angry. Now that he says it, I can feel the emotion like it's some sort of magic unto itself. It vibrates beneath his skin and along our connection. It makes his hands shake. This is the one part of me I don't want you to see. He says softly. His wrathful side. I really hate to break it to you, Des, but I've already seen you angry. Several times. He's always fearsome to behold. Not like this. He shakes his head. Not like this. His hands glide up my waist, and that's all it takes for me to realize that even when he's angry, and maybe especially then, I want him. His rage and his touch are stirring the siren within me. I denied her earlier. I'm not sure she'll be denied again. I roll my hips against his. Beneath me, I feel him harden. Des's hands tighten on my flesh. Careful, he says, in a tone that should set my teeth on edge. I lean forward, my breath against his lips. Or else what? I challenge. Des's eyes narrow even as his mouth begins to curl into a smile. He hooks one of his arms around me and flips us so that my back is now on the ground and his hips are nestled tightly between my thighs. Tonight I have especially little control, he warns. It's only now that I notice the shadows at his back. They gather into the shape of his wings, then dissipate. Gather, then dissipate. Again and again. He really is on the knife's edge of control— You've never been with me when my face side comes out to play, he says. There's a note to his voice that is not human. I'm not scared of your face side, I say defiantly. I never was. He clicks his tongue. Callie, Callie, he admonishes. As he speaks, I feel my clothes melt off me, like they were made of hot wax and not fiber. It's a nifty little trick of the bargainers. His clothes follow, and now I feel the hard length of him pressing against my pelvis. He drops down to take a breast into his mouth. That's all it takes for my skin to brighten and my siren to surface. I feel a slight shudder work through him, and I'm not entirely sure if that's because he can sense my magic through our connection, or if my siren simply has that effect on him. Sweet siren, he says between kisses. You better sharpen those claws. Tonight I don't plan on being nice. He spreads my legs wide. It's almost lewd how open I am to him. The entire time he watches me greedily. Aren't you precious to think I'm worried? I openly taunt him. I have my own tricks. I tap his lips with my finger. Tricks that you are no longer immune to, I say, glamour filling my voice. Des's eyes flicker and his wings manifest, spreading wide behind him. They are backlit by the flames, and the thin membranes of them glow with pale warmth. I dare you, Siren. The bargainer's features seem to sharpen. So the little fairy has come out to play. This is truth or dare all over again. Only now, I'm the one that holds all the cards. How utterly exquisite. Do your worst, Desmond Flynn, I command him. Something dark and obsessive and distinctly fey shines in his eyes as he pins me down to the ground, his body living shackles. I wantonly grind myself against him. I can feel through our bond this strange need to capture and cart me away, to claim and keep. I want it all, all his twisted, dark parts. Without another word, he lifts my hips and savagely thrusts into me. 
I nearly gasp as the hard girth of his cock slides through my wetness. He takes my mouth as he pulls out, only to slam back into me again and again. This is no sweet claiming. This is need. This is possession. It's everything that Des so assiduously fights against. Damn me, I love every second of it. Harder, I demand. His lips curve up as he obliges. It feels like more than just his cock is inside me, like all of him is surging forward and laying siege. And still I could stop him if I wanted. If I wanted. What I want is for him to screw me senseless and then screw me some more. He takes my hands and presses them into the ground, holding me hostage as he pounds into me, his broad chest already slick with the first beads of sweat. Confess, I command. Confess to me what you are thinking. He stares down at me, a lock of hair dangling between us. I want to fuck you until you are mindless with want. I want to feel you squeeze my dick as you come around me. I want to die buried inside you. Is that all you've got? I say. I'm disappointed. It's a battle of wills at this point. His face side pitted against my siren. His magic versus my own. He flips me over and presses me into the ground. Leaning in close to my ear, he whispers, We can't have that now, can we? Des hikes one of my legs up and shoves his cock into me from behind. My eyes flutter at the force of the intrusion. He's rougher than I'm used to. Much rougher. And yet, my God, this is everything I never knew I wanted, and I can't seem to get enough. The ground chafes at my knees and breasts. Couldn't fucking care less. Touch yourself, the bargainer orders, his magic riding the words. I'm a prisoner to them. Of its own volition, my hand slips between my thighs, right where I'm already soaking wet, and then my fingers begin to stroke my clit. It's almost too much. I arch back into Des, deepening his thrusts. I feel the slick slide of his skin against mine, in and out, in and out. I'm being rubbed in all the right places. And then one of his hands skims my ass. This is new. Is he going to— His hand stops when it finds my other opening. He touches it, circles it, puts just the slightest pressure against it until the tip of his finger teases its way in. Oh, my God! Des leans in close. Leave God out of this, cherub. He has nothing to do with it. Sinful, sinful man— he keeps thrusting. I keep fingering myself, and he keeps probing. It's that last one that's driving me mad. Deeper, I say breathlessly. It's more the siren who demands it than me. I've never done this before. Not with any of the men I've been with. Not that they hadn't tried. I just hadn't wanted it then. I want it now. Oh, how I want it now. I let out a wanton moan at the sensation of having Des in me twice over. His finger continues to press in, and I get exactly why Des rules over sex and the night and all that taboo shit that comes with it. Because this is so wrong. But it feels amazing. More, more, more. Tell me, Siren, are you disappointed now? God, no. I gasp out. There's that word again. His finger presses in deeper. Is that touch supposed to be punishing? It's not. Another husky moan slips out of me as my body thrums with pleasure. Perhaps you'd better find a synonym, he says. Des's magic winds around my windpipe and I'm prisoner to it. Des! I give a strangled cry. Much better. He says, the devil in All his voice. All the sensation of being All pressed and prodded and filled to the brim, it's nearly too much. And still I hold out. The sensation is too intense, too exquisite, too enticing, and I can't bear the thought of it ending. So I hide from my release. I don't know how long the two of us stay locked in our strange, taboo lovemaking, 
only that at some point Des's white hair brushes against the skin of my shoulder and his lips are in my ear. Am I not servicing my queen well enough? My siren merely purrs. He shifts against me, and I shamelessly gasp at the exquisite feel of him. Surely you should have come by now, or am I losing my... touch? He tweaks his finger, and I let out a choked cry, nearly climaxing then and there. But perhaps you need a little more persuading. Never want this to end. He breathes against my cheek. Come for me, siren. I can feel magic and darkness in those words. They settle into me, and through my haze of pleasure, I register that this is all going to come to a swift end. I manage to squeeze one final order out. Give me everything. He does. Dez drives into me as I shatter, his flesh pounding against mine harder and harder and deeper and deeper. The pleasure is so extreme, so acute, I can barely hold on to it. It washes over me, blinding, unnatural, addicting. His body was meant for this, screwing and claiming and twisting my will into his own. Just as mine was meant to allure him and seduce him and ultimately bend his desires to fit my own. With a groan he comes, his hips slamming into mine as he fills me up. Each stroke of Des's hips sends another wave of pleasure through me. We come down slowly, our bodies sweaty and dusty. Des collapses next to me before dragging me onto his chest. He holds me captive in his arms, stroking my flesh softly, his lips trailing over my shoulder. He playfully bites the skin there. Stay in my arms, Cherub. Stay here and never leave. All right, I say, settling in against him, blissfully uncaring about the chill creeping in with the evening. For a little while we lay there in silence. Then slowly a laugh bubbles low in my belly. I can't believe I let you stick a finger up my butt. I finally say. I'm such a smooth pillow talker. I sense rather than see him smirk, says the girl who once got me to come in my pants. Now it's my turn to smirk. Then my thoughts circle back. I can't believe I liked it. My saucy little siren? I can. I have the feeling that by the time the sun sets on our lives... You'll be the naughty one to my virginal, saintly soul. I outright guffaw at that. As if... A grin spreads across his face. You're probably right. His hand smooths down my spine, making my skin pucker. I have more tricks in my bag. All you have to do is say the word. Or challenge me again. I rather enjoyed pitting my magic against yours. I can't contain the excited shiver that courses through me. I don't think I've realized just what being mated to Des means. He rules over sex. Everything that we've done together so far, that's all just the tip of a very large iceberg. And I probably still won't fully understand what being mated to him means until I've seen and savored every last one of his perversions— and witnessed every last one of his horrors. Only then will I fully be able to grasp this force of nature I made it to. We're quiet for a time. It's not enough, Des eventually says, his hand rubbing up and down my arm. Having you. I always assumed that once you warmed my bed, it would be. He cups my pussy as he speaks, and I swear to God, I am this close to jumping him all over again. But I'm a greedy bastard, and I want more. Always more. My fingers glide over his arm. His tattoos seem to leap and dance in the firelight. I lift my head and rest it on his chest. Tell me a secret, I whisper. He traces the curve of my cheek. 
Secrets are meant for one soul to keep. I feel myself tense at his words. My mother used to say that all the time. He explains. It's one of those formative lessons of hers I've carried with me since childhood. My brows furrow. Some of my sex-induced haze is slipping away. And now the sleeping soldiers say it. Up until now, I hadn't been able to figure out how exactly they knew it. Daz's finger traces my lips. And then I fought my father, who is in league with the Thief of Souls. His finger drops from my mouth. You wanted to know a secret? Here's one, Callie. Sometime, long ago, my mother whispered those same words to Gallagher Nix. She, a spy set on escaping him, said them as a taunt. And now he's taunting us both with them. I need to understand the nature of his undeath to understand the rest of this mystery. Undeath. There should be simply life and then death, but in the land of supernaturals, both earthly and otherworldly, there are a whole range of beings that somehow fall outside this dichotomy. Perhaps then I can understand how he learned that phrase. And so we wait. Tez pulls me to him and kisses me deeply, tasting like salt and sex and the night in all its secretive goodness. And then our clothes peel themselves off the ground and slide back onto us. The two of us break apart, and whatever moment we were having, it's over. I sit and gather my legs to my chest, wrapping my arms around them. Tell me about him, I say softly. Dez has already told me the short version of Daddy Dearest's life, but there's so much I still don't know. Those silvery eyes are on me in an instant. He's not worth wasting any more breath on. We're already wasting breath searching for him, I say. Tell me something about him. Something I don't already know. The bargainer beckons his discarded flask with his fingers, calling it back to him like a wayward soldier. It's not until he's caught the thing and taken a sip from it that he speaks again. He had hundreds of concubines. Des finally says. Hundreds. Just take a moment to imagine that. Hundreds? That's like having a wife for every day of the year. I don't know how many of them he fathered children with, but the number is large. Large enough for the killing to get a name in our histories. It became known as the Royal Purge. The Purge, for short. And when Galagar died, and I first walked the halls of his former castle, I saw firsthand the women he'd taken in. They had this look about them. Des gestures to his eyes. Soldiers get that look when they've lived through too much. Many of them had it. And yet, and yet dozens of those women cried for him when he died. Des scoffs to himself. He killed babies. Their babies. And they still cried for him. I don't say anything. There aren't words for this kind of atrocity. That's not to say that everyone in his harem loved him. In the years after his death, I started to uncover the details of their lives. In the ledgers, we found evidence that some of his wives died untimely deaths, usually after they openly mourned their dead children or objected to the purge. Someone had also diligently recorded the dozens of suicide notes from Gallagher's various concubines. I later discovered that those who survived their suicide attempts were then brutalized by the king. He took it as a personal slight that they dared to leave him. And of course there were other escape attempts by other wives, and those too were violently punished. Hell was a kinder place than my father's court. To think my mother dared to escape under these circumstances? Brave, brave woman. The fire snaps and pops between us. Dez is still lost in the past. Did you know that when I executed my father, I was expected to inherit the harem he left behind? He gives a humorless laugh. Doesn't that make your skin crawl? To inherit a lover like some sort of heirloom? It's sickening. But then this entire story has turned my stomach. 
I broke with tradition when I sent them all away. His eyes moved to me. I knew about you even then. He admits, a soft smile spreading across his face. But then it disappears. As did my father. He adds. A chill slides over my skin. In front of me, the iridescent fire dims as the bargainer's shadows close in on it. To answer your question, Cherub, I never knew much about Galagar Nix. Only that he was a mean son of a bitch, that he tyrannically ruled over the Night Kingdom, and he killed my mother in cold blood. And now, somehow he is alive. Chapter 10 Still no closer to finding me or Gallagher, it appears. The thief stands on the other side of the fire, peering down at me with his onyx eyes. I sit up so fast a wave of vertigo washes through me. That was a neat trick you did there, back in Somnia, he says, circling around the fire as he approaches me. I scoot backwards, but there's nowhere to go out here in the banished lands. I look for Desmond, but other than the thief, I'm utterly alone. He crouches next to me and tilts his head, studying me. There's something detached and reptilian about him. So you can glamour fairies after all, he says. I can glamour fairies. I can glamour him. My skin brightens. Get away from me. He continues to stare at me, his eyes inky. Slowly, he begins to smile. Enticing, but no. I think I'll stay right here. It doesn't work on him. Dear God. Shame your wiles don't affect me. He reads my face. Don't fret, Enchantress. I am tempted. Why did you wake them? I ask as my skin dims. Why did I wake them? That's your most pressing question? Don't you want to know why I kidnapped them in the first place? Or why I put the women in caskets and the men in trees? Of course I do. He takes a seat next to me, and it takes a great amount of willpower to not recoil at his nearness. The thief sighs. Because I wanted to. He leans in. I put the men in trees because, as the green man, I could. I took the women savagely and caged them like I have been caged. I can feel the sick heat of his anger and his excitement as he talks. I hid the men and showcased the women, he continues, and oh, how I enjoyed watching all those fairies fear the unknown. It's been so long since any of them felt true fear, but now they do. So, he says, facing me more fully. Is that what you wanted to hear? Yes. No. All these years I've spent hunting criminals, and the worst ones give these kinds of answers. They committed atrocities because they wanted to. Because they could. But even as the Thief of Souls gives me this glimpse into his mind, he manages to evade the answer that I really wanted to hear— I want to know what his plans are, not how his sick mind works. Enough about me, he says softly. I know, Enchantress, that if you're scared or excited enough, your baser nature will expose itself. He reaches out and strokes my cheek with the back of his knuckle. I flinch at his touch, my nostrils flaring. I should be sprinting far away from the thief, but my muscles are locked up. I couldn't move if I tried. The question is... His hand slides to my lower jaw and he drags my face to meet his. Which route do I explore? Your passion or your fear? His eyes dip to my lips. God save me, I might as well be back in the Fauna Kingdom's prison, because right now I'm staring at Karnon. It's a different body, but the same eyes. My breath hitches at the reminder, and a few seconds later my skin illuminates as the siren unfurls, stretching out beneath my flesh like a stiff muscle. A fierce fury rises in me, eclipsing my fear. 
This barbarian thinks to intimidate us, scare us. I grab his wrist and pull it away, leaning into his face. Whatever you think to do to me, I dare you to try. I take my other hand and press it to his chest, tapping a clawed finger against him. But you should know that if given the chance, I will gut you and make a necklace of your innards. Not going to lie, my siren is a real piece of work. But it's times like this that I appreciate her particular brand of crazy. The thief smiles at me, looking like his interest has been piqued. I do hope you make good on your threat. I'd hate to see all this vehemence go to waste. He moves in closer, our faces inches apart. His breath fans against my cheek. Find me, Calypso. I'm eagerly awaiting our reunion. Cherub? My body startles, roused from sleep by Dez's voice. My eyes sweep over our campsite. Swear the thief was here just a second ago. His presence was so vivid that my mind isn't convinced I dreamed him up. But then I'm distracted by Dez's warm body and his penetrating stare. Everything all right, Callie? I swallow, an action his eyes dart to, and nod. I'm fine. That earns me a frown. But rather than pushing the issue, Dez squeezes my hip. Someone's coming, he whispers. I begin to get up, looking madly out at the darkness, but he gently presses me back down. If you could be a peach and pretend to be asleep, that would be wonderful. I want the fae to come closer. Pretend to be asleep after the dream I just had? I think not. But I do force myself to relax for Dez's sake, even if I don't close my eyes. Instead, I strain my ears and eyes to hear and see anything beyond the fire. One long minute slips into another. All at once, the bargainer's power rushes out of him, thickening the air like darkness is a physical thing. I sense it close in on its prey like a snare, trapping them in place. The caught fairy shrieks like a wild beast, the guttural sounds punctuated by a string of curses. In an instant, Dez is gone from my side, dissolving into vapor like he was never there. I flip over just in time to see my mate looming over a fairy in the distance. The fae is uselessly fighting the magic trapping him in place, his scythe-like weapons striking the magical barrier over and over again. Dez folds his arms, appraising the man and looking as though he finds him wanting. After a moment, the Night King takes the scythe away from the man. You're going to answer some questions for us, Dez says, or you're going to die. I pull the charred marshmallow from the fire, assessing the blackened crisp. Damn it! This is the fifth one I've burned. I officially suck at this s'mores thing. To be fair, I'm pretty sure Dez's iridescent fire burns hotter than the fires I'm used to. I wait for it to cool before I remove it from my stick and grab another from the s'mores supplies Dez has presented me with when he returned with his captive. Pretty sure this is his attempt to keep me occupied while he interrogates his prisoner. Ashamed to say that it's totally working. Meanwhile, several feet away, Dez is well into his interrogation. So far, he's folded the fairy's weapon into an origami horse, taken away his voice briefly, and removed the last of the items the fairy had on him. A couple stones, a knife, some dried mystery meat, and a necklace made of fey hair. Because heaven forbid we meet someone normal here. Who opened the tomb? Dez asks the fairy calmly. The man spits at Dez. The spittle never hits my mate. Instead, it stops in midair, then reverses its trajectory, splashing against the fairy's face. Who opened the tomb? Dez repeats. Suck on my prick! Hmm. Tempting. Dez says, cocking his head. Is that a genuine offer? His magic unlaces the man's crudely made breeches. Then it begins tugging the cloth down. The fairy's eyes widen and he begins to yank the material back up, fruitlessly trying to keep his pants on. What in the bloody firkin' God's names? Cherub. 
Des says, glancing over at me. I think the man's shy. One moment he wants my attention, the next he's being a coy minx. I pull my sixth marshmallow from the fire. It's perfectly golden brown. Success! Men give such mixed signals, I say. I admit it. I like to toy with my targets just as much as Des does. That was always one of my favorite parts of the P.I. business. Grabbing a bar of Hershey's chocolate and a graham cracker, I pull my marshmallow off its stick. Get into my belly. They do, don't they? The bargainer's eyes brighten enough to let me know that he likes my brand of wicked. Turning back to the fairy, he taps on his lips. No need to be bashful. I'm sure your prick will be everything I've ever dreamed a prick could be. Now the fairy's bucking, wildly trying to pull his pants up with his legs. He's failing abysmally at it. You sick shite! He shouts. I begin to munch on my s'more, and oh my god, it's one of the great tragedies of the world that s'mores are only reserved for camping. These little bastards are delicious. Des's good humor collapses in an instant. His magic quits tugging at the fairy's pants. Now that there's no more magical resistance, the prisoner nearly gives himself a wedgie yanking his pants up. The night darkens. I'm done being coy as well, Des says, his voice like polished steel. Tell me what happened to the body resting in the cavern beneath that boulder. He points to the unassuming grave markers in the distance, or I'll start killing you in increments. I don't know, the fairy yowls. Have you ever died in increments? Des asks. It's slow and, well, I don't need to tell you that it's painful. I never saw anything. I swear it. I feel the brush of magic and then the prisoner's hand is jerked in front of him, his fingers splayed out. I like to start with the pinky. Begin small, you know, Des says. Right now he's 100% bargainer. I'll remove it. Knuckle by knuckle. God damn it, I don't know where the body is. The fairy's ruined scythe now unfolds, mending itself back together until it looks whole and untouched. It floats through the air, stopping dangerously close to the fairy's hand. The fairy lets out a little whimper as the blade caresses his little finger. After the pinky, Des continues, well, there are nine other fingers to play with. If that doesn't break you, there's teeth and toes. Even those are just a taster. And the pain? It's enough to drive a fairy to do almost anything. You'll feel the centuries of your life draining away with each amputation, and if you hold out long enough, you'll beg me for death. Just when you think it's bound to be over, you'll realize you're still alive and aware, and you'll endure it for hours, days if need be but it will feel like decades by the end. A sheen of sweats developed on the fairy's upper lip. You'll never get away with this, he swears, his voice high. The king's men will come for you both before then. His eyes dart between us. The king, Des says, looking like a teacher whose pupil finally answered a question correctly. Now we're getting somewhere. Des sits down, propping his elbows on his legs. Would the king know where the body went? The king knows all. Does he know? The bargainer raises his eyebrows. The fairy should be worried. Des only uses that voice right before he kicks the hornet's nest. The scythe lifts from the fairy's finger and circles the man. Des stands. Let me amend my terms. Find me someone who can tell me who did this, and I'll let you live. Chapter 11 I stare at the crevice in the ground. This is where your king lives, I say skeptically. Just another hole in the earth. You'll see, Des's prisoner says ominously. Since directing us here, a flight that covered miles of arid, lifeless territory, this fairy has gained a lot more confidence. We're probably about to get shanked. 
I shift my weight from foot to foot. So what, were we just supposed to wait around? My words die off as someone blows a horn. Just as my eyes scour the landscape for the fairy, the sound of dozens of footfalls echo from the hole. Not a minute later, armed fairies come pouring out of the opening, pointing their weapons at us and shouting orders. Hands at your backs! Hands at your backs! Des does as instructed, looking ever the compliant captive. Taking a cue from him, I move my own hands to my back. The fairies clamor in close to us, all while ignoring our former prisoner. Not that I'm that surprised. His clothes are tattered and homespun, and he looks like he's been on the wrong end of one too many fists, which is about how these soldiers look. Des and I, however, are clothed in fine silks, and we're relatively clean. Found these two wandering around the plains, Des's former captive says. King Henbane will want to see them. They've got magic in spades. The soldiers grunt, eyeing us appreciatively. You'll get your finder's fee. I look forward to it. I narrow my eyes at our former prisoner. He gives me a toothy smile and a two-fingered salute. Enjoy your stay, he says, backing away. The fairy leaves us there, descending into the crevice until the earth swallows him completely. The soldiers move to shackle us, their metal restraints clanging together. The sound fills me with no little amount of dread. For a split second, I'm vividly back in Karnon's prison. Cover with iron, and you'll lose your balls, Des says, pulling me back into the present. One of the soldiers hesitates, then squints at Des, a mean look in his eye. Is that a threat? Nah, he's just reciting poetry to you, I say. The fairy's glare moves from the bargainer to me, his lips pressed together like he's tasted something bad. All at once he swings the back of his palm at me. He never lands the blow. His hand freezes inches from my face. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, hasn't anyone told you it's impolite to hit a girl? The bargainer's voice is beguiling, and at his back his wings have appeared. They spread out menacingly. The display is so obviously a warning, but the soldiers close in on him anyway. In an instant, Dessa's magic lashes out, knocking the fairies to the ground. With another pulse of his power, the soldiers' weapons are yanked from them, the swords and cudgels turned on their owners. They lay pinned in place, held hostage by their weapons. The only one not held up by their weapons is the soldier who tried to hit me. He lays on the ground— his eyes wide as his arm rises in front of him. As he watches, his fingers begin to curl into a fist. He stammers out, Well, what in all the— His fist strikes out, slamming into his face with a meaty slap. It pulls away only to land a second blow, then a third, fourth, fifth. The soldier cries out as blood begins to drip from his nose. Hey, you fools! one of the fallen soldiers says. He's staring at Dez's wings. That's the Night King! The bargainer's eyes sweep over them. I'm done playing games. His voice drips with menace. Take us to your king. The Vanished Lands actually has a society. You can almost call it a civilization, except civil has no business being in the name. Since descending into the other world's butt crack, a.k.a. the crevice in the ground, I've gotten a quick and thorough introduction into Maltira, the city of the banished. So far, I've seen six fights break out, four passed-out fairies, three couples going at it, seven if you count the very questionable dancing we walked by, and dozens of people wearing jewelry made from fey bones. Apparently, bone necklaces are a thing. Early on, a few fairies catcalled me, and another grabbed his crotch. That all came to a fun little end when the catcallers mysteriously started confessing to having grandma fetishes and venereal diseases, and the crotch grabber began squeezing his bits until he was begging for mercy. The entire time, Des's face remained pleasantly passive, but through our bond I could feel the cool breath of his magic, stirred to agitation. 
Don't piss off my boyfriend, yo. When he catches me staring, he drops the facade to flash me a devilish little smile. Then the facade is back up, and he's the cool but implacable bargainer once more. Around us, our guards walk stiffly, their spears and knives out, and their expressions menacing. None of them, however, get too close to me or Dez, lest they tempt the Night King's anger again. I glance at the cavern ceiling high above me. All those stories about fairies living under the hill were true after all. Our armed escorts lead us past buildings that rise from the earth into the air, looking as though they've been formed from a single lump of clay. We pass rows and rows of these buildings, each one occupied by cagey fairies who've carved out some life for themselves. Just like the land above, the air here is parched of magic. But it's not just magic that's missing from this place. I've come to expect a certain fey elegance with the other world— yet most of the buildings are devoid of decoration. No one's attempted to carve designs on lintels or paint on adornments. Just as noticeable as the lack of aesthetics is the careless disrepair of the place. There are bits of litter here and graffiti there. The building across the way is stained and partially collapsed. The one next to it has been crudely patched up with mud and hide. It's all so very un like we leave this city center through a corridor cut into the rock. Already we've descended hundreds of feet, but judging by the passage's downward slope, we're about to head even deeper into the ground. I glance at the wall sconces where flames flicker. The scent wafting from them closes up my windpipes. It smells like burning hair and rotting flesh, and I'm seriously concerned that's what the odd candles are made from— after a dizzying number of switchbacks and a few flights of stairs, our group comes upon two armed fairies who block the passageway. One of them is a fauna fay, his soft fox's ears poking from between his red hair. The other could be from any of the other kingdoms, his hair a bright blonde and his eyes the color of moss. Both wear the same patchy, homemade uniforms. The king of the night and his mate request an audience with the king. One of our escorts now says to the fae standing guard. The one with the fox ears grunts, taking a nice long perusal of me, his gaze lingering on my tits, hips, and legs, because apparently every criminal here has to act like a fucking cliché. His attention moves to Dez, and his lip curls. If the king can't drain them, he doesn't want to see them. For a beat, nothing happens— but then Dez's magic rips across the room, throwing the banished fairies against the dank earthen walls. Not going to lie, it's been a real rough day for this group. The Night King's power pins them there, and it's so obvious that if we so wanted to, we could waltz right in to see this king and none of his lackeys could stop us. You have to forgive your fellow soldier, Dez says, stepping up to Fox Ears. He didn't word our demands correctly. This isn't a request. It's an order. But go ahead, defy it. I do so love to hear fairies scream. He touches Fox Ear's cheek. The fairy shakes his head back and forth, whimpering as though he can feel the first tendrils of pain. Dez assesses him for a moment. Then, with a flick of his wrist, he releases all the men. They crumple to the floor, rubbing their formerly pinned limbs. The fairy's posturing appears to be over, but before any of them can pick themselves up, Dez looms over fox ears. Oh, and a word of warning. Look at my mate again with anything other than respect and benevolence, and you'll lose your eyes. Damn. Fox ears bows his head, his ears drooping, his posture turning submissive. He nods, and with that, he and the other guards step aside and let our entourage pass by. Got to threaten every damn grain of sand in this place. Daz mutters under his breath. I can't help but agree with him. The only thing anyone seems to respect around here is power. We pass three more sets of guards, two of which also need to be threatened, and descend deeper into the mountain before we finally arrive at a massive stone door. 
This far beneath the earth, where the sky is only a distant memory, I can feel the barest breath of magic. So the banished lands haven't been reaped of all power, just the vast, vast majority of it. And now I understand why the citizens of the banished lands built down. Because the lower you go, the closer to magic you get. And in a world where everyone's suffocating in its absence, even the barest hint of it is precious. The stone door is pushed open, and I get my first good look at the king's inner sanctum. The vaulted room is packed to the brim with fairies and loincloths and bandeaux, leather pants and body paint. It's all so primal and oddly, savagely sensual. The fairies pin us in from all sides, making our trip down the aisle slow and claustrophobic. I take in the hordes of them, their exotic faces ranging from curious to bloodthirsty. Beyond them, I catch sight of the top of the makeshift throne, carved from rock and fitted with bone and steel. But it's not until we're nearly at the end of the aisle that the crowd parts and I finally see him. The king. He lounges on the stone throne, his legs splayed out. In place of a shirt, he wears dozens of bleached bone necklaces, each one strung with a dizzying number of teeth and bones. His brown leather trousers hang low on his tan hips, and strapped to them are several blades, some made from stone, others steel. His chestnut hair is plaited back from his face, and it hangs in ropes over his shoulders. A crown made out of metal and bone perches high on his head. The thing is fashioned crudely, and I'm surprised that a fay would wear such a thing. It looks like something I made in art class when I was five. His glittering green eyes fall first on Des before skipping over to me. Here they take their time, moving from my face to my chest, hips, and legs. Then they make a slow climb back up. As he assesses me, his fingers tap against an armrest. I would have said he was bored, except there's far too much interest sparking in his eyes. The fairies in front of us stop and kneel. Your Majesty, they murmur. I see we have visitors. The king says this like Des and I are offending his sensibilities. His sensibilities. The man sitting in the I was drunk when I made this chair. The kneeling fairies now stand, turning to us. Bow before his eminence, lord of the banished, master of the forgotten, protector of the maligned, King Typhus Henbane. One of our escorts commands, though he looks a little ill while he says it. The bargainer saunters forward a few steps. You have titles? How charming. King Henbane stands his chestnut hair gleaming under the torchlight and his necklaces rustling. Forced your way into my presence without even a bow to show for it. Can't say I'm surprised at your impetuousness, Desmond Flynn. So he knows who Des is. I also noticed that he dropped my mate's title. Definitely a snub there, and today is really not the day. The bargainer seems particularly prickly. Typhus's gaze slides to me, and again he assesses me. This time, however, there's more than a touch of scorn in them. But for your slave lover to not show me respect. He clicks his tongue. Last time I endured such a grave insult, I impaled the fairy for it. Down our bond I feel a flash of white-hot anger, but looking at Des, you would never know it. The King of Night gives Typhus a mocking smile. Last time I saw a jester pretending to be a king, I actually laughed. Ooh, burn! The room goes deathly silent. Welp, that got their attention. This king's wings flicker behind his back and his face ticks. If you came here to curry my favor, O oh great king, then you might want to start over. You are an exiled criminal still serving out your sentence. In what world would I seek out your favor? Typhus laughs in the face of that, the crowd echoing the sentiment. When the room quiets down, he says, 
Do you know how I came to be? The king sits back down on his throne. I was already strong before I was ever sent here some hundred and fifty years ago, and I have since imbibed countless men's magic. Even a day here has left me with what feels like a mild hangover. I can't imagine years, decades, centuries of this. Typhus must be powerful, to live here for this long and still have so much magic. Thousands have gifted me their powers, he continues, all in return for my protection, protection which you are now threatening. Des raises his eyebrows. Is that right? We're not in your kingdom anymore. We're in mine. He doesn't say it, but he's implying that Des and I are bound by Loi de Royaume, that we must submit to Typhus's rule and the laws of his land. The bargainer's eyes sweep over the room. So this is your kingdom now? A surprised little chuckle escapes him. King Hanbane tightens his grip on his armrests. Forgive me, Des says, but this is the first I've heard of anyone wanting this shithole. Hanbane rises to his feet again, his face flushing with anger. At his back, angular, iridescent wings begin to form. Aw, did my boyfriend piss someone off? The king motions to someone in the crowd, and in response, a fairy steps away from the gathered masses, a pair of thick iron shackles in his gloved hands. Several of the soldiers in our entourage now hesitantly grab Dez. They might not want to get in another skirmish with the King of Night, but they also don't want to betray their loyalties. They move my mate's hands in front of him, and Dez just lets them. I make a move to intercede, but two of our escorts cut me off, holding me in place. The king of the night flashes me a look, and unlike all his playful words, the expression is serious, though I'm not sure what unspoken message he's trying to beam at me. The fairy with the iron manacles steps up to the bargainer. I don't care that Des is powerful and unyielding as the fairy moves them to his wrists. I struggle at the sight of them. During my time as Karnon's prisoner, I saw exactly what iron did to the fae. With an ominous clink, the soldier cuffs Des. They're only on his wrists for an instant before the iron shackles slide uselessly off, landing on the dirt floor in front of Des. The bargainer raises his eyebrows. That was not supposed to happen, I take it? He asks. Up on the throne, the king fists one of his hands, but otherwise continues to watch impassively. Frowning, the fairy picks up the iron manacles with a gloved hand and again tries to cuff Des. And again, the shackles slip off him, falling once more to the ground. This time, when the guard stoops to grab them, the bargainer kicks them away. Whoops. Typhus settles into his seat, his sharp green eyes flicking over me. Since our Lord King won't cooperate, put a pair on the bitch he's with. In response, the room gets a hint darker. Once more, the fairy bends down and picks up the shackles. Only as soon as he touches them, the cuffs clamp themselves on his wrist. His gloves slide off, exposing his bare skin to the iron. It only takes a few seconds for his screams to start up. And that right there is proof that this whole kingdom is nothing but fool's gold. I was imprisoned next to enough real soldiers to know that no matter how badly iron burned them, they wouldn't give their captors the benefit of their screams. That assery at its finest. That was how hardened those soldiers were. These fairies are nothing but boys and girls role-playing at being soldiers. Des takes several steps forward, his magic thickening in the air. You really shouldn't have said that. That's all the warning he gives. In the next instant, power explodes out of him, tearing through the room. It blasts back the crowd of fairies, knocking them down like bowling pins. Even Typhus is thrown back against his seat, the stone trembling under the force of Dez's magic. The king looks utterly shell-shocked for a moment, and I can't decide whether he's blown away by Dez's power or his audacity. When he recovers, magic begins to form in his fist, bending the light as it takes the shape of a spear. 
He throws the bolt like a javelin, aiming straight for Dez. The bargainer doesn't move, so he has time to sidestep the throw. Instead, he takes the full brunt of it as it slams into his chest. He grunts at the impact, then touches his chest with mild interest. I am impressed. How many of your subjects have you drained to amass this sort of power? Hundreds? Thousands? You must be co-bound to damn near everyone to wield this level of magic. Another sphere begins to form in Typhus's hand. They've bequeathed their power willingly. Uh-huh, and cake has no calories. So I could defend them from men like you. Des waves a hand, and King Henbane is thrown back in his seat, his magic disintegrating in an instant. Enough! The King of the Night says it with such finality that the room full of hardened criminals now stills. Des steps forward. I was told you could give me answers, and I will have them, one way or another. Typhus grimaces in his seat, his body slightly contorted. It takes a moment for me to realize that's because the bargainer's magic has him pinned in place. Around us, the fairies crowding the room seem to be held back by invisible hands. For the first time since exiting Gallagher Nix's tomb, the air is thick with power. It slips over my arms and curls around my ankles, caressing my skin. But unlike the magic in Gallagher's tomb, Des's power is familiar and inviting— it drapes itself over me like a shawl. Des closes in on the dais, each careful step echoing across the quiet room. He struck us all dumb. There's a grave in the southwestern territory of the banished lands, he says, his gaze trained on typhus. It's marked by several large boulders. The body inside it was impervious to damage, and now it's missing. I want to know how that came to be. Typhus narrows his eyes, a calculative gleam in them. I have no idea what you're talking about, he says, his words ringing false. I fibbed better when I was in diapers. But even if I did, he continues, why should I tell you? You don't recognize my rule. Des studies the fairy, his head cocked to the side, my body tenses, expecting some reaction with a good dose of panache. But that's not what I get. Dez's expression becomes almost contemplative. He nods, like Typhus didn't just feed him a load of horse shit. Around the room, the bargainer's magic lifts and the air tastes parched once more. Cautiously, fairies begin to get to their feet. Typhus doesn't move, instead pretending that he deliberately chose to sit like a folded-up pretzel. There is one other matter I must attend to before we head back to my kingdom, the bargainer says, waiting until he's sure he has the room's undivided attention. You know as well as I do that I can't leave here with you as you are, Des says. So either you give them— He jerks his head to the desperate hordes that bracket us in. Back their magic, or I'll do it for you. I'm thinking that— I'll do it for you involves sharp weapons and a dead body. Typhus rises from his throne, his face darkening and his hands trembling with his rising anger. The scent of the banished king's borrowed magic saturates the air. It smells just how you'd imagine it would, like that time you idiotically sampled too many perfumes on yourself and now all those strong, potent smells are clashing and giving you a mother of a headache. Kill him where he stands. It's an open order, and I'm pretty sure this idiot expects all of the fairies in this room to answer to it. No. I feel the power of that one word ripple through the enclosed space. But it's not Des who says it. I step away from the bargainer, my skin illuminating. I've had enough of this place, where the air itself feels like it's trying to squeeze your magic out of you, and I've had enough of this man, who for all his years of life has learned nothing except how to be a brutish a-hole. In response to my magic, the crowd around us begins to press in, none so close as our guards. 
as soon as their eyes fall on me, they forget they are self-respecting fairies who have duties. They move towards me, ready to touch my skin, stroke my hair, drink me up, and consume me whole. It's the way it always has been. Only here, in this magicless place, my glamour is all the more alluring. Get out of my way, I order, my power filling my voice. The fairies do as I say, albeit a little reluctantly. What are you fools doing? This king shouts at them, despite the fact that he can't rip his gaze off of me. Shut up, I order. His mouth clicks closed. The sheer outrage on his face. I savor every last drop of it. No one move, except to breathe, I order, my voice echoing in the cavern. Oh, and Dez, ignore my commands. You can do whatever you want. Around us, the room seems to freeze in place. If I didn't know better, I'd say I was in a hall of statues. The bargainer folds his arms and leans against the nearest frozen fairy, using him like he would a wall. Des has a good deal of mirth in his eyes, and it's clear he's eager to let me steal the show. I begin to walk down the aisle, towards Typhus's throne, my hips swaying. I head up to the dais, Typhus's gaze pinned in place. You can move your eyes, I allow. Immediately they snap to me. It's hard to read his emotions, since the rest of him is still frozen in place, but I definitely say that I'm getting some strong anger vibes coming from him. I really shouldn't let you do this, Des says behind me. He sounds gleeful. I reach Typhus's throne, and God, his chair is even uglier up close. His crudely made crown rests right there, within reach, and I just can't help myself. I reach out and lift the thing off of his head, then settle it onto mine. Look at that, I breathe. The slave you wanted to shackle is now your queen. Now I can see Typhus's anger bubbling in his eyes. Still, he's powerless. On a whim, I command him, Stand, Typhus. Robotically, he rises from his chair. Now, O oh great king, bow before me. Typhus dips low, his nose nearly touching his knees as he's forced to follow my command. As a P.I., I've seen my fair share of pissed-off looks when someone is caught in the web of my glamour. King Henbane is no exception. He stares at me like he's cursing my very existence with his eyes. I lap it up like a cat does cream. Sit. He sits. He won't recover from this. Not now that his subjects have seen how easily I took his crown and bent his will. I tilt my head at the sight of him, sullen and powerless. There is just something about a felled man that gets to me in the most twisted way. Giving in to my baser nature, I move forward, climbing onto the king's lap, straddling his thighs. I feel just the thinnest thread of jealousy through my connection— that, too, I lap up. I am something to envy. Lifting a hand, I reach for one of his necklaces, enjoying the sick way the bones and teeth shiver as they brush each other. My gaze flicks to him, and Typhus's green eyes seem to darken. There's still plenty of anger in them, but now there's lust there, too. I smile. Someone probably wants to hate-bang me. Wouldn't be the first time. I readjust myself on his lap, shaking my hair out. Why did I think glamouring him was important? Oh, right. You will answer all my questions fully and honestly, I command. Now, how long ago was the tomb opened? I ask. His upper lip twitches in distaste. A few weeks ago. Recent. Part of me had assumed the tomb was opened years ago. I glance over my shoulder at Dez, a self-satisfied smirk on my face. He stares back at me, and his expression is amused, but his eyes are stormy. 
Swiveling forward again, I lean into this idiot king, petting his cheek. In response, the room dims a little. Apparently, my mate has some objections to me petting other men. And who opened the tomb? I breathe. I don't know, he growls. What do you mean, you don't know? I mean, it wasn't a who at all. Losing patience. Explain, I command. Again, he hesitates. How precious, as if he can fight the hold I have on him. After two short seconds, he gives up. On the night the dead man rose, the night Gallagher rose, he clarifies, making it clear that he knows exactly who lay buried in that grave. It was a shadow that retrieved him. Chapter 12 I don't think I breathe. Around me, the room darkens. A shadow, I repeat. Back to this insidious shadow. I'd almost forgotten about this aspect of the Thief of Souls. The Night Kingdom's wet nurses had seen a shadow watching over the casket children, and in the Flora Kingdom I had heard about a shadow visiting the sleeping women. I glance over my shoulder at Dez, the two of us sharing a look. What did the shadow look like? I ask, facing Typhus once more. My voice lilts as the glamour drips off my tongue. Typhus glares at me, his fury still apparent. It looked like a shadow. I don't know, I wasn't there. This is just what was reported to me. God's damn idiot slave. This last part he says under his breath. Just loud enough for me to hear. The room darkens anyway. I don't need to look behind me to know Dez is all but primed for an attack. I don't let him get the chance. I click my tongue and grab Typhus's chin, squeezing his jaw the way annoying relatives love to squeeze kids' faces. I lower my voice to match his. This idiot slave has your willpower by the balls. Now apologize to me. I'm sorry. Stay healthy and it's strong the least in this place. Apology, I, I trade know. magic for my protection, even though I'm the worst thing fairies have to fear out here. He takes a breath. I've killed hundreds, maybe thousands of fairies, some outright, and some indirectly after I drained them of too much magic. I have a hidden room filled with countless fairies who are all but dead. An unbidden shiver moves through me. Sounds like the Thief of Souls. He continues. I try to keep them alive for as long as possible. Why? I interject. Once a fairy dies, the bond is broken and Typhus loses their power. Dez says from where he stands. Dead man can't uphold oaths. Typhus begins explaining the same thing, forced by my glamour to answer my question. Once he finishes, he pauses, ever hopeful that he can skirt around my other order the one where he confesses his crimes. I raise my eyebrows, bemused. Around me, fairies flash him venomous glares. Poor little Typhus. With a shudder, he continues on. I have blackmailed men and women into having sex with me. I've lied about how strong I really am. I cannot single-handedly stop an uprising should one happen. On and on it goes. It takes twenty minutes. Twenty incriminating minutes for Typhus to get through the impressively long list of shitty things he's done. By the end of those twenty minutes, you can feel the room baying for his blood. Hell, after hearing his laundry list of dirty deeds, I want to rip his throat out. This king knows it, too. He's now openly sweating. It drips into his eyes and down his chin. Gone is his cockiness. I wonder how long it's been since he's felt this kind of fear. Apologize to all these fairies, I command Typhus. Apologize and mean it. His eyes move to the crowd. I'm sorry for everything I've done. His voice is low and hollow with something like guilt. It's definitely not regret, but whatever. Some people never do regret their choices only where their choices landed them. I walk around the throne, 
my skin still glowing, high as fuck off my power. I still wear his crown on my head, and I'll admit the weight of it gives me a little rush. When my gaze meets Typhus's, the devil is in his eyes. All right, I say. Enough of this. I use my sweet, cajoling voice, and the king seems to relax at the sound of it. I can practically hear his thoughts. Almost over. Oh, I say, mock surprised. Did you think I was through with you? Oh, Typhus, no, no, no. I'm shaking my head, my voice pitying. Through my connection, I can feel a whisper of Dez. The sensation is so faint that it's hard to place what emotion of his slipped across our bond, but if I had to guess, I'd say it was awe. And I realize, this is the first time he's truly seen me use my magic. Stopping the sleeping soldiers was one thing, but playing with a man's free will, toying with him and drawing it out as I savor the kill? This is new territory for him, and judging by his reaction... My twisted king approves. No one in this room is leaving without their powers, I say. In response, Typhus's face goes red, and another wave of his power fills the air. He's still bound by my glamour, however, to only answer my questions. I watch him for several seconds, letting his mighty magic fight mine. It's useless. I have absolute control over him right now. But I will indulge him. Go ahead, I say. Tell me what's on your mind. What you're asking for is impossible, he gasps out. I would have to break every single oath. Some fairies aren't even conscious enough to agree to that. My voice goes ice cold. Or they could just simply kill you. Dead men, after all. Can't uphold oaths. I stare down, Typhus, every bit the heartless creature our lore has made me out to be. I'm sure the lot of you will figure something out. I back up from him, a nefarious smile spreading across my face. Typhus Henbane, I say, my skin lit, my glamour thickening the air. I command you to return every single bit of magic you've stolen within two days' time. Much longer than that, and my glamour might wear off. Typhus gives me a look like I've brought the axe down upon his neck. I'm not even done. You will never again exchange power for your betterment. My eyes flick around us. May your people have mercy upon you. I walk away from him towards Dez, my footsteps echoing throughout the throne room. I touch the crown that still perches on my head and pause. I swivel one last time to face Typhus. Oh, and I'm keeping this. Chapter 13 Water? Check. Dark room? Check. Forehead massage? Check. I've done everything within my limited power to kick this migraine in the nuts. Nothing's working. I rub my temples yet again, my head pounding. Why does everything hurt so much? I whine. My tongue feels swollen and my lips parched. Even my teeth seem to ache. Desmond comes over to where I stand in his chambers. Around us, the soft lamplight has been dimmed to the point of near darkness. It's still not enough. It's one of the unwelcome side effects of visiting the banished lands. He holds out his closed hand. His fingers unfurl, revealing what looks like a piece of candy, if candy were iridescent. This might help more than the massage. What is it? I take the strange lozenge from his palm. Believe it or not, fairies have medicine just like humans do. I let out a crazy laugh. This is Fay Aspirin? Close enough, he says. What do you want in return? I ask, placing the pill on my tongue. I mean, this migraine is bad enough that I'd happily sell the bargainer one of my appendages for it. But I do still want to know what it'll cost me. 
For a moment, the avarice in his expression falls away, and he looks a little sad. Callie, you don't owe me. Not for something like this. I'm... Sorry I gave you that impression. My features soften. Thank you. For the magical aspirin. I say it with a lisp as the pill sits between my tongue and my teeth. It's not bitter like human medicine, nor is it sweet like the hard candy it looks like. Instead, it tastes like honeysuckle melting on my tongue. Des kisses my forehead. Then his eyes drift up. He touches the crown I'm still wearing. And here I thought you didn't want to be a queen, he says, eyeing the thing. I reach for it possessively. It's my war prize. Even if it looks like something a blind man made while drunk. I must admit, you are delightfully cruel when you want to be. It was beautiful nightmare before, and now it's delightfully cruel. I should be mortified by these compliments. And maybe the socially acceptable part of me is. But the part of me that wants to feast on men's hearts and bathe in their dying breaths is covetously collecting them, one by one. Daz's gaze is heavy and hungry when it drops to me. Do you take war prizes from all your victims? I shiver a little. They're not my victims. Hmm. They're not. Are you going to answer the question? I take the crown off my head and study it. It is truly ugly. Only the really bad ones, I say. The ones who like to break people. They are the ones I enjoy twisting to my every whim. I take mementos from them. Back at my house, I have a box full of these mementos I've lifted over the years. On particularly bad days, days when not even Johnny or Jack or Jose could numb my pain away, I'd steal away to my guest room where I kept that box, and I'd sit there for hours, taking out item after item, holding each in my palm, and I would remember how I broke a few of the great villains of the world. If my confession freaks Des out, he doesn't show it. In fact, his expression has gotten hungrier. The fae side of him is positively delighted to hear this perversion of mine. I learned about that box one of the times I visited your house. Des admits. My brow wrinkles. He knew? I think I'm alarmed. Then why did you ask? I say. Des begins to back me up, directing me with his body to his chamber's balcony. I wanted to hear you say it. Behind me, the cool evening breeze stirs my hair. I turn and step outside, my skin pebbling. Unlike the banished lands, Somnia is a wash in magic. It radiates from every night-blooming flower, every pixie that zips around like gusts of wind. It laces each decadent cloud plume, and it drips down like rain from the heavens. And now I'm a part of it, from my fey magic to the bond that connects me to this white-haired king. I stare at Des as I take a seat on the stone floor of the balcony. He has no idea just how in love with him I am— it would be impossible for him to understand. I must be making a strange face because he says, What is it, Cherub? This is the point in the conversation where we barter for secrets. He gives me something I want, and I confess some coveted truth. You know, our typical give and take. I remember Dez's sad eyes. Callie, you don't owe me. Not for something like this. He doesn't owe me for something like this, either. I shake my head. I love you so much. You'll never really know. His features sharpen, and the look in his eyes intensifies. The way fairies love? It's the same way we live. It's immortal, violent, irrational, and unbendable. I understand your words, Cherub, because there are aspects of my love for you that are, simply put, unfathomable. My heart begins to gallop as we stare at each other, our connections singing to me. I can feel Dez beneath my sternum, even as I stare at him. 
He's always in me, always a part of me. It's the most uncanny sensation. Never breaking eye contact, Des lifts a hand. From deep in his chambers, a bottle of something pink and bubbly floats into his open palm. A few seconds later, two elaborate flutes slip into his other hand. The bargainer settles himself next to me, his back leaning against the wall. He sets the items down, and a moment later the bottle uncorks itself and begins pouring. What's the occasion? I ask, watching the rosy liquid foam as it fills the flutes. My soulmate survived a day in the banished lands, and managed to walk away with the kingdom's crown. I'd say that's an occasion worth celebrating. Something warm blooms low in my stomach. Something that feels a lot like happy, stupid love. And maybe a little pride, too. I helped chip away at the mystery of Galagar's awakening. When the champagne flutes are filled, one floats over to me. I take it and peer into the drink. This is safe to drink, right? I ask. It isn't like the rosé version of lilac wine. You caught me, love. I'm hoping to grow you a set of pointy ears, Des says, taking his own glass. I stare down at my drink, swirl it, wonder if I should drink it after having a migraine, then a magical pill with who knows what side effects. Des doesn't look over at me when he says, I wouldn't let you drink that if I thought I was putting you at risk. I glance sharply at him. <sighs> Please tell me you're not asking how I knew that. I'm not entirely sure my ego would recover from that sort of slight. Heaven forbid I wonder how Des knows an unknowable thing. Your ego could probably use being knocked down a peg or two, I say. He presses a finger to my mouth. Shh, cherub. You don't know what you're talking about. I nip at his finger. In response, Des's eyes become like sultry little sluts. Fay wine doesn't interact quite the same way human wine does, he says distractedly. Now do that again. If I do that again, I'll be in serious threat of turning this into a bang fest, which is always fun. Right now, though, I kind of sort of just want to savor this thing between us. It's our friendship aged eight years, with a little bit of sex thrown in. I draw his finger away and bring the wine to my mouth. So. So, he repeats, his gaze trained to my lips. He's excruciating to look at, with his pale eyes and even paler hair. I'm going to cave and let him carry me inside so I can have my way with him if I keep drinking him in. I gather my legs up to me and look out over his kingdom, desperate to hold on to this moment. I never thought I'd be here, I say taking a steadying breath as my gaze sweeps over Somnia. All those years ago? I mean, I had always hoped you'd take me, but I never really thought I'd be here one day. Dez's gaze falls heavy on me. I did, it seems to say. After several moments, he turns his attention to the night. I never imagined it would be under these circumstances. My wing roots prick at his words drawing my attention away from the ominous note in his voice to the fact that I am a part of this world, with all its horror and injustice, and I fit in here as I never have on earth. I have scales and wings and claws and fey power running through my veins. I feel suitably magical for this place. Think Typhus is still alive? I ask, changing the subject. The bargainer huffs out a laugh. Unlikely. Is that a pang of guilt, I feel? Callie, don't feel bad for the man. I make a face into my wine. The shit is super good. Ugh, you're like a mind reader tonight. I'm serious. That's easy for you to say. You've been making people disappear for decades. I've seen it firsthand. Des looks at me like I'm cute and odd and exasperating all at the same time. Have you forgotten all the terrible things that the fairy admitted to? Things like rape and coercion and murder and twenty minutes of other terrible deeds. 
I take a drink and shake my head. And you still feel bad? Nod. The rim of the champagne flute rattles between my teeth as I play with it. No. Yes. Maybe. I killed fairies only a couple of nights ago. Dooming a man to death definitely doesn't top that. So it's ridiculous to feel bad for this when I haven't shed a tear for the poor souls I killed not so long ago. I don't know why I feel this way. Nothing makes much sense anymore. Des leans his head against the wall, staring up at the stars. The devil is in the details, you know. Those teeth and bones Typhus wore, he took each of them from his victims. Some while they were still living, some shortly after they died. If that's supposed to make me feel better, it doesn't. My soulmate has pulled plenty of teeth of his own. He's a bad man, too. It doesn't make him deserving of death, at least not in my book. And all that borrowed magic? Des continues. The process is called co-binding, and though Typhus made it sound cavalier and impersonal, it's not like that. Des says. I stare down at my fey wine. And how is it? Remember those horcruxes in Harry Potter? I begin to smile in spite of myself. Are you seriously dropping an HP reference right here, right now? I ask, glancing over at Des. I have your undivided attention, don't I? And all my love. I mean, I knew he was soulmate material before, but this pretty much just sealed the deal. Des's face grows serious. Essentially, when you exchange magic, you're transferring more than raw energy. You're moving a piece of yourself as well. That's massively creepy. It's not to be taken lightly. Most fairies, if they decide to do such a thing, spend centuries picking out the right individual. Even then, it's a tricky business. Lovers quarrel, families divide, friends deceive. It happens. You can never fully guarantee that the person you share magic with will always be your ally. For a fairy to give away their power to a stranger, and in the banished lands where the earth itself drains away a fairy's magic shockingly fast, such an exchange is akin to suicide. Typhus did that to everyone there. By forcing him to return the magic he coerced from those fairies, you helped right a wrong. I take a ponderous sip of my wine. Have you ever done it? I ask. Have you ever co-bound yourself to someone? The bargainer gives me a look that should melt the panties from my body. I bound myself to my soulmate. Would you say that counts? I smile into my drink. Are you admitting that I have a piece of your soul? His eyes dip to my curving lips. More than a piece, cherub. Hey, bitch. Have a nice trip. Temper asks the next day when she waltzes into the library where Des and I have spent the morning. As soon as she enters, a dozen different paintbrushes drift away from the enormous canvas Des is working on. He's not nearly finished with it, but I already know what image he's bringing to life— there's the Flora Kingdom's ballroom, decorated with a thousand blooming plants, and among it all, there I am, my black wings folded behind me, my hair twinkling with the night sky. I'm looking directly out at the viewer, my dark eyes looking troubled and impish all at once. He's capturing the night he put the stars in my hair. I don't tell the bargainer that I get a little thrill looking at the painting, that for once I look like I belong somewhere. It was interesting, I say, taking a sip from my mug of coffee. Have fun in my absence? I got by, Temper says, her fingers running over a nearby shelf of books. I went back to that tailor to get more fey outfits. She smooths a hand down her outfit, and holy shit, why am I only now noticing what she's wearing? The gown? Yes, my best friend chose to put on a gown before noon— Looks like woven rainwater, each individual droplet glistening as she moves. Cascading down the skirt are what look like water lilies, the flowers artfully placed so that they hide all her incriminating bits. The neckline of the dress is so low that it plunges down to her navel. It's extra as fuck. Did you threaten the tailor again? I ask. 
Last time we'd gotten fitted for outfits, she'd been a little huffy. Temper clears her throat. I call it incentivizing. Oh, geez. Temper's eyes move to the painting and she whistles. Damn, Desmond, I didn't know you painted. He lifts a shoulder. When I'm restless. Malachi comes in right then, his imposing frame filling the doorway. Immediately, my eyes hone in on the hickeys wringing his neck. He could have removed them. It would only take a pinch of magic, and yet there they are. In fact, not only did Malachi not remove the hickeys, he's also pulled his hair into one of those girly little buns, further displaying them. Someone should tell him hickeys were only cool in middle school. When Temper catches me staring, she waggles her eyebrows. I bite my lower lip to keep my laugh in check. Joke's on her because every day she strings this fairy along, he's less likely to let her slip through his clutches, and Temper does not do commitment. So? Malachi says, taking a seat next to Des, his bronze eye patch catching the light. How was your visit to the banished lands? Temper sits down next to me. The sleeve of her dress brushes against my arm, dampening a patch of my clothes. All the tomb's enchantments are still in place, and there's no sign of forced entry. And yet the body is gone, Des says. I suppress a shiver at the memory of that empty tomb. For the last month, Galagar Nix has been gallivanting about. How is that possible? Malachi asks. Des rolls a paintbrush between his fingers. The best information we got was that a shadow retrieved him. Malachi's brows furrow. A shadow? Is this the thief we're dealing with? Probably, I say. He curses. Of course, the two worst fairies in the world have decided to team up. He shakes his head and rubs a hand over his eyes. How the hell did this happen? The fuck if I know, Des says, throwing the paintbrush aside. Are you in the mood for a bit of reconnaissance? Malachi's face is grim. This has to do with your asshole father. Des inclines his head. The general's eye glitters. I'd love nothing more. His friend's scarred face and eye patch look a little sinister in the light. The bargainer begins to smile. Good. I'd like you to meet with some of our old connections back on Barbos. Tell them that the dead king has risen, and anyone who has knowledge of his whereabouts will be handsomely compensated. And if someone can lead me to him? Malachi asks. Report back to me first. I don't want a chance losing him. Oh, and by the way... Des's eyes inadvertently land on temper. Be discreet. Why are you looking at me? Temper's voice is several octaves louder than everyone else's. The bargainer arches an eyebrow. I'm as motherfucking discreet as they come, she says. I'm trying really, really hard not to laugh, but the struggle is real. Malachi manages a sharp nod. We will be discreet, he assures Des. The sorceress huffs. Y'all need to get your heads checked. I am not the problem. She turns on Malachi. And you don't need to go making promises for me. I never even said I was coming along. And you don't need to. The bargainer stands. But if you imagine staying behind so that you could have fun with Callie, then you'll be sorely disappointed. The future Night Queen has official business that will take her away from the palace. It takes me a second to realize Des is referring to me. Wait, I say. I haven't agreed to be queen. Yeah, Temper agrees. My girl hasn't agreed. What? She turns on me. Bitch, have you lost your mind? Take that crown and wear that shit like it's your birthright. Ignoring temper, Dez's gaze falls on me, his features sharp. I apologize. The Night King's consort has official business that will take her away from the palace. I narrow my eyes at my mate. I might not have jumped on board with this whole queen business, but I sure as hell don't want to be known simply as someone else's consort. Huh? <sighs> Temper whoops. Falling back into her seat. You better sleep with one eye open, Desmond. I've seen my girl make men pay for less. He's still staring intensely at me. That's odd. 
For as long as I've known Callie, she's the one who's paid for my services. I admit it'll be nice not to be the prostitute in our relationship for once. Temper snickers, appraising Des all over again. Fuck one eye, sleep with both eyes open. I shake my head at Des as I stand, my eyes slitted. It's time to go. We give Kurt goodbyes to Temper and Malachi, then slip out of the library. You do realize how close you were to getting glamoured, don't you? I say as we head down the hallway. Des's eyes seem to be laughing at me. You say that like I'd mind. Most men do. Then again, Des isn't most men. So what is this official business? I say, changing the subject. The bargainer's face turns grim. Now that the kingdoms of flora and fauna have fallen, the Day Kingdom is our one remaining ally. You and I are going to pay them a visit. Chapter 14 I smell the bodies before I see them. Jazz and I have barely stepped off the ley line and entered the Kingdom of Day when the scent of burnt flesh assaults me. I don't know what I was expecting from the Day Kingdom when Des told me we were going to be visiting, but this isn't it. I shield my eyes against the blindingly bright overhead sun until they adjust to the sight before them. All around us, the world is on fire. Pyres as large as houses stretch as far as the eyes can see, and they roar as they burn. Thick, oily smoke billows off of them, twisting into the air and turning the sky into a reddish haze. We skirt around them, one by one, the oily smoke coating my skin. I begin to sweat from the heat wafting off of them. It's stifling, suffocating. Around us the flames reach high into the sky, as though they were trying to touch the very sun itself— as blazing as each inferno is, I can still make out the bodies within. There are dozens of them piled on one another, their forms blackened to a crisp. Their uniforms have long burned off. But I don't need to see them to know these are the sleeping soldiers who invaded the Kingdom of Day. So this is how Dez's final ally defeated the enemy. They simply killed them all off. My eyes sweep over the landscape again. Des and I have arrived at the edge of a large floating island. Here, where the land gives way to sky, the pyres sit like grim sentinels. Beyond them, I can only make out the hazy outline of a tangle of flora and what appears to be a looming mountain range. The sun glares down at us through the haze, and on any other day I'm sure this kingdom is a glorious sight— but right now the place is like spoiled wine. Next to me, the bargainer squints up at the sun, which now burns blood red through the haze of smoke. I've always hated this place, he says. Too bright for my taste. But this? He shakes his head. This makes me wish for those insufferably bright days. He takes my hand, and with that, the two of us head towards the looming mountains— we're not walking the entire way, are we? I glance above us as we pass under a bright green tree, violet flowers growing from its branches. Around us, the vegetation presses in from all sides. I can only see about fifty feet ahead, and it's all jungle. Cheer up, Cherub. You have me as company, and I am an excellent conversationalist. Crap, we are totally walking the entire way— that sucks extra balls when the air smells like a graveyard. I wince. The smell might legit kill me first. Des plucks a deep blue flower from a nearby vine, sliding it behind my ear. We can't have that now, he says. He leads us to a stairway I almost miss because it blends in with its surroundings so well. It's woven from vines and leaves, and it winds up a tree trunk and ascends high into the air. Once we're level with the canopies of trees, the stairway levels, turning into a bridge that sways as we walk along it. What's with the bridge? I ask. What about it? 
Des asks, disappearing only to reappear yards away at the end of the bridge, arms crossed. Ugh, you never walk to the palace, do you? You simply pop into existence there. Des's eyes twinkle. Sometimes. Okay, most of the time, and that's because Janice hates it so much. Just as I reach him, he disappears, winking into existence farther along the bridge where it twists between trees. Are you going to do this the entire way? I complain. Maybe. Well, can you make me disappear with you at least? I ask, waving away some of the hazy smoke that's hanging in the air. It doesn't work like that. Not unless we co-bound our power. But I thought that being bonded meant we shared magic. As I speak, I reach down our bond and tug on Dez's power. We do, Cherub, but it doesn't quite work the same way, and... I see his teeth set on edge as he lets out a little laugh. You're trying to use my magic. Can you blame me? I mean, the dude can teleport. I want to do that. The rope bridge is cool and all, but I don't want to walk. I pull on our bond one final time, feeling Des's magic slip into my veins and travel down to my fingertips. For the briefest of moments, the air subtly darkens. Then it dissipates along with my mate's powers. Fine, I say. I'll stop, but I'm not thrilled to be walking. Duly noted. We could fly. We could. Des agrees, which is fairy speak for, yeah, no. Since I don't know where our destination precisely is, I'm stuck following his ass. On foot. Boo. I tow the woven walkway. I still don't understand this bridge. I mutter. I get having bridges when there are rivers and chasms that make walking impossible, but the forest floor looks perfectly fine to walk on. I mean, if my feet touch the ground, is the earth going to rip apart and swallow me whole? If it has any taste in women, then yes, that will definitely happen. Des, I say, trying not to laugh. He vanishes, reappearing farther away than before. Where are you going? I thought you were supposed to be this amazing conversationalist. I complain as I run my hands over the knotted vine railing. He smirks at me from where he stands five million miles away. Or maybe, I say, my skin beginning to glow, I should just make you walk alongside me, or carry me the entire way. He raises an eyebrow, his glee obvious. Is that an order? It depends. Even with the distance between us, I see him smother a smile. My, my, you're awfully bossy for a woman who doesn't want to be queen. Walk with me, Des, I say, my voice melodic. Immediately the bargainer appears in front of me, his hands braced on the rope. I begin to saunter forward, my body swaying. My scales ripple to life along my forearms, my claws sharpen. Des begins to back up, his gaze never leaving mine. So is this what we're going to do? You glamour me until I submit to you? His silver eyes gleam, his white hair hanging loose around his face. He looks like the kind of rogue I want to defile and be defiled by. I catch his shirt before he can back up any more, my claws inadvertently shredding it in the process. I reel him in, pressing a kiss to his lips. Yes. I whisper against him. With that, I release him, my skin gradually fading back to its normal color. The two of us begin to walk, making our way across the suspended walkway. I touch my lips, the taste of Dez still sharp on my tongue. Is this feeling between us ever going to go away? I ask. In three thousand years or whatever? Cherub. Dez interrupts. Where are you getting your information from? Fairies don't live that long. Is this thing we've got between us one day going to fade? The King of Night stops to take my hand, cupping it between his own. Then he begins to back up, pulling me along with him. There are certain things in life that fade with time, 
he says, his gaze locked on mine. What we have, Callie, isn't one of those things. Our bond will only strengthen over the years. He pulls me along, the muted sunlight dappling across his skin. I will always be here for you, when you turn thirty and when you turn three hundred. Don't forget three thousand, I say. If you defy the odds and live until then, then so will I. He gives my hand a squeeze, his face getting serious. I will be with you on your best day, and I will be with you on your worst day. I will be there to hold our children. I raise an eyebrow at that. We're going to have many children, he informs me. Oh, are we now? And I will be there for them all. I will be there when the last of your mortal friends draws their last breath. I will be there through it all, and I will tease you and infuriate you and lavish you with whatever it is your heart desires, because the only thing mine desires is you. I give him a shaky smile, trying not to show him just how deeply his words have moved me. Yay, I say. Lamest response ever. Only rather than cringing, Des laughs and steals a kiss from me. And now I'll walk by your side the rest of the way because I finally, finally goaded you into being naughty and using your glamour. That was him goading me? He gives my knuckles a kiss, then releases my hand so he can walk in front of me. The two of us are silent for a ways after that. At some point I begin to hear the thud of footfalls. Lots and lots of footfalls. In the distance, trees shake violently, and for a moment I'm back in Mara's oak forest, watching the trees writhe and split open. The memory dissolves as the day soldiers come into view, their golden armor glinting as they storm towards us. Dez steps in front of me, his wings flaring to life behind him. They stretch wide, the razor-sharp talons looking particularly menacing. The day soldiers close in on us, their swords brandished. Jesus, their motto might as well be slash first, ask questions later. Dez crosses his arms. This is the welcome you give your kingdom's last remaining ally? He clicks his tongue. Janice did inform you that he was expecting a visit from the Kingdom of Night. The soldiers' weapons lower just a fraction, but they're still eyeing the two of us, particularly me, with suspicion. Where is your retinue? One of them demands. Recovering from battle, Jez says. I thought it wise to not bring more soldiers to your doorstep, seeing as how warmly your kingdom welcomed the last batch that visited. Even here I catch whiffs of those blazing pyres. The soldiers begrudgingly lower their weapons the rest of the way, and one begins to speak. By decree of the King of Day, Lord of Passages, King of Order, Truth-Teller, and Bringer of Light, Janice Soleil of the Isles of Light, you are now in this kingdom's custody until such a time as His Majesty— I don't think so. Des cuts in. You'll treat us as the royal guests we are or we leave. It's as simple as that. His wings fold behind his back. No, you all don't want to be responsible for derailing these talks, do you? When the soldier doesn't respond, another muscles his way to the front. Please, Your Highness, we're sorry for the misunderstanding. Our good king is eager to meet with you. This way, please. And with that, we resume our trek. It takes an annoyingly long time to get to the palace. I mean, the walk is scenic and all the forest lush with life, the ground sprinkled with glittering pools and rippling creeks and blah, 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 lots of pretty shit. But it's still a stupidly long walk, and now that Des and I have five billion guards hemming us in, our conversation is next to non-existent. To be fair, I have been entertained. Des has spent most of the last hour plaiting one guard's hair into at least fifty braids, he hasn't yet noticed, and moving branches into another guard's way. Motherfucking trees, the fairy mutters under his breath. I swear they're moving in my way. Lay off the spirits, Scythus, another says. Ahead of us, the forest parts and... My God. 
The palace rises like a golden mountain from the jungle. The Day King's castle is brilliant, blinding gold, just as staggering as the waterfall that cuts straight through it, plunging into a basin that's hidden by scores of other buildings that cluster around the palace. Wow, I breathe. One of the soldiers smiles at me. Welcome to Avalon. Chapter 15 For all the Day Kingdom's opulence, Avalon is a ghost town. The city streets are all but abandoned, though there's still the lingering, unholy scent of dark magic. But there are no bodies and no blood. The unpleasantries of battle have been moved to the outskirts of the island. Even when we enter, the castle proper seems abandoned, our footsteps echoing in the cavernous space. I glance around, looking for servants, aides, nobles, soldiers, anyone, but we're seemingly alone. The group of us enter a grand ballroom, the air touched with the lingering smell of blood and burnt magic. I glance up just as a shadow leaps from the golden banister high above us, swooping down in front of me and Dez. The fairy lands hard, a fist to the ground. The wings at his back are unfurled, his white feathers tinged with gold. He looks the angel to Dez's devil. It's only once he lifts his head that I realize I'm staring into the face of Janus Soleil, the King of Day. His hair shimmers and his bright blue eyes shine like topaz. It would be easy to confuse the Day King for an angel. He is everything the paintings have made angels out to be. His pointed ears be the only tell that he's something else entirely. Well, that and the hard, cunning gleam in his eyes— Janice doesn't have blood on him, but I would stake money that he killed dozens of those burning soldiers. The Day King's expression eases. Desmond Flynn, I've been eagerly awaiting your arrival. His eyes move to me. Calypso, he says, his eyes guarded as he nods at me. Good to see you again. His cool reception reminds me that not so long ago I accused him of kidnapping me. Janice had a twin, a twin who died. The first time you met him, you were really meeting me. It was the thief who'd captured me after all. The thief who wore the face of Julius when he snatched me from Dez's backyard. The green man had been dead when the thief wore his body. Julius had been dead when the thief wore his body. And that red-headed soldier, the one I interviewed... She had mentioned being lured away by her dead brother. Holy shit! I sway a little as a pattern begins to form. Callie? Dez's voice cuts through the screaming in my head. My eyes move to him. What is it? He asks softly. My eyes move from his to Janice's. The thief of souls can wear the faces of the dead— the three of us find a secluded place to talk. Correction, more secluded. Honestly, the whole thing seems unnecessary. There's no one left in the palace to eavesdrop. We don't end up striking a conversation again until we're securely in the Day King's private quarters. By then, Janice's wings are put away, but his fierce expression remains. As for what he or Dez think about my little revelation, it's hard to say. Neither of them look surprised— but then again, fairies seem to have really good poker faces. But if I assumed we were going to talk about it in private, then I assumed wrong. Neither king broaches the subject again. I mean, I know I'm no Sherlock Holmes. Don't tell my clients that. But this is something, right? Right? Janice ushers us to a cluster of chairs. Resting between the seats is a small table with a decanter and a set of glasses. Well, at least there's booze. I could use some booze. I take a seat, my attention drifting to a vivid mural on the wall to my left. Half of the image is painted in gold, the other in black. On one side is a golden man, rays of light emanating from his body. He holds his kneeling enemy by the throat. The captured man wears shackles on his wrists and ankles, and everything beyond him is painted in the inkiest of blacks. 
Do you like it? Janice asks, sitting down across from me. He reaches for the decanter between us, pouring the liquid into three glasses. I stare at the mural. What am I supposed to say? That the painting is just something to look at? That the most fascinating thing about it is the cute little loincloths each man wears? That would go over super well. Uh, yeah, I say. It's called The Banishment of Eurybios. Janice says, handing me a glass filled with emerald liquid. He hands another to Des. It depicts the fight between Brennus, the god of light and order, and Eurybios, the god of darkness and chaos. There's a beat of silence, then. I thought Pherion and Nyxos were the gods of light and dark. Janice pours himself a glass of the same liquor. Pherion and Nyxos came later, after the other world was formed. These were the proto-gods, the ones creation was born from, he says, turning his gaze to the wall. This captures the moment Brennus defeated his foe and banished him to the far corner of the universe. This is the moment the other world came to be. I tap my finger against my glass. What about the mother and the father? They too came later. They were the children of these first gods. This is all vastly fascinating. Des cuts in, but perhaps we can get to the point of the visit. He lounges in his seat, glass in hand, his legs splayed out. Janice drags his attention from the mural. Do my stories bore you, Night King? Yes. Des says flatly. The corner of Janice's mouth lifts. Fine. On to the bloody battle. I saw you dealt with your enemies the old-fashioned way, the King of Night says, bringing the dark green liquor to his lips. The Day King raises an eyebrow. I hear yours are still living. He leans forward. Tell me, Flynn, how did you manage that? Des's eyes move to me, a hint of a devilish smile on his face. I didn't. Janice follows his gaze. Your human stopped an army? Only now does the Day King truly study me. Pray tell, how did that happen? I narrow my eyes. Fairies as a whole think humans are beneath them. Even though I'm a siren and now a fey one at that, in many fairies' eyes I will always be a coarse mortal. Cherub, perhaps you can give Janice a demonstration? I hesitate. I don't know what the penalty for glamouring a king is, but back on Earth, that shit was a no-no. Janice takes a sip of his drink, watching me over the rim. Seems your mate is not up to the task. He goads. You know what? Fine. I set my drink aside and uncross my legs, rolling my shoulders back and letting the siren wake. She stretches out like a cat, basking in the sun— I feel my scales ripple to life along my forearms, and my wings itch to manifest. As soon as my skin brightens, Janice sits a little straighter, his gaze drawn to me. I rise to my feet, power rippling through my veins. The great day king, I say, my voice harmonizing. So very cocky. Stand for me. Janice's brows furrow as he rises to his feet. What are you doing? I step up to him, taking his drink from his hands and tossing it aside. The glass shatters against the mural, spraying emerald liquid everywhere. Giving you my demonstration, I say. That is what you wanted from me, isn't it? Yes, he says softly, quizzically. His gaze is pinned to mine. I can sense his rising magic. It thickens the air, smelling like sandalwood and blazing like the sun. There's one thing that fairies exert particular control and restraint over. One thing that will truly prove my power. Show me your wings, Janice. For a moment, nothing happens. The Day King continues to stare at me with spellbound eyes— then he frowns and staggers a half-step. Next to me, Des sips his drink, a delighted expression on his face. How are you? 
Janus breaks the sentence off with a groan. Bending forward, his wings burst from his back, the gold-tipped feathers shimmering. When he glances at me next, he no longer looks dazzled. Nope, the Day King is P-I-S-S-E-D. He stumbles towards me, his expression murderous. How dare you! Stop! I say. He freezes in place. This is what I do, I say. I step in close as he flashes me a hateful look. I am a siren. I glamour people. And now, thanks to the lilac wine Des gave me, I can glamour fairies as well. I can glamour you. My eyes drop to his lips. It doesn't matter that you're a king or a powerful fairy. Even you can fall under my thrall. He frowns at me. This is how I stopped an army without killing them all. Now, I say, tell me truthfully, if I release you from my glamour, will you attack me? For several seconds, Janice works his jaw, a muscle in his cheek feathering. Finally, he says, No. I back up. Too bad, I pout. It's so much fun when my victims put up a fight. Janice has reverted to looking at me with curiosity and no little amount of want. I sit back down and grab my tumbler. Is this safe to drink? I ask, pointing to my glass. Yes. Oh, good. I take a sip. I release you from my glamour. Janice staggers back a step. God's above. Hastily, his wings disappear. That was horribly invasive, Des says. I know. Isn't my mate exquisite? Janice takes a seat, waving his hand. His shattered glass stitches itself back together, the liquid reforming in the tumbler. It floats back into his hand, and he takes a long drink. I could have you thrown in the gallows for what you just did, he says contemplatively. The room darkens just a touch. Is that a threat? Dez says, his voice calm. It sounds awfully close to one. How do you even live with such a creature? Janice asks, his gaze sliding back to me. Despite how shaken he is, he looks halfway interested. I smile, baring my teeth at him. I try not to piss her off. I guffaw at that, my skin dimming. All right, the bargainer concedes. I do try to piss her off, but only because she has especially twisted ideas of revenge. Janice shakes his head. You two are a fucked up pair. Chapter 16 We spent a painful number of hours sitting in that room, going over the battles that occurred in each respective kingdom— and just when I think we're all about ready to wrap things up, we recap things all over again. And again. In the countless hours that have passed, there's no sense of time here, just endless midday sun bearing down on the palace, I've managed to throw back an alarming amount of that emerald alcohol. Well, I think that's it for now, Jenna says, rising to his feet. He looks at me with laughing eyes. I give him a quizzical look, then turn to Des, who's biting back a grin as he stands. Why do I feel like I've totally missed the joke? I push out of my chair, staggering, then nearly falling. Woo! Too much alky. Act normal. Cherub? Des asks, grasping my forearm. Hmm? At least the godforsaken meeting is finally over. It's God's forsaken here, Janice says. We have more than one god. Whoops, I said that out loud. You did, Janice says. Damn it, shut up, mouth. Now the day king's lips twitch. I'm still thinking out loud, aren't I? I say. Come on, baby siren, Dez says, escorting me out of the room. You had fun with that liquor, didn't you? Janice calls out from behind us. Why don't we meet again first thing tomorrow? Ew, no more God's forsaken meetings. Please and thank you. Calypso Lilis, your attendance is optional, 
he says. Fuck on a fairy, I'm still thinking out loud. Desmond, Janice continues, you'll both be staying in your usual rooms. I trust you can find your way to them. We can, Des says. Good. Then you two have a pleasant evening, and please feel free to use any of the royal amenities while you're here. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye, I say over my shoulder, waving to Janice. Oh, and sorry for insulting you and glamouring you. Even as I say it, my skin flickers, brightening and dimming at random. Uh-oh, just how drunk am I? Very, Des says, leading me out into the hallway. I groan. Why didn't you stop me from drinking? He huffs out a laugh. I did that once back in Malibu. Remind me again how well that went over? I let out a giggle that ends in a hiccup. I was so mad. Not enough to throw my entire liquor supply at him. I lean into Des. I smell like death. Why do I smell like death? Janice's burning bodies, remember? As the bargainer speaks, a small smile pulls at the corners of his lips. Oh, yeah. I subtly sniff myself again. Ew, I don't just smell like death. I smell like a corpse screwed a trash can and it didn't end well. Dez's lips quirk. Did I just say that out loud? He glances down at me, his expression mirthful. You did. Ugh, I whine. Why do I keep saying everything I think? I mean, my filter isn't the best on any given day, but this is just ridiculous. Callie, that dark green alcohol was Illyrium liquor. It compels you to tell the truth. Or in your case, tell the world each and every little thought that crosses your mind. Wait. What? Why didn't you say anything? I'm sorry, when did I ever give you the impression I was forthcoming with information? I lean my forehead against Des's arm and let out another groan. How long have I been speaking my mind? Just during the tail end of the meeting. I don't know what constitutes the tail end of that long-ass discussion, but the longer it dragged on, the more inappropriate my thoughts became. So Janice knows I was sweating so much I was worried I'd leave a butt imprint on his chair? Yep. And that I needed to pee really, really badly? Yep. And that I wanted to bang you? Now, Cherub, that one's just a given. I howl. Why didn't you say anything? I whine as Des leads me through the castle. We went over this already. You drank it too, I accuse him. Why aren't you spilling your guts? Because I stopped at one drink. Unlike me. It's a sign of good faith to drink Illyrium liquor during times of trouble. Des continues. It's also a sign of good faith to let your soulmate know they're making an ass out of themselves. And also... I say, before Des has a chance to address that thought of mine. Unrelated, but equally important. Why the fuck is it so miserably hot here? I gather up my hair and use it to fan the back of my neck. Next body of water I see... Forbid, I catch sight of my mate's pussy. Des! He lifts his hands. I'm facing the door. Want me to plug my ears, too? Yes? No? Maybe? Plug one of them. Now I definitely hear him laugh. Once I'm sure he's not looking and only half listening, I lift my filmy skirt and begin to sit. I let out a very unladylike screech as my ass misses the toilet and I sprawl out on the floor next to it. My skirts are around my head, my unmentionables exposed. Des turns around. I'll give him this. He doesn't laugh, though I'm sure it's taking everything in him not to. Cherub. He comes over and helps me up, then properly sets me on the toilet. He brushes my hair back. What happened? Alcohol happened. That's what. I cover my face. I'm so embarrassed. Bargainer removes my hands, kissing my knuckles. At least you didn't start peeing. I might have. Oh. Comment redacted, then. I fucking hate Illyrium liquor. By the time the bathroom incident that we'll never talk about again is behind us, the liquor has worn off somewhat. 
Dez makes a disbelieving noise at the back of his throat. All right, it's worn off just a little. So little that science doesn't yet have the tools to quantify such a minuscule measurement. Dez says, Psh! Why do you have to be so witty all the time? He begins to answer when I cover his mouth with my hands. His eyes are still laughing at me. When I'm sure he's not going to say anything else, I remove them. We round a corner and the bathhouse pool comes into view. I squeal at the sight of it and skip run over, tripping only a couple times along the way. I jump into the pool, sighing when the cool water slides against my skin. I was half worried that the water would be oppressively hot, but it carries the perfect chill. I linger underwater, my siren perfectly content to stay down here forever. It might not be the ocean, but it's water, and that's good enough. When I surface, Dez sits along the edge of the pool, a knee hiked up. I'm only letting you swim while inebriated because you're a siren, and I'm 99% sure you're incapable of drowning. Please don't prove me wrong. I swim over to him. You should come in. The water's nice. I'm even nicer. I say, grabbing his hand and tugging. You know you're unbearably adorable, Cherub. Aww. He smiles at me. I think he can still hear my thoughts. I can. When the bargainer doesn't slide into the water, I release his hand and sink back beneath the pool's surface. If he's content to just watch me swim, then that works, too. Oh, and neat trick. If I'm underwater, I can't blabber every single thing that crosses my mind. In fact, I'm pretty content to just lie here at the very bottom of the pool until the end of time. It's a better alternative than the scorching midday heat that I can't otherwise seem to escape. After a minute or so, I rise to the surface once more. How long are we supposed to be here? I ask. It's already evening, but just as night never lifts from Dez's kingdom, the sun never sets in the day kingdom. Ready to leave so soon? Does he sound pleased about that? I nod. We'll leave tomorrow morning right after I meet with Janice. So essentially we'll leave three days from now once the meeting ends. He leans in closer. Have I mentioned that I like your sassy mouth? I swim over to him, folding my arms over the edge of the pool. I lean my cheek against them. The cold water is clearing my thoughts a bit. You know a lot of secrets, I say, looking up at him. The corner of the bargainer's mouth curves up. I do. But you don't know anything about the Thief of Souls. I know some things, Des says, a pinch defensively. Not that many. He presses his lips together like he's stopping himself from arguing further. Instead, he rolls up his shirt sleeves, giving me a tantalizing glimpse of his tattoos. Seriously, how is this guy not taking a bath in his own sweat? I don't get it. How can you know so much about everything except for the mystery surrounding the Thief of Souls? I ask. Dez glances down at my folded arms. Reaching out, he trails his fingers over the exposed skin. In order to answer that question, I'd have to tell you how I know so many secrets in the first place. My brows furrow. You bargain for them. Not exactly, Des says evasively. But I thought that was how he'd built a name for himself. I built a name for myself through my deals and my brutality. Right, that too. He continues to stroke the skin of my arm. He's not going to tell me. Dez's fingers stop. He takes a deep breath. I'll tell you. I want to tell you. It's just... His eyes flick to mine. The shadows speak to me. I give him an incredulous look. The shadows can talk? And Dez can hear them? Seriously? He taps my skin. Mm-hmm. Mind is officially blown. I mean, I knew fairies could spin cloth out of moonlight and wear stars in their hair, so this is technically nothing crazier than what I've already seen for myself, but still. 
That is so fucking cool. A laugh slips out of Dez and his shoulders relax. Apparently he was nervous about telling me. Cherub, I'm never nervous. Okay, this freaking liquor is really starting to piss me off. Hate being this transparent. Tell me more, I say. What do you want to know? Everything. I just learned that shadows talk. That's so creepy slash awesome. What do they sound like? Does my shadow talk? Does yours? What do they say? Do they have personalities? I could keep going. Des moves a wet strand of hair from my eyes. They sound about how you'd imagine shadows to sound. Like whispers. Though their voices vary, just like human and fae voices do. Your shadow talks. Mine, not so much. They don't really have distinct personalities, but they do have moods. And they say all sorts of things, provided they want to talk to you. Wow, I say. I still can't get over the fact that my shadow has talked to Dez. She's told me a lot over the years. Oh, man. Not sure that's a good thing. So shadows have genders? Dez looks painfully reluctant to talk about this. It depends. Technically, they don't. They're just shadows, but some have more feminine or masculine voices. Huh. Can anyone else hear them? I ask. He shifts a little. Not that I'm aware of. The bargainer looks nervous again. I'm not nervous. Oh, wait. I get it. Duh. You know I don't think you're crazy, right? I mean, I guess normally when someone tells you they hear voices, that's your cue to start edging away. But I've been around Des and the impossible world of Fay for so long that learning this isn't some outlandish revelation. In fact, it explains a lot. Thank you, Cherub, he says quietly, taking my hand and threading his fingers between mine. What happens if the shadows don't want to talk to you? Then they don't talk. But there are ways to cajole them. Sometimes if I want to know something, I give them a little magic. Just enough for them to hop away from their owners for an hour or two. They hate being dragged around. He shakes his head. I can't believe I'm actually talking about this. He says. I can't believe I got him to divulge his big bad secret. And what happens if you want them to shut up? Same concept. A little magic for their silence. I glance around. There aren't many shadows in the Day Kingdom, but they do exist even here. Can you get them to talk right now? Dez's eyes seem to spark with interest. His focus turns to the pool. After a moment, he says, Janice's father, Ignis, apparently used to hold orgies in this pool. Ew! Dez throws back his head and laughs. Cherub, it's been well over a century since that last happened. The sound of his laughter warms me from the inside out. I tug on his hand again. Come on, let's make these shadows whisper about something else. He stares at me for a beat. Right when I'm expecting him to shoot me down, his shoes slide off his feet, followed by his socks. He pivots where he sits his legs swinging around so that he can dip his feet in the water. I step up, in between those legs, and nip his chin, my hands sliding over his thighs. More, more, more. Daz tilts his head downward. Do you want to know a secret? Hmm? He takes my lips in a kiss. Sometimes I hold out on you simply because I enjoy driving you mad with need. It makes me feel less out of control in love with you. That's not nice. He laughs low. Whoever said I was nice. With that, he slips into the water, plunging beneath the surface. When he rises again, his shirt is slicked to the skin, each fold of it lovingly molded to his chest. There are no words. He took my breath away the first time I saw him, and it's no different now and he still has that devilish look to him, his features a little too sharp. He screams bad news, which, of course, is like a rallying cry to my lady parts. His silver eyes dance, still hearing every damn thought that crosses my mind. 
What are the shadows saying now? I whisper. Jazz closes in on me. They've gone quiet. Even mine? He stops in front of me, an arm sliding around my waist. Even yours. The Thief of Souls? I ask, as a thought comes to me. What do the shadows say about him? Callie, the Killer of Moments, really is an apt title right about now. The bargainer's good mood withers away. The shadows won't speak of him. Not at all? Des frowns. Not a single thing. Whoever the thief is, he has their allegiance. Or their fear. Chapter 17 I wake on the ground, my eyes fluttering open. Ah, you're awake. I thought you'd lay there all night. My claws lengthen reflexively at the sound of the thief's voice, my nails scraping against the stone beneath me. I went to bed in the Day Kingdom, and I woke... here. Wherever here is. I sit up slowly and gaze around. The room is done in pale stone. Blood-red vines snake up the walls, strange flowers blooming from them. Across from me is a pool of some sort, the water luminous, and to the left of it the thief reclines against a pillar. A shudder courses through me. My, what a reaction! His onyx eyes seem to glitter in this strange place. I take it you missed me? Where am I? I ask, rising to my feet. I can't tell whether I'm inside or outside. Behind me, the walls seem to give way to open air and the night sky shines down. But within the walls of this place, wall sconces burn, the sound of it muffled, like cloth snapping in the wind. And amongst it all, the thief of souls, his lips soft, his eyes cold, his attention fixed to me. This is a dream. Just a dream. But if it's a dream, and I know it's a dream, then... Wake up. Wake up. Nothing happens. Tell me, does the term small death mean anything to you? The thief asks from where he leans against that pillar. It's just a dream. It's not real. No, I say distractedly. It's only after I answer that I process his words. Small death. That does sound familiar. The thief of souls smiles. Come closer and I'll tell you. How did I get here? I pinch the fabric of the white shift I wear. It's all but translucent. Not what I went to sleep in. The thief pushes off the pillar. I called, and you came. My brows knit. His hair and eyes are so dark they seem to absorb the light. It's a sharp contrast to his pale skin. He crosses the room, his steps echoing. He's not real. This is not real. That's the only thing that keeps me from running. I don't need to be frightened of a phantasm. He can't hurt me. Not here. The thief steps up to me. You didn't run. You're not real, I say. A slow, creepy smile spreads across his face. Is that what you think? That I'm not real? He searches my face. Whatever he sees there makes him laugh. You don't believe any of this is real, do you? The hairs on my forearms rise. Just a dream. A really screwed-up dream. If none of this is real, then I guess you and I are free to do whatever we please. He reaches out and runs a finger down the slope of my nose. I could touch you. You could touch me. The Night King would never have to know. There are no repercussions for reveries, after all. I sidestep him. If I touched you, I say, my claws still out, I doubt you would enjoy it. The thief once again steps into my space, forcing me to back up. That's where you're wrong, Enchantress. I have peculiar tastes. His eyes flick down to my throat and chest. 
I've never been with a human, or a siren, or a mortal-made fae, but I have been with women who fight back. That I have a healthy appetite for. Healthy is the last word I'd use to describe the thief's fetishes. I go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. That wasn't the case when you were Karnon, I say softly. The way I remember it, you wouldn't touch a woman unless she was incapacitated. The Thief of Souls stares at me. There's something foreign and merciless in the dark depths of his eyes. You have me entirely figured out, don't you? He says. The Thief. Too frightened to fuck a woman unless she's prone. Before I get the chance to back away, he grabs me by the throat. Perhaps I could disprove that notion? This is just a reverie, after all. Just a twisted dream where a wicked man takes you against your will. My skin brightens. You might even enjoy it. His eyes dip to my skin. I know I will. My heart quakes at his rising interest, even as another insidious part of me is coming alive. He pulls me in close. The thief is going to kiss me, just as he did when he was Karnon. And perhaps he'll breathe that same vile magic into me now as he did then. Only this time I won't be immune to it. A human would struggle against this. A siren, however? Let him come closer. Let him think he has us. My eyes drop to his lips. I know you can wear the faces of the dead. He leans in, his lips skimming my jaw. And to think I believed you'd never figure out any of it. He releases my throat and I stagger back, massaging my raw skin. Do you want to know something? He asks. I gaze back at him with barely masked repulsion. Mara met me more than once, the first time I was courting her sister. Just like Janice, Mara once had a sibling. I'd almost forgotten. I rack my brain trying to remember her name. Talia. That's what it was. She was the Flora Kingdom's heir apparent, only she died before her time, falling on a sword or something like that. After... after... My eyes snapped to the thief. The traveling minstrel. That was you. A man had come to her kingdom and Talia had fallen hopelessly in love with him. The way I heard it, the whole thing had ended poorly. God, but how long ago was that? Centuries? All this time, the thief has been moving his pieces into place. His eyes seemed to smile. I was an enchanter. I just happened to have a penchant for serenading young royals. You want to know something those histories never mentioned? He pauses, and the silence of this strange place seems to close in on me. I never knew that something as insubstantial as silence could have such weight. I fucked Mara then, too. To this day, she has no idea that I've been inside her as two separate men. Nausea stirs low in my belly. Just a dream. She was always the envious one, but especially then when her sister had everything and she had nothing. The first time we exchanged anything more than pleasantries was after it was known that Talia and I were together— she pulled me away at one of those frivolous parties, dropped to her knees, and, well, what she lacked in power or rank she made up for with enthusiasm. I didn't even have to enchant her. Truth be told, at the time I didn't want much to do with her, but I just couldn't resist the temptation. I grimace. I remember how the story ends, I say. You were killed, I say. Do the dead ever really die? He asks. The same damn question he posed to me back in the Flora Kingdom. I can feel the answer right there on the tip of my tongue. I glance from the thief to the strange blooming vines, to the column he rested against just minutes ago, to the pool next to it. My ears begin to ring as I stare at that water. The longer I look, the more it seems as though it's shifting, whispering. Save us. Save us. Unwittingly, I take a step closer to it, my shoulder brushing against the thief's. I wouldn't do that. What is in that water? I can't.
can't seem to look away. What does it matter? None of this is real. The next morning, I do, in fact, skip the meeting, choosing instead to nurse my hangover. Praise Jesus for fey medicine? That stuff totally works. By the time Des and Janice leave their meeting, I'm feeling loads better. The day king nods when he sees me, his golden hair shimmering. Calypso, he says formally. Janice, may I have a word with you? There's something I need to say to the Day King in light of all I know. He gives me a peculiar look. Of course, he says. Behind him, Des slides his hands into his pockets and meanders over to a nearby guard, striking up a conversation. I pull the Day King off to the side. I owe you an apology, I say to Janice. Janice looks me over, his eyes a little wary. He's afraid of us. My siren whispers, as he should be. Actually, I amend, I owe you several. I take a breath. I'm sorry for acting like a fool yesterday. You and Desmond were just trying to do what was best for your kingdoms. I'm sure my thoughts on literally everything that crossed my mind were exasperating to hear. I'm sorry for glamouring you. I don't know how much Des has told you about sirens— Probably nothing, since Dez's least favorite hobby is sharing. But sirens enjoy violence and sex. I can't glamour someone without that aspect of my nature surfacing to some degree. I'm not nice when I use my power. I'm sorry you had to experience it yourself. And now for the grand finale of apologies. Lastly, I'm sorry I blamed you for kidnapping me. I was... mistaken. I didn't understand that at the time, but I do now. Janice gives me what might be his first genuine smile. It's unfair for anyone to be as pretty as he is, with his golden hair and bright blue eyes. He's the sun come to life, blinding in his beauty. I appreciate the apologies, Calypso. Despite what you may think, your commentary yesterday lightened a very solemn talk, and I am thankful for that. As for the glamour, if I remember correctly, I was the one who insisted you show me your abilities. I will admit, enchanters give me pause. Power like that is dangerous in the wrong hands. I do, however, have reason to believe that you are the right sort of person to wield such magic, regardless of your base nature. As for the kidnapping, I cannot imagine enduring such a trial. Of course you are entitled to being confused and mistrustful— I don't know who or what you saw, but I do believe you. He places a hand on my shoulder, his eyes intense. The room darkens a touch, but Janice pretends not to notice. Your mate and I already have a strong alliance between our kingdoms, he says, his blue eyes burning bright. But we've never had a friendship to strengthen that unity. Perhaps starting today, that can change. His fingers press into my shoulder. I personally vow that should the need ever arise, I will lend you my sword and my assistance. It's not until Daz and I are back in the Kingdom of Night that I'm truly able to breathe again. The moment we step off the ley line and the cool evening greets us, I feel myself relax. God, I miss this place. Getting sentimental, are we? Daz says, tying his hair back into an itsy-bitsy bun. I try not to stare at the action, but his black sleeves bunch around his biceps, and the whole thing looks really, really good. I lift a shoulder. This place is growing on me, I say in all honesty. It didn't begin that way. Originally, I wanted nothing to do with the other world. But then I got kidnapped and grew wings, and going back to Earth just wasn't an option. And now... Well, let's just say the other world has its perks. The bargainer's eyes shine in that way they do when I say something that moves him. You know, you're really cute when you go soft on me, I say. I don't know what you're talking about, he says, taking my hand and dragging me over to him. His eyes drop to my lips. But you know what we should talk about? The fact that you got a king to swear his fealty to you. I guffaw. 
I apologized to him, that's all. And in return, he pledged you his loyalty. Des stops speaking when he catches sight of a guard hustling over. He watches the man, face impassive. Your Majesty, the soldier says when he gets to us, nodding first to Des, then to me. The sleeping soldiers, they've been talking nonstop since this morning. Des's features harden. About what? The guard's eyes slide to me. Your mate. When Des and I enter the royal dungeon, the noise is nearly deafening. Dozens and dozens of voices are talking at once. I want to speak with Calypso Lillis. I want to speak with Calypso Lillis. Speak with Calypso Lillis. I want to speak Calypso Lillis. The door slams shut behind us, and like a spell being broken, the voice is quiet. In the silence that follows, my skin pricks. I begin to walk, Des at my heels. You could hear a pin drop in this place, it's so quiet. As soon as we reach the first cells, I catch sight of the sleeping soldiers. They all stand at attention, their bodies rigid. Only their eyes move, following me as I pass by. That malignant magic tinges the air. I can smell the evil that settled into these soldiers. It's still taking up residence in them like a parasite. Who wanted to speak with me? I call out. From several cells down, a low voice says, You know who. A chill slides down my spine. There's only one person who's poisoned this lot. The already dark dungeon block darkens further with the bargainer's displeasure. This guy's got some brass balls, he mutters under his breath. I step up to the cell the voice came from. Inside there are a dozen soldiers, all of them male. Their bodies are still covered in the gore they woke in, while well, that and whatever blood spattered onto them during the battle. One of the sleeping soldiers steps forward. His skin is tawny, his eyes are hazel, and his plaited hair is dark brown. He smiles at me. Hello, Enchantress. Chapter 18 my siren claws at me, sensing how spooked I am. I step up to the bars, careful not to touch the iron. What do you want? The man begins to pace the length of the cell, his gaze never leaving mine. He doesn't answer, just continues to pace back and forth, back and forth. I let out a breath. Come on, Des, let's go. The thief is obviously too pussy to— the entire dungeon begins speaking as one. Is life but to wake, and death but to sleep? I'd tell you, but then, this secret I'll keep. I'm not real now, nor was I last night. Or perhaps I'm wrong. Who's to say what's right? My blood runs cold. In front of me, the soldier who first spoke to me now smiles. He tilts his head. Are you having fun yet? This is our little game. You will lose soon enough. Then you'll be mine to tame. My conversation with the thief might have been a dream, but apparently it was real enough. That's what this is. A reminder that a dream is never just a dream. My skin begins to glow very softly. It's so at odds with my heart, which is racing, racing. I work my jaw. No one scares us. I step up to the cell and grab the iron bars, ignoring the pain as my skin begins to sizzle. I've got a rhyme for you, fucker, I say, my voice filling with glamour. Stop hiding behind your puppets, you stupid piece of trash. Oh, and take your lame riddles and shove them up your a- Callie, Des says, prying my hands off the bars. The room's nearly pitch black. That's the first I sense of the bargainer's dark mood. Aren't I a poet? I taunt the soldier as Des drags me away. My hands are smoking, but I can barely feel them over my rising fury. Des pulls me away, and that's about when I realize that my wings have come out, the tips of them now dragging along the cool floor as the bargainer carts me back the way we came. Not a poet, says one of the soldiers we pass by. A marked woman. 
He's barely gotten the words out when suddenly the darkness closes in on him. In the next moment, Dez vanishes from my side. I hear the sound of steel slicing flesh and a choked cry. Then nothing more. By the time the shadows dissipate, Dez is back at my side, his hand on my back. I stare at the spot where the fairy stood a moment before. Now he lays in a puddle of his own blood, his eyes glassy. Oh, shit. The bargainer lifts his chin, his own wings arching over his shoulders. Not in my house, thief. Not in my house. Tez wraps linen bandages around my hands, his own trembling as he does so. At his back, his wings are still out, and the room we sit in is mostly cast in shadow. His face is placid, but every so often his upper lip ticks. Down our bond, I can feel his immense rage. This is about the time where the bargainer begins breaking bones and making his victims beg for mercy. Only the thief is hiding somewhere not even Dez, Lord of Secrets, knows. My own rage, by contrast, fled some time ago. I stare at my blistered fingertips. Can't I just heal these with my magic? Expedited healing was supposed to be one of the perks of fey power— Dez finishes wrapping one of my hands and sets it in my lap. Iron doesn't. He takes a deep breath, then starts again. Iron wounds take extra magic to heal. But you could. Will you show me how? I ask. The bargainer cups my injured hand between his. I can still feel him trembling with his anger. Close your eyes, he says. Is this... Are you showing me how to close your eyes? Reluctantly, mine flutter closed. Now breathe in and out, in and out. My breath whooshes into my lungs, my chest expanding as I hold it in. Then I exhale and the air rushes out of me. Yes, just like that, Des says. I sense him taking his own advice, his hands steadying as they hold mine. Now, he says, quiet your thoughts and focus them inward. I'm as introspective as the next person, but I've never done this, never searched for the source of my magic. It's always just been there, and I've spent close to a decade trying to leash it, not to go hunting it down. Where is your power? It takes looking for my magic to truly notice where it lays within me. It's in the pit of my stomach. My core, really. It simmers there, right at my very center. This is where the siren slumbers when she's not busy terrorizing the world. And it's in my heart, right where my connection to Dez is anchored. Focus on that magic, Dez says, and now pull on it. Pretend it's a ball of yarn and you're tugging a thread of it loose. This is so weird. Okay, I say. Now pull that thread up through your chest. Imagine it traveling past your ribcage and across your shoulders. Direct it down your arms and into your hands. I do as he says, visualizing this power of mine as though it were a physical thing. I imagine it moving through me. When it gets to my hands, they heat like I'm holding them close to the fire— my eyes flutter open, even as I continue directing my magic to my palms. Des releases my hand and, unwinding the bandages, shows it to me. I stare at my fingertips. Before my eyes, the angry swelling diminishes. Holy crap! It's working! I'm healing myself! As the pulsing pain of my wounds lessens, my energy drains away. My siren is still there, but trying to rouse her into action would be difficult. I release my magic, letting it retreat back to my core. The worst of my injuries have healed, but my palm is still red and angry. My gaze moves from my hand to the bargainer. His wings are now hidden, and the shadows that cloaked the room have lifted. I glance around, surprised to see that we're sitting on a veranda of sorts— a room that's not quite inside and not quite out. A row of enormous archways look out over the city of Somnia. 
Daz takes my hand once more. You did good there, Cherub, he says, beginning to rebandage it. How do you feel? Tired. The bargainer nods, wrapping the linen before tying it off. He brings my fingers to his lips, kissing the tip of each one. Then we best get you to bed. If the look in his eye is anything to go by, I'm not going to be doing much sleeping. Before I have a chance to drag him out of there so that he can properly tuck me in, chittering sounds come from beyond the archways. The pleasant night air blows in through them, and riding on the draft of wind are several pixies, all of them chattering away. They zip across the veranda on the gust of air, only stopping when they get to me and Dez. One of them hovers right in front of Dez. The others end up sitting on his shoulders, and mine like they have front row seats to a show. Evening, Aura, he says to the little fay. She says something back to him, her voice high and sweet. Is that right? Dez says, his eyes narrowing. Where is he? Aura chatters away, gesturing wildly. The bargainer looks at me. Temper and Malachi have found out where Galagar is hiding. Chapter 19 I lean forward even as the pixies on my shoulders begin playing in my hair. Seriously, what is with these creatures and my hair? Where is he? The Night King's face is menacing. Memnos. He says the word like it tastes bad coming out. Memnos. The one island Des never took me to. The land of nightmares. Wait, I say, glancing at the pixie. How does Aura... She curtsies at the mention of her name, and I nod to her. How does Aura know this? The little pixies all begin chattering at once. Pixies are my royal messengers, Des says. One of the pixies playing in my hair stops and says something else, her little voice demanding. The bargainer raises his eyebrows. Forgive me, pixies are royal messengers and spies. I raise my eyebrows. That sounds like an important job. My words must have been the right ones because the pixies start to excitedly chitter. One of them flits in front of my face and studies my features before lovingly patting my cheek. Another one starts speaking animatedly to Dez. I'm not going to go to Memnos or Barbos right now. You can tell Malachi he'll just have to wait. Angry chittering. My mate is tired. Another pixie comes over and begins to inspect my eyes, as though looking for signs of my sleepiness. The other pixie, meanwhile, is still arguing with Dez. Eventually, she simply grabs Dez's pointer finger and tugs, trying to rally him into action. It's an adorably pitiful sight. I'm pretty sure my mate shares the sentiment because the corner of his mouth lifts. Where does she want us to go? To Memnos, to slaughter the hateful tyrant Galagor Nix. But short of that, Malachi has requested our presence in Barbos. I really am tired both from healing my wounds and from the long days we've endured, and I've been dreaming of Dez's bed for ages and ages. But there are two psychotic fae on the loose, and the sooner we deal with them, the sooner Dez and I can get on with our lives. I stand, causing the pixies hanging on to me to squeal. Then let's go. Dez stares up at me, unconcerned that a pixie is still pulling at his finger. Cherub. You need to rest. I'll rest eventually. The bargainer's eyes narrow. He stands, his chair scraping back. He steps in close, his large frame filling my vision. You don't want to go to Barbos, he says. You want a break from this madness, and I want to give that to you. His eyes have gone soft. They search my face like my unspoken thoughts are written there. Says, if we wait, your father might slip away. I am tired, but I'll rest soon enough. I take Dez's hand and my bandaged ones. If we catch your father, he might be able to tell us where the Thief of Souls is. A muscle in the Night King's jaw ticks. So tempting, 
his features seem to say. He glances away from me. I give his hand a squeeze. Let's end this. His hand has started to tremble again. All that pent-up rage is fighting for release, and Dez is a dark enough creature that he can't deny it forever. Better to use it on his father. Finally, he closes his eyes and nods. We'll go to Barbos, and we'll deal with Galagar Nix. Dez and I soar through the clouds, the stars twinkling down on us. God, have I missed this. There's no other sensation quite like flying. The pixies spin around us, laughing as they ride on the wind. Dez and I are a touch more somber, the two of us outfitted for battle. These are, after all, violent times. I ignore the exhaustion creeping through my bones. I'm pretty sure that, like a noob, I spent too much energy trying to heal my burns, and now I'm paying the piper for it. Can't believe how much energy that took. I've never actually experienced a deficit of magic. Ever. Yet healing two small burns has nearly tapped me of it. No wonder iron is so hated and feared among the fae. It's painful and magically draining. My heart bleeds all over again for those soldiers Karnon kept prisoner. They were shackled in the stuff. Seriously, though? Fuck the thief and all his sick deeds. I can almost hear his laughter in my head. This is our little game. Only he would think of all these depravities as some sort of game. The longer I think on it, the more my mind twists and turns, leading me back to that last strange dream. Does the term small death mean anything to you? He asked me. It was the one question that seemed to be more than just posturing and scare tactics. And of course, now that I'm level-headed, the term does mean something to me. I've heard it all over the place. Somnia is the land of sleep and small death. Des used to be a member of the Angels of Small Death, and in another dream back in the Flora Kingdom, Galagar Nix had mentioned small death. Now that I look for it, it's everywhere. I move in close to Des. What's small death? I ask, shouting to be heard over the gusty air. I've never actually stopped to ask what the term means. Sleep. Dez says, his voice amplified by his magic. I think he's misheard me, but then he adds, Faye consider the loss of consciousness, fainting, sleep, and so on, to be a brief taste of death. The individual is caught between worlds, and so we call this small death. Huh. I guess that's kind of cool. Unhelpful, but cool. Why do you ask? I glance over at Dez. His eyes are too keen. Though he knows I've had nightmares about the thief, I haven't told him the specifics about my most recent dreams. I open my mouth to explain when a dark object manifests ahead of us. I catch a blur of white hair, hear the shrill cries of the pixies as they scatter, and then, next thing I know, the fae has me by the throat. I grab the fairy's wrist, trying to pry their hand from my neck when I catch sight of the beautiful fae. Those eyes, just like his son's. Galagar Nix grimaces at me, squeezing tighter, his upper lip curling in disgust. I could snap your neck right now and be done with it, slave. I drop a bandaged hand from his wrist, groping along my waist for one of my daggers. To think you've been walking the halls of my palace. My hand wraps around the hilt of my blade. Gotcha. Eating from my table. I unsheath it. Sleeping in, I slam the dagger into his side, the blade sinking to its hilt. Galagar howls, his hold loosening long enough for me to suck in a grateful breath. I yank my weapon from his side. Bitch! He cocks his fist just as an ominous form appears over his shoulders. The bargainer leans in close to his father's ear, his hands gripping Galagar's wings. I was hoping to run into you. With that, he snaps his father's wings, the bones making a sickening crack as they break. Now Galagar begins to scream in earnest. He releases my throat as Dez pulls back his fist and slams it into his father's head again and again and again. I can feel my mate unleashing his wrath as the two men begin to plummet from the sky. Galagar disappears, 
winking into existence in front of me again. The bargainer follows suit, his wings flared menacingly at his back. But just as soon as Des closes in on him, Galagar vanishes once more. It's that night in Mara's oak forest all over again, Des and his father bleeding away into the darkness only to reform in another location. The tyrant king is having trouble, though, his mangled wings bent grotesquely behind him. Galagar's form disappears yet again, only this time I don't see him reform. I feel him. His hands brace either side of my head. He's going to snap my neck. I can sense his intent in his very grip, even as gravity begins to drag the two of us towards Earth. Frantically, I call on my siren. If I ever needed my glamour, it would be now. She rises slowly, like she's moving through molasses. My skin begins to glow, only to dim. My siren retreats, my magic too exhausted to summon her. I jerk in Gallagher's grip, trying to use my wings to shake him. But then Des is there, and then Gallagher isn't. And the whole thing happens so terribly fast that I get whiplash. I tumble through the sky, trying to right myself. The universe and all the stars in it spin around me as I fall through the sky. And then there again is Galagar, hand at my throat. I slash at him with the dagger in my hand, the blade catching him in the arm. Before he can retaliate, the bargainer manifests between the two of us, his position forcing his father to release my neck. In his own hand, Des grips the sword he carries. With one swift thrust, Des shoves his weapon into his father's gut. Galagar's eyes go wide as his son jerks it back out of his abdomen. That's the last I see of the tyrant king as I continue to fall, a cloud swallowing me up. I desperately try to spread my wings, fighting against wind and gravity. Before I can right myself, Des manifests next to me, scooping my body up in midair. We need to get back to Somnia now. The flight back is nothing like the previous one. Des won't release me, despite the fact that I'm fine, even if my throat is a little sore. He flies at a punishing pace, the wind howling in our ears as we speed across the sky. Where's Galagar? I ask, hidden back in whatever shithole he crawled out of. I was wrong about Des needing to release his rage. I don't think pummeling his father helped at all. If anything, he seems more tightly wound. So he's still alive. The King of the Night's nod is barely perceptible. Damn. Galagar must be hurting. Two broken wings and a couple of gut wounds. Not to mention the punches to the head he sustained. The bargainer flies us directly to his chambers, landing silently on his balcony. He sets me on my feet, his wings flaring wide around me, as if to shield me from the world. Des steps into my space, his face impassive. But more than ever, I can sense his tumultuous emotions, from the agitated arc of his wings to his rigid line of his shoulders. His eyes drop to my lips, and that's the only warning I get. Reeling me in, he takes my mouth savagely. His lips are fire, burning against mine. Take, claim, keep. Maybe he murmurs this, maybe I sense it from our connection, but those three words seem to be the driving force behind his manic energy. I can feel his wrath and his panic, his frustration and fear all tied up into the slide of his mouth against mine. I return it with equal intensity. I might be capable of living for centuries, but I can still die like a human can. I felt it there for a moment, when Galagar was squeezing the life out of me, and again when I was falling. Just because Fay call themselves immortal doesn't mean they are. I part Des's lips with my own, tasting his essence as my fingers delve into his soft hair. Behind me I hear his balcony doors snick open. He lifts me again, wrapping my legs around his waist. I need to be inside you, he says hoarsely. I nod against him, my mouth going to his again. Nothing like a brush with death to make you feel amorous. I need to feel alive, and I think Des does, too. The bargainer steps inside, the doors clicking shut behind him. Not a moment later, my clothes melt off of me, magically removing themselves. Des's clothes follow suit as he moves us to the bed. 
He's barely laid me on the bed and parted my thighs when he pulls me to him, thrusting deep inside me. I gasp as his thick cock stretches me, the sensation a pinch of pain, then pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. I revel in the feel of his muscular body pressing down on mine. God's above, cherub. Jess kisses the juncture between my neck and shoulder as he slides out. He pistons in again. I lean my head back and moan as he fills me, stretches me. He's need, need, need. I can practically hear him. Take, claim, keep. The phrase echoes like a memory through my head. This, this won't be gentle. He warns, his entire body trembling as he dams up his wicked need. I grasp his hair, my grip tightening as I tilt his head towards mine. Your warnings are wasted on me. My fingers flex against him. You're not fucking some delicate flower. You're fucking me. A siren. The king of the night, who rules over sleep and sex, unleashes. He slams into me again and again, gathering me up in his arms, his gaze drinking me in the oddest combo of male aggression and devoted adoration. His pace is punishing, and his strokes are deep, and I can't keep eye contact because, Jesus, my body is pure sensation, and I need to stop looking at him or I'm going to get an award for the world's fastest climax. Des moves one of my legs over his shoulder, deepening his angle. I grip the blankets I lay on uselessly, my breasts bobbing from the force of each thrust. He touches my dim skin. This is a first. We're knee-deep in each other, and my siren hasn't stirred. My magic's still replenishing. It's a strange sensation not having the siren share this experience with me. I feel naked in a whole new way. The bargainer takes one of my bandaged hands, threading his fingers through mine. His lips skim over my forehead, then my nose, then my lips, chin, throat. There they pause. He pauses, his entire body drawn tight. He kisses a trail across my neck, right where I'm sure bruises in the shape of his father's hand have appeared. My beautiful nightmare. Des whispers against my skin. My beautiful, beautiful nightmare. With that, the bargainer thrusts into me again. I hiss out a breath as his pace picks up, his sweat-slicked chest gliding over mine again and again. I'm being lit up from the inside out. It feels like there's no place he hasn't touched. We're wrapped up in each other, our bodies entwined, our hearts magically bound up. Des grips my hand tightly as though he's afraid to let me go. Look at me, Callie, he commands. Going to come if I do that. He dips in close to kiss my cheek, all the while rocking in and out of me. Last I heard, that's kind of the point. Now look at me. I turn my gaze to his. Never has he looked so breathtaking. Never has he looked so fey, like the moon come to life. His silver eyes glitter, his white hair dangling loose between us. And it's that, not each aggressive stroke, that sets me off. I'm right there on the edge in an instant, and then I break. Dez sees the moment I climax, flashing me a wolfish smile. My gaze begins to drift as my orgasm lashes through me. I'm shattering to bits. Don't look away. Dez orders. I drag my gaze back to him. How to tell him it's all too much. Dez leans in, stealing a kiss from my lips as his strokes become more frantic. I catch his groan on my tongue as he gives in to his own need, his hips pumping furiously as he comes. Take, claim, keep. I hear the phantom words one final time, and then it's over. It was an ambush. Death strokes my sweaty skin, holding me close. I'm sore in all the right places, and in a couple wrong ones, too. My throat, for instance, is starting to hurt like a bitch. Somehow Gallagher knew where we were, and he intercepted us before we had a chance to locate him. Around us, the myriad of lamps burn away, casting the Night King's chambers in low, flickering light. 
A pleasant breeze drifts through the paneless windows. As far as night goes, this one's absolutely perfect. Recent fight notwithstanding. Des brushes a strand of my hair away from my face. My father was going after you because we're mated. I prop myself up, my gaze going to Des's sinful mouth. My thoughts drift for a moment to all the things I want those lips to do to me. Things besides talking. Already the attack seems like a dream. It happened so fast, and then it was over. And now... Well, here I am, wrapped up in silk sheets and a muscly fairy. The bargainer's eyes drop to my neck. He reaches for it with his tatted arm, his fingers trailing over the bruises that are surely there. It's not over for him. His hand moves from my neck, sliding over the curve of my hip. For most mated pairs, the death of one fairy means the death of both— in some cases, like Mara's, a fairy can outlive the other, but that's surprisingly rare. Most of the time, if you kill one, you kill both. The bargainer's eyes rise to mine. Caligar attacked you because he rightfully believes ending you will end me. My heart begins to pound a little faster. Rightfully? Des's fingers squeeze my hip, his eyes looking feverish for a moment. No part of me has any intention of outliving you. That's a bucket of ice water to the face. I don't want to talk about this. About my death or his. We're very much alive at the moment, and I don't really want to dwell on the alternative. He's going to come after you again. The bargainer continues. The idiot actually believes you're an easier target. The thought brings a shadow of a smile to Dez's lips for a moment. Galagar is going to come after you again. Suddenly every dark corner of the room seems like it hides monsters. What's to stop Des's father from intruding on us right here, right now? The Night King must know where my thoughts are because he says, You're protected within the royal grounds. There are enchantments to keep out fairies like him. Des says, That's likely why he ambushed us en route to Barbos because there weren't enchantments along our flight path. So I'm stuck here. My stomach sours at the thought. Tez wraps his arm around my back, pulling me in close. You're not stuck anywhere, Cherub, he says, deadly serious. Tell me where you want to go, and I'll take you there right now. My brows furrow. You're not going to try to keep me here? I don't touch on the fact that right now I don't really want to move an inch from this bed, content to spend the rest of my long life wrapped up in the King of the Night's arms. I will never keep you captive. Des vows. Better you happy and free than caged and safe. Besides, he leans his forehead against mine. Galagar clearly hasn't heard the stories about you if he thinks to target you. There are stories about me? That's news. Dez's eyes crinkle, his lips pressing together. Many. What fay can resist a story about the beautiful human who beguiles fairies and escapes the thief? They can't get enough of you. Unfortunately, my father and the thief seem to share that sentiment. I lift a bandaged hand and stare at Dez's work. I should have listened to you, I say thoughtfully. I drop my hand. Back when you told me to rest. I happen to have great ideas. He agrees, his mouth curving fiendishly, his expression sobers. But you made the decision a queen would, putting the kingdom's needs before your own. Stop using that word. Queen. It's going to happen one day or other, Queen Calypso. Okay, I'll admit that has a nice ring to it. What do you have against queens, anyway? Des asks. I sigh. I just want to be a normal girl with a normal job who lives a normal life. I don't want to have to worry about an entire kingdom. The bargainer rolls us so that he can stare down at me. Callie, you've never been a normal girl, and you've never lived a normal life, so I can see the appeal of wanting that. But normal is overrated. Trust me, it's overrated. 
I've made deals with thousands of miserable, normal people. I frown up at him. And I'm sorry, he continues. But if you think I'm going to let you settle for normal, you've got a fight on your hands. Damn it. Now that he's drawn lines, I'll never get him to budge. If there's one thing Daz is good at, it's fighting. Oh, and deals. And secrets. And sex. Screw it all, he's good at everything. It's annoying. This is just like high school, I say, remembering those days he roused or manipulated or bargained me into action. Mean, but effective. You trying to get me to do something you believe is in my best interest. Tell me I'm wrong, Cherub. Tell me I'm pushy and bossy and that I don't know a thing about your deepest dreams. See, that's the rub of it all. Now that I know he can hear shadows, he probably has heard all sorts of things about my dreams that I won't willingly admit. Things that prove him right. You're pushy and you're bossy, I say. He leans in and places a kiss along my sternum. And I don't know a thing about your dreams. Say it. I feel the breath of his magic wrapping around my windpipe. Only this time it's trying to pry the truth out of me, and the truth is that the bargainer knows a great deal about my deepest desires. He moves down my body, placing a kiss between my breasts. I'm still waiting, love. Des keeps moving down my body, pressing kisses against my skin. But I stay silent, and eventually his magic dissolves away. The bargainer pauses, glancing up at me. I love you, Callie, down to every last feather and scale. I love your darkness, I love your mind, I love your humor and your most coveted dreams. And I love how you love me, wholly, deeply, passionately. You're not normal. You'll never be normal. I'm so sorry to tell you that. You are so blindingly extraordinary that it physically hurts me sometimes, and I'll never stop pushing you to believe this. Taz can't just say things like that. My weak heart isn't fit enough to take it. I close my eyes and draw in a shaky breath. Give it back. What is it I've taken, Cherub? My peace of mind, my loneliness, my torment, my pain, my sanity, my dull little life. So many things that once made me, me, are now missing, and... Daz, I don't know who I am. You don't know who you are? The bargainer's voice drops low. You're Calypso Lillis, plain and simple. You were her yesterday, you'll be her tomorrow. It's up to you to decide what being you actually means. No one else can do that for you. Not the man who gave you those wings. Not the man who's hunting you. Not your stepfather, not even me. Cherub. Make it count. Chapter 20 It's late the next morning by the time I tumble out of Dez's bed. The fairy is reluctant to let me go, and I'm not complaining. A girl could get used to this kind of attention. I stretch as I pad over to the closet, feeling the bargainer's eyes on me the entire time. Creep, I say, not looking back. I'd have to be dead to not enjoy your backside. I suppress a smile then begin rifling through the pretty dresses someone stocked an armoire full of. I'm not a girly girl by any means, but fey outfits are one exception I'll make. I grab a dress that looks like the dawn come to life, purples bleeding into pinks and oranges bleeding into yellows. I've no more than slipped it on when the dress slips itself off. Swiveling to Des, I raise an eyebrow. Unless you want to break my vagina, I suggest you give it a rest. Relentless is a great way to describe the king of the night's sexual appetite. Not that I'm a slacker myself, but even I have my limits, especially when my siren decides to take the night off. Des appears in front of me, turning my healed hands palms up. Are you going to read my fortune? I tease. He pretends to peer at them. You find your soulmate young. There's love, and it looks like you have a handful of kids. They take after their father, unfortunately. Brats, the entire lot of them. 
I laugh and pull my hands away. Oh, and you live a long and happy life. I don't say anything to that. There's so much uncertainty these days. I pick the dress back up. You're not wearing that today. Why not? The moment I ask it, my breath catches. I half expect battle leathers to come raining down from the sky and for Des to announce that once again the two of us are training. Really freaking hate training. I could tell you. For a price. I groan. Des. A pile of clothes does come raining down, but they're not battle leathers. Or you could simply put the clothes on and deduce my plans like the good P.I. you are. I pick up the folded clothing, recognizing a faded T-shirt that I own. There's a bra, panties, and jeans. A moment later, socks and white converses join the pile. All mine, all unfit to wear in the other world. My gaze moves to Des. What do you have planned for us? Wrong question, Cherub. It's not what I have planned, but where. Oh, my God. My grip tightens on the clothing. Where, Des? Des gives me a wry smile. You know the answer to that question. I suck in a breath. Home. Earth. Traveling on ley lines is no longer the confusing experience it used to be. Before, I couldn't make sense of these magical highways. My magic wasn't compatible with it. But now my power recognizes these strange roads that cross worlds. The magic is thick, pulling at me from all sides. It tries to drive me in its own direction, but Des holds my hands and directs me forward, cutting through the ley line's bizarre compulsion as he leads us on. Around me I see landscapes fly by, hills, forests, deserts, oceans, ruins, all of it foreign and fey, until suddenly it isn't anymore. Gradually it changes to recognizable cities and landmarks. I see Nepal, then Cairo, Berlin, then, finally, Los Angeles. With a powerful tug, the bargainer leads us off the ley line. For a moment I feel the magic resist, eager to keep us locked away on this odd highway, cursed to forever wander. But the moment passes, the magic gives, and suddenly we're in Dez's house, in the round room that contains the ley line portal. I take a shaky step forward, my foot sinking into the soft grass. I touch the wall of the circular room, my fingers brushing against the vines of wisteria growing up it, the plants swaying against a phantom breeze. The bargainer leads me out of the portal room, and it's only then, only once I see the wood floors, the mounted pictures of faraway places— the mundane lines and details and colors of his Catalina home, that I truly process it. Earth. I'm really back on Earth. Dear God, never have I wanted to kiss the ground so badly. If I could bear hug it, I totally would. God's damn, I miss this place. Des says, glancing around himself. Next to me, my soulmate looks like a memory come to life. He swaggers into his hallway wearing his leather pants, his shit-kicking boots, and a faded Rolling Stones shirt, his tattooed sleeve on display. I've been so used to him wearing fey attire that seeing him in human clothes in his human home is something out of a dream. I release Des's hand and begin to make my way through his house— my heart aches as I take in the furniture, the photos, the decorations on display, because each one screams Dez. At least Dez as I first knew him, back when I'd never seen his life in the other world. I head through his living room and out the back door. Late afternoon sun hits my skin, and I close my eyes, soaking it in. I might legit cry— it's not eternal night. It's not endless day. It's just your average sunny afternoon in Southern California. Opening my eyes, I continue on, towards the back of the bargainer's property, my attention drifting for a moment to the place where I was taken. Any fear the sight might have once conjured is gone, though I'm not exactly sure why. 
Maybe it's because Carnon's dead, or because the thief has stopped kidnapping women. Or maybe it's not the situation that's changed, but me. I cross the last of the bargainer's backyard, stepping right up to where the land gives way to a cliff's edge. My skin prickles when I hear the sound of the surf crashing below. I take a deep breath, drinking in the smell of salt water. This is where I belong. My gaze moves to the horizon. There's a short expanse of sea that separates my house from his. On a clear day, you can make out the edges of Malibu, and if you have imagination enough, you can draw in my home among those hills. It's the same sight the bargainer must have stared at all our years apart. The sight fills my heart with old agony and something sweeter, like the past and the present and the future all overlay each other. The bargainer steps up next to me. It's warded, you know. I glance at him. Your house. My house, too. They always have been, but after... His voice catches. After you were taken, I doubled down on the wards. I can't promise that you'll be safe here, he says, reminding me of our earlier conversation. But you won't be altogether defenseless, either. I stare at Des. The setting sun sets his features on fire. My siren stirs within me, awakening now that my magic's refueled. We don't need defending, she whispers. We need defending from. I'm not worried. Des flashes me a wicked smile. People like us are not victims, he'd once told me. We're someone's nightmare. His membranous wings appear unfolding menacingly behind him. Ready to go home? I raise my eyebrows. I assumed this was our destination. Aw, oh, Cherub, you didn't think I'd take you this far only to stop now, did you? I search his face, my heart expanding and expanding. He looks like something plucked from my most desperate dreams— my own wings manifest behind me, punching through the material of my shirt. Des tisks at the sight. He places his hand on the clothing, and in an instant the ripped cloth stitches itself back together. Des smooths my shirt down. When his eyes meet mine, they dance. Ready? He asks, backing away. I never get the chance to answer— Des backs right off the cliff's edge, his arms open to the world as he falls backwards. My breath catches at the sight. I should know better by now. The bargainer has wings and magic and the uncanny ability to teleport. Falling isn't going to do him in. He twists in midair, his vicious-looking wings fanning out to catch the breeze. He beckons to me. Coming, baby siren? God, he looks magnificent and otherworldly, bathed in the dying light of our sun. My own wings spread out. I take a running leap from the cliff, and then I'm diving, gliding, soaring. I laugh as the wind buffets me upwards, catching sight of my converses in the process. Fucking flying over the Pacific. The two of us cut across the sky, the ocean blurring by beneath us. This moment could last forever, the breeze whistling through my hair, the blue water beneath me, the fading day above me, and Des and I, two strange birds ghosting above the world. My body is filled to the brim with simple joy. Inevitably, we close in on land. If we had any other destination in mind, perhaps that would be a disappointment but up ahead I catch sight of my house, and a new sort of euphoria moves in to replace the old. Home. Sweet, lovely, lonely home. We touch down in my backyard. I'm back. Never want to leave. I really don't. I want to drink my wine, stare out at the ocean, think deep thoughts, sleep beneath my sheets. I want to do all that but I want to do it with Dez. The bargainer and I head over to my sliding glass door. Dez has only to stare at the handle, and with a snick, the door unlocks itself and slides open. 
Tentatively, I step inside. Home is a house filled with sandy floors, chipped counters, and now my soulmate. He stands in my house like he resides there, like he's always resided there, and the way he looks around, I have every reason to believe he intends to make this place ours. Ours. Not going to get over that. Where are all of our things? He asks. There's that word again. Our. I move through my, our, home, expecting things to be different. It feels like ages since I was last here. In the attic. I couldn't bear to part with all those trinkets Des and I collected during my junior year of high school, but I also couldn't bear to look at them. The pain of his absence always sharpened when I saw those physical reminders. Des clicks his tongue. Cherub, we're going to have to change that. He lifts his hand and I hear a few distant thumps, then the sound of scraping. Less than a minute later, a weathered box floats into the living room, scattering dust motes as it heads our way. It plops to the floor a few feet in front of me. For several seconds, all is still. Suddenly, the lid pops open, causing me to jolt. And then the procession begins. The prayer flags, the Venetian masks, the painted gourd, and the silks. They float out of the box one by one, lining themselves up on the floor. Once our old memorabilia has been removed from the container, my tasteful decorations are lifted from the walls, pushed off tables, and cleared from shelves. They amble through the air, then stack themselves neatly into the box. After they're all settled inside, the cardboard flaps fold over them and the box levitates off the floor. It cants drunkenly back and forth as it heads back the way it came. I raise an eyebrow but say nothing. Dez smiles a calculating spark in his eye. All at once, the objects the two of us collected together, every shot glass and postcard, every hand drawing and note, lift into the air. For several seconds, the items hover in midair. Then, like an explosion, they scatter across the house. Des finds a place for it all, on walls, on shelves, tucked away in cupboards, dangling from the ceiling— I believe this is a fairy's version of peeing on his territory. And my heart is hurting so damned badly. All of these things are testaments to our friendship, because that's what this has always been. Long before I knew Des was my mate, I knew he was my friend. And even though I wanted him in a distinctly unfriend-like way, that's all the two of us were for the better part of a year— I'm taking in my new decorations when the King of the Night comes up behind me. He kisses the juncture where my jaw meets my neck. We'll go on more adventures. Des promises. Buy more trinkets, experience more new places together, both in this world and in the other. I turn around. Why did you bring me here? I ask. Out of all the places in all the worlds, he chose to bring me here. Des has the universe in his eyes. Because I love you, and this is where you're happiest. That's not true. Happiness isn't a place, it's a person. More specifically, the one across from me. The bargainer leads me over to the couch. Now, I was thinking that since we finished watching Harry Potter, we needed a new series to binge on together. I spend the evening wrapped up in the bargainer's arms, the two of us splayed out along my couch. My coffee table is a mess of greasy pizza, popcorn, and raisinets, all casualties of our movie night. Game of Thrones plays on the TV, and it's clear this is Des's kind of show. The dude is hardcore invested. I trail my fingers over his inked arm. I'm supposed to be paying attention to the show, but I can't get over the joy I feel. Des is reclining here on my couch, holding me against him as he watches a show from my living room. Earlier, he ran his hands over my chipped countertops, and his boots have dragged sand across my living room. Little pieces of himself are now scattered all over the place. And he's here not because he wants me to repay the favors I owe, but because he's mine. 
I close my eyes and relish this. More than the other world, it's this moment that seems the dream. Everything that's been thrown at me was so much easier to pallet in a world where cities floated and night reigned eternal. But here in the normal world? A man like Des doesn't belong, and definitely not with a girl like me. I want to cackle for outmaneuvering fate, because I freaking got him, the bad boy who was always so out of reach. The two of us binge-watch a couple more episodes, but somewhere along the way the atmosphere changes. First it's a few light kisses, Des brushes against my hairline, and a few more that I press to the base of his palm— then it's the soft stroke of his fingers petting my skin and the restless way my body reacts to the touch. But it's not until he clicks the TV off that I even realize the bargainer is half as distracted as I've been. Truth or dare? He whispers against my ear. I bite back a smile. Both. Des lifts me off the couch then, turning me in his arms so that I can wrap my legs around his narrow hips. I lock my arms behind his neck, playing with the ends of his hair. He searches my face. Truth. Tell me, sweet little siren, how many nights did you get yourself off to the thought of me when we were apart? I should have known Des would ask something dirty. His magic settles beneath my skin, demanding I answer this embarrassing question. I don't know, I say. Not good enough. The bargainer's magic is getting more demanding, twisting itself around my windpipes. Nearly every night. I glare at him as I answer. And what did you imagine? His magic is still there, pressing against my throat. What do you think I imagined? I say sarcastically. He just waits. His power does the rest, closing in on me. I already gave you one answer, I say. He's already getting a two-for-one deal from this game, and now he's pressing his luck with another question. It's in my nature to take advantage, he says, running a finger down my cleavage. Now you were saying? I press my lips together, though I know it's pointless. The words spill out of me anyway. I imagined you taking me in just about every position possible. I imagined your weight settling on me, your hips between mine. I imagined your evil boy body fucking mine over and over and over again. I imagined it sweet and nice. I imagined it rough and kinky. I imagined you when I was alone and when I was with other men. I even called out your name once. I imagined it all and it still didn't hold a flame against the reality of you. The bargainer watches my mouth as I talk. Finally, he leans in and nips my lower lip. He rolls it between his teeth before releasing it. He smiles in a distinctly masculine way, his wings appearing behind him. You called out my name when you were with another? I feel myself flush. Why had I shared that? Cherub, I think we're going to have to make truth or dare a regular part of our days. God, no. There are so many things, things like what I just divulged, that are better left unsaid. He walks us down the hall towards the back of the house. What's my dare? I ask. I think you'll figure it out soon enough. We enter my bedroom, the lights flicking on. For seven years I yearned to enter this house of yours. Des admits, it ate me up needing to know what sort of life you made for yourself here. My skin pebbles at his confession. That first night I returned to you, he says. You cannot know what it felt like, lounging on your bed, knowing you slept in it. My mind was a mess. His mind was a mess? It was my mind that was a mess. The wicked, untouchable bargainer was back from realms unknown, come to collect his debts and break my heart all over again. I was the bumbling schoolgirl and he the aloof, mysterious one. I've wanted to sleep with you here, he continues. Your body tucked against mine. Gods, how badly I wanted to insert myself into this life of yours. The bargainer's magic tugs at my clothes. One moment they're there and in the next they're a puddle on the floor. 
Now I understand. This is the dare. Sex wrapped up as a game. He lays me over my sheets but doesn't join me. Instead, he stands at the foot of the bed, feasting on my naked form. After several seconds, the bargainer flashes me one of his scariest shit grins. It's trouble in a look. He grabs my ankles and spreads my legs wide, indecently displaying me. I've had my own fantasies of you, taking you right here in your bed. Sliding his hands under my thighs, he drags me to the edge of the mattress. I feel the cool bite of his bronze warbands against my leg. Tonight I'm staking my claim to this bed and everything else here. He presses a kiss to my inner thigh, his lips then dragging across my skin. Starting with you. Chapter 21 Des trails kisses along my inner thigh, moving inward until... until... I fist my sheets and bite back a cry, my skin immediately flaring to life as he nips one of my outer lips, then the other. I feel him smile against me, and that's almost worse. I have no defense against devilish Des. He runs his tongue up my slit, and Jesus Christ and all the saints, this is dirty. The bargainer nips my clit, and now I do cry out. So very, very dirty. Gods, I could eat this pussy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, he says, right before he sucks on my clit. I gasp out something unintelligible. If I wasn't so turned on, I'd be embarrassed. Behind me, my wings begin to form, which is really unfortunate considering they're going to be squashed beneath me. Before I have a chance to force them back, Des's hand slides up my spine, his palm warm pressure against my skin. With a burst of his magic, my wings are gone, neatly taking care of that problem. He keeps sucking on my clit, and I'm beginning to buck against him, fighting to get away. Too much sensation. Too, too much. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, he says, his breath fanning against me. You're going to need to stay in place, Terub. Desmond's magic rolls against me, and you are a terrible person, I gasp out, the words broken. I'm quickly losing the last of my composure. I am, he agrees. He licks and sucks and rolls my clit between his teeth, the bastard only moving away when I'm close to coming. I'm pinned in place by his hands and his magic, and no amount of arching or twisting can get me out of his line of fire. So I'm left to ride his cruel ministrations. And they're really, really cruel. I'm caught in an endless cycle of build-up and let-down, my body winding tighter and tighter. Damn you, let me come, I say, glamour filling my voice but the order I give isn't phrased correctly, and rather than forcing the bargainer's hand, I've allowed him to slip through mine. Des pulls away, releasing my legs as he sits back on his haunches. He runs his tongue over his lower lip, looking like the seven deadly sins wrapped into one, and oh my god, why isn't he finishing this? That's not how this works, love, he says, looking at me like a man bewitched. After a moment, Des leans back in, but just when I think he's going to take up where he left off, he lifts me from the bed. Instinctively, I wrap my arms and legs around him, feeling his cock straining against his pants. Sweet thing, the night's just beginning. With that, he takes my lips in a carnal kiss. I taste myself on his tongue, and that makes my core ache all over again. I lock my ankles together behind him, my fingers mussing his hair. My body is lit on fire, my flesh raw from the way Des worked me. Des carries me across the room until my back thuds against the wall. He breaks off the kiss, leaning his forehead against mine as he breathes heavily. I don't intend for this to be some easy claiming. Claiming, 
He keeps using that word, and not for the first time. I sense his face side trying to consume all that it can. As he holds me, his clothes slide from his skin, pooling beneath us. His hips pull away from mine, and keeping me flush against the wall, he thrusts into me. I gasp at the sensation, my core clutching his cock like a vice. Yes, I bask in the exquisite pressure and fullness, and his overwhelming body straining against mine. I slide my palms over his wide shoulders, feeling the steel bands of muscle beneath. Dez's presence is intimidating enough when he enters a room, but now, when he's driving into me, it's all-encompassing. His hands slide to the backs of my thighs, angling my pelvis so that each stroke of his cock slides deeper than before. He leans his forehead against mine as he hammers me against the wall. This is every wish, Cherub, every dream of mine actualized. I would give up all my secrets— I'd give up my very throne itself, if it meant being with you. I want to say something eloquent, but all that comes out of my mouth is a breathy moan. So smooth. And I like it when my mate moans in my arms. Des says, Hmm, maybe I should make you moan again. The first tendrils of the bargainer's magic lick against my skin. Don't, I say. Glamour filling my voice. Des grins at me, looking thrilled at my response. Our bodies make slick sounds as he pounds in and out of me, and all too soon sensation is building up until I'm coiled tight. Release is right there. All I have to do is let go. Des slides out of me and I nearly cry out. A woman could be driven mad by this. The bargainer drops to his knees hooking my legs over his shoulders. His mouth is inches from my core, but his head is tilted up to take me in. I thought that maybe this was part of his game, to withhold my orgasm as long as possible, but one look in his eyes banishes that thought completely. He's gazing up at me like I'm something akin to his religion, something he might pray to— and right now I feel like a dark queen, my throne made of this man's flesh. Marry me, he says. Time slows and my breathing stops. Marry me. A second ago I was mad with lust, and now... Now... It's not enough to be mated to you, he says. I want it all, if only you'll have me. My hands begin to tremble where they grip him. I can barely hear my thoughts over the pounding of my heart. Marry me and I will cherish you forever, cherub. Marry me. We're already bound by unbreakable forces. The supernatural world sees us as soulmates, as does the other world. Marriage is for humans. Suddenly I feel all of sixteen again, and Des is asking me to prom— Prom, marriage, all of it is for that part of me that has always been a desperate outsider, a loner, that painful part of me that wants to be normal. This is Des giving me normal. God damn it, Des whispers. Please say something, Callie. I shake my head, beginning to smile. Only Des misinterprets my action— his eyes are dying, dying. I cup his cheeks just as I did earlier. Yes, I say, my voice hoarse with emotion. I begin to nod, and once I start, I can't seem to stop. I smile, and it feels like that smile is touching every inch of my face, every inch of this room. A happy laugh slips out. I'm going to marry Des. Life flushes through his face, brightening his features, and I'm sure the world has no use for suns with a smile as bright as his. It spreads across his whole face, his eyes crinkling from the action. You're going to marry me? I nod again, and I'm smiling so hard my face is beginning to hurt. You're going to marry me, he says again, processing it. You're going to be my wife. He lets out his own disbelieving laugh. All at once he stands and my legs slip off his shoulders. He catches me halfway down his torso and then he spins us, pressing me close. 
Right now, it feels like the two of us are in our own little universe. He's my moon, my sun, my stars, my sky, and all that space in between them. Des lays me down on the bed, moving up my body languidly. He takes my mouth, kissing it like he's breathing life into me. My hands rake up his back, brushing against his wings. His wings? I didn't notice them before, but they must have emerged when I said yes. Mine are still locked away from his earlier magic. This time when Des enters me, it's not nearly as carnal as it was minutes before. His wings splay out, shrouding the two of us as he fills me. He pulls out, the action and agony. Years I have waited for this, he says, anticipated it. My wife. He thrusts back into me. Again and again he moves out and in like the tide, each deep rolling stroke a brand, as though he wants to make it known to everyone and everything that we are real, we are together, we are one. This time when Des relentlessly pushes me towards my orgasm, there's nothing there to stop it. Des! I breathe, and then I'm moaning, arching, coming. I climax in his arms, staring into those light eyes of his as I feel myself come apart. The bargainer pounds into me, stretching out my orgasm until he pauses, his breathing stilling for an instant. Then I can feel him thickening. He groans against me. Kelly, he bites out. That's all he manages to say before he gives himself over to sensation, pistoning in and out of me as he rides out his own orgasm. Eventually, his stroke's gentle. Even once he's finished orgasming, he stays in me, brushing my hair back as he stares down at me. Cherub, there's something I'm forgetting. He snaps his fingers, and from the ether, a ring appears between his thumb and forefinger. I believe this is yours. The bargainer's wings are still out, and beyond them, the once bright room is now dark with the Night King's magic. Des slips off of me so that he can take my hand. Pressing a kiss to my ring finger, he begins to slide the piece of jewelry on. The stone set into the band glows faintly. It's no diamond. I'm not one to care about rings, but this one has me mesmerized. What is it? I ask, staring at the glowing stone. I made a deal with the stars. A deal? Of course he did. I smile a little. It's captured starlight. He explains, squeezing my hand. I figure the queen of the night should carry a piece of her kingdom with her. Going to cry all over again. You already had the ring picked out. It's such a ridiculous statement. Obviously, he picked out the ring some time ago. It's not like he interrupted sex to make a deal with the stars on the spot. Des grins, and the sight of it just slays me. Cherub, it would frighten you how long I've carried that ring around. Yeah, I'm sure frightened is not the word I'd use. I'm going to marry you. I get a little zing of excitement just saying the words. I'm going to marry the shit out of you. He agrees. As I stare at him, I think about that old vow, the one that got me into trouble. From flame to ashes, dawn to dusk, for the rest of our lives, be mine always, Desmond Flynn. He kisses my lips. Until darkness dies. Chapter 22 the next morning, when I wake, I open my eyes and see a shock of white blonde hair. Dez's head rests just above my breast, his features softened by sleep. His arms are wrapped around my waist, one of his legs thrown heavily over mine. I can't stop the grin that spreads across my face. Dez is here with me, seducing me in my home. My left hand is buried in his hair— and now I remove it to stare at my ring for the five-thousandth time. Millions of people go through this. Falling in love, getting married, yada, yada, yada. And yet I can't possibly imagine anyone else being as happy as I am in this moment, as in love as I am right now. 
My hand drops back to Dez's white hair, and I pretend for a moment that the two of us have simple lives, that I'm just a human and he is just my fiancé, that he has no realm to rule and that I don't have wings and scales and a fey stalker that wants my head, that we aren't embroiled in an otherworld battle that might destroy everything that fairies hold dear. I pretend for a few minutes that we're just two long-lost lovers reunited at last, that later today we'll hold hands and stroll to the coffee shop down the street. I hear Dez's deep rumble. His face rubs against me, his arms tightening around my waist. He tilts his head up, those luminous eyes finding mine. A slow, easy smile stretches across his face. There's nothing but love in his expression, though even that look on Dez is a bit devious. He brushes a kiss against my sternum. You know, Callie, I've never been partial to daylight, but I definitely think I could get used to this. His hand slips down and begins to pet my thigh. Tell me, how do you feel about sleeping in? The gleam in his eyes is hint enough. We'll be sleeping in sans the sleeping part. I think that sounds amazing. The two of us don't slide out of bed until hours later, caught up in each other. I'm pretty sure heaven consists of endless days like this one. Only reluctantly do I drag myself out of bed, and only then because Des promised to make us breakfast. I watch him now, my shirtless Des moving about my kitchen like this is his house and not mine. I'm pretty sure he feels the place is now his. I try not to smile as he pulls ingredients out of thin air. Eggs dance in midair and bell peppers chop themselves. All the while, Des whistles away, his hair tied back. My eyes move lower, taking in his muscled body and his sleeve of tattoos. The bargainer is a thing of beauty, a deadly, wily thing, but a beautiful one nonetheless. It's as I'm relishing the sight of him that I notice the claw marks scouring his back. I hiss in a breath. Apparently unbeknownst to me, my claws came out to play earlier. Dez turns around, instantly alarmed. What is it? I nod to his back. I hurt you. He casts a glance over his shoulder. I know he can't see the markings, but he must recall them because he smirks. If you're feeling truly terrible about it, Callie, I'm sure we could work out a way for you to repay. Dez! That's what I get for being thoughtful. He laughs, then turns back to my stove where he's cooking up an omelet. I realize then that he could have simply healed himself. Much like Malachi with temper's hickey, he hadn't. Never going to understand fairies. The bargainer flicks his spatula-wielding hand and a mug of coffee prepares itself. Once it's finished, it floats across the kitchen to where I sit. For you, my love, he says, not bothering to turn around. I catch the mug out of the air. You're the best, I say, taking a grateful sip. Was there ever any doubt? He glances over his shoulder and winks at me. It's only a short while later that Des finishes the omelets, my dish floating over to me, his trailing after. They clatter down on the table, forks and napkins hustling through the air after them. Dez takes a seat across from me, dragging his chair back, and holy Jesus, a shirtless Dez is sitting at my table. My lady parts aren't handling the situation well. He raises his eyebrows at me and looks pointedly at the meal. The bargainer leans back in his chair. Stop it. Stop what? Giving me your fuck-me eyes. I'm trying to be a gentleman and not screw you right here on your kitchen table. I set my coffee aside. The table can take a beating. This may legitimately be heaven. Can we do this always? I ask. I'm sitting cross-legged on the table, my clothing skewed. Scattered across the floor are the remnants of breakfast, the omelets splattered across the ground, the dishes shattered to pieces. Why hadn't Des and I come back to Earth sooner? It's obvious this is where we get our freak on. Honeymoon, my house, then Dez's house, then somewhere in the clouds between the two. 
Des steps up to me, his pants back in place. He brushes a kiss against my lips, then extends a hand. The pieces of my broken mug vibrate off the floor, then fit themselves back together. The splattered coffee funnels itself into the air and then back in the mug. The bargainer hands it to me. Need you even ask such a question? I'll insist we do this. I take the cup of coffee from him. Thanks. He sits down next to me on the kitchen table, a mug of his own floating into his hand. Breakfast begins to fix itself back up, the omelets reforming, the plates piecing themselves together. They clatter onto the table. What shall we do today? Des sounds downright devious. I thought we'd already figured that one out. Demanding little siren. I'm nothing but your little sex doll, aren't I? I shake my head, blowing on my coffee. Somehow Des managed to make it steaming hot. You have me all figured out. He flashes me a mischievous smile. I was thinking we might do a little something between shags. He snaps his fingers. Ah, I know. I glance over at him. He looks a little too conniving for my taste. A minute later, a box floats out of my guest room. At first, I think we're doing Redecorating Callie's Home Part 2. But then I recognize the box heading our way. I nearly drop my mug. What are you doing, Des? This is not a part of my past that I want to explore with him right now. Or ever. The box drops onto the ground in front of us. What does it look like I'm doing? Digging up all your dirty little secrets. Oh, look. This box isn't dusty like ours was. Someone revisits these things frequently. I'm clenching my mug now. The cardboard flaps of the box pop open. I lean forward and slam a hand down on them, closing the box back up. Let's not. Come now, love. I want to see Callie's naughty chest. I almost fight him on it. Even though he's seen my worst, this is not a collection I'm proud of. But then this is what our relationship is built on. We share our dirty little secrets with one another, things that no one else might accept us for. So eventually I lift my hand. Fine. The flaps pop open once more. My heart's pounding a little faster and my fingers are a little twitchy. No one else has seen what's in this container. The first thing that levitates out is a gold necklace. A man's gold necklace. It pulls in Dez's waiting hand. What's the story behind this? He asks. If I close my eyes, I can still see the man clearly. Wiry, lean frame, mean, squinty eyes. Not all my targets look like bad people, but this one did. Keith Sampson. His ex wanted sole custody of their children, so she had me dig up dirt on him. Among the long list of very fucked-up shit he did in his life, he beat his wife, sold drugs to minors, and got his daughter hooked on heroin so that the cow could lose some fucking weight. Just remembering Keith has my sirens stirring with agitation. What did you do to him? Daz asks, curious. Grovel? Cry? Demean himself? I made him turn himself in. Hmm. Des says, staring at the necklace. I get the distinct impression he's listening to the shadows right now. That theory only solidifies when he smirks, then sets the piece of jewelry aside. The next thing that comes out is a hand-drawn map. Arnold Mattis, I say. His girlfriend, Christina Ruiz, had hired me to... deal with Arnold. Several years ago, Arnold beat, raped, then repeatedly stabbed his girlfriend after she tried to leave him. The crime scene photos still haunt me. He got off with rape and assault charges, was sentenced to 10 to 30 years, but was put on parole early. When I found Arnold, he had that map on him, Christina's address written out on it. Along with the map, he had bleach, rope, duct tape, and a hammer stowed away in the trunk of his car. What happened to him? I happened. Arnold and I played a game called An Eye for an Eye. He didn't like it much. I did. Next to come out of the box is an embroidered iron-on patch of a flaming skull. 
it lands in Dez's palm, a bit of black leather still clinging to it. Racist biker. The bargainer waits for more explanation. I shrug. I don't know, it was a bad day and he pissed me off. That guy was such an asshole, and I had absolute power over him, despite his enormous size and his white-hot temper. Dez pulls out a tooth. He holds the incisor up. Cherub, this looks more like my work than yours. Now that he mentions it, it does. I take the tooth from him, rolling it between my fingers. I close my eyes for a moment, hearing an echo of this man's screams. Human trafficker. I can still see his crisp white shirt and the smoke that curled from his cigarette. He looked at me like I was livestock. The memory still gives me chills. But I'm also proudest of that particular case. I ended up saving over a hundred men, women, and children. I left him alone in a room with his victims and their families. Did he die? I shake my head. He begged for it, but no. I never said I was a good person, but I came pretty close to the devil with this one. The tooth is proof enough of that. I brought all of these men close to death, I say, looking down at the tooth. For several seconds, the bargainer doesn't say anything. Finally, how close? Close enough to feel that ancient power move through me, the same power that compelled my ancestors to kill? I clear my throat. Close enough to know I should feel ashamed. Close enough to really enjoy it. Des huffs out a laugh. But you're not. It isn't a question. No. Not at all. The box is full of mementos of the cruelest, most sinister people in the world. People who hurt children, who abused loved ones, who tried to get away with murder. Not even prison or death can atone for the atrocities they've committed. I might be the closest they ever come to a true reckoning on Earth. Des shakes his head. God's damn it, but we're similar. Did I make you this way? You didn't do anything. Except maybe give me a template on how to work with criminals. I was this way before you met me. At the reminder, the edges of the room darken. It's actually pretty heartening seeing Des get upset for me even after all this time. He toes the box. Think I should pay these guys a visit? I doubt they'd survive it. The bargainer doesn't have the same issue with death that I do. Still, I smile at the thought of the King of Night in his leather pants and vintage T-shirts dropping in on these men so that he can wreak a little havoc, and all because they pissed his mate off at one point in time. I thread my fingers through his. Marriage with you is going to be fun. Chapter 23 Enchantress I suck in a breath at the voice. It comes from everywhere all at once. Enjoying your time on Earth. I swivel in a circle, my feet digging into sand. Sand? That's when my surroundings come into focus. There's a beach and the ocean and a cliff. A very familiar cliff. This is the beach beneath my house. I've been here a thousand times, usually alone. If my house is my sanctuary, this strip of land is my temple, and right now it's being defiled. Nice view, the thief says, his breath against my ear. My skin flares to life as fear floods through me. I spin to face him. The thief is clad in dark clothes, human clothes. I thought I'd seen him at his scariest before, but the thief masquerading as a human might be the most frightening version of him. How did you know where I was? I ask. Calypso. He runs a hand through his jet black hair. I know everything. No supernatural is that omnipotent. The thief of souls levels his pitiless gaze on me. For a moment, we simply look at one another. Then his eyes dip lower. 
That trick you do with your skin? He says. I quite like it. He leans in close, his mouth brushing my ear. I imagine being inside you is like fucking a star. The thief straightens, running a hand down his shirt and smoothing out the imaginary wrinkles. Speaking of stars... Before I realize what he's doing, he captures my left hand. He angles it so that he can get a good look at my ring. The King of Night didn't go cheap when he popped the question. And you said yes. What did you think I'd say? No? That I was saving myself for you? He chuckles at that. What a mortal thought. I rather enjoy our talks, Enchantress. No, I want you to enjoy your mate's company for as long as you possibly can. You see, life is just one long story. I don't really care how yours begins. Only how it ends. That sends a foreboding chill down my spine. The thief sits down in the sand then, and it's so disarming. You expect evil to be obvious. You never expect it to act like anyone else might. He pats the ground next to him. Join me. I stare down at him. I don't intend to stay here. Would you rather go back into your house? Care to see if your mate's there? He says. I wonder what that would be like, me cornering the two of you in your own home. Maybe we could all kiss and make up for our trespasses. That visual physically hurts. Or I could just hold you down and deflower your virgin cunt while the Night King is forced to watch. This conversation is over. I walk away from him. I haven't taken five steps when the earth violently rolls, throwing me onto my back. Beneath me, the sand shifts, then resettles. I blink up at the sky, a couple of seagulls crying out as they fly overhead. You are in my realm, Enchantress. Here we play by my rules, the thief says. He sits right next to me, and I have no idea whether he moved to my side or whether the earth deposited me at his. My fingers dig into the sand. If I'm in his realm, a realm I only visit when I fall asleep, then... I push myself up, studying his profile. So you control small death and everything that happens here? Like shaking the ground and throwing me onto the sand? The thief's eyes brighten. The P.I. finally put it together. How very keen of you. This asshole. I huff out a laugh. You know what your problem is? I say, rotating to face him once more. You think you're some special brand of evil, but you aren't. I've met plenty of men like you before. Men that use and break and destroy. He gives me a sly smile, and I've never seen features so cold. It scares me. Truly, it does. I've caught the attention of an abominable thing, and I know the moment he really, truly gets his hands on me, not in some dream, but in the real waking world, he's going to ravage me. I assure you, Enchantress, he says, you've never met a man like me. I wake in Dez's arms, my body covered in a cold sweat, I'm panting, my chest rising and falling. A moment ago, the thief and I were sitting out on the beach beyond my backyard, and I can't shake the nonsensical belief that he's still out there, staring up at my house, debating whether or not he should break down the door and fuck with me and Dez. I clasp onto the bargainer's forearm as he cradles my head and neck. I close my eyes and will my heart rate to slow. When I open my eyes, the bargainer is smoothing my hair away from my face. We used to do this together, he says softly. Back in your dorm room? You used to get nightmares, and I'd wake you from them. Because even when we weren't a we, Daz was still saving me over and over again. Do you remember? He asks quietly. I nod against him. And now the nightmares are back, and this time I can't save you from them. I draw in a shaky breath and press a hand to my clammy forehead. He can control dreams. The thief. He called the place his kingdom. Des frowns, his forehead wrinkling as his gaze searches my face. 
I think he's about to tell me something, but the moment passes and his words never come. Out my bedroom windows, I can hear the surf crashing against the shore. It's one more visceral reminder of my dream. I shudder out of breath. I don't know why he's targeting me. I'm embarrassed by how weak I sound. Listen to me, Dez says, gripping me tightly. The Thief of Souls may be powerful, but you are no one's victim. Do you understand? I swallow and nod. Dez searches my face, the moonlight casting his face in shades of blue. Think you'll be able to fall back to sleep? He asks. And end up in another one of the thief's sick dreams? I shake my head. The bargainer lets out a breath. Then let's grab breakfast. I glance at the clock on my nightstand. It's 3.02 a.m. Where are we going to get breakfast this early? Dez just grins. I fucking love you, you know that, right? I ask, pulling apart a chocolate croissant. Around us, sunlight filters into Douglas Cafe. It may be the middle of the night in Malibu, but it's nearly lunchtime on the Isle of Man. The place is abuzz with people chatting over coffee and pastries, life moving along the same way it did when we used to come here a decade ago. It's always nice to be reminded. Dez kicks his booted feet up on the table, leaning back to sip his espresso. The years might pass, but watching the big bad bargainer drink coffee from a tiny cup will never get old. I take a sip from my coffee, watching a group of teenage witches gossip as they wait in line to order. Do you ever wish you had that? Dez asks, following my gaze. Had what? The bargainer smirks. Don't be coy, cherub. You know what I'm talking about. Girlfriends. A posse. A group of women that have your back and you have theirs. People who you'd shop with, borrow shit from, tell all your secrets to. There have been moments where I'd wanted all of that so desperately it hurt. I take a deep breath, setting my mug down. Sometimes, when I don't think about what it would have cost me, if I hadn't been so desperately silent, lonely, all except a distant I moan, I rub my arms. Those body shots are going to have to be the most delicious mouthfuls of tequila in the world. Des places a hand on my back and leans over to kiss my temple. That's the closest he comes to apologizing for the rotten trick he's played on me. He leads me down the hall and the place seems all but abandoned. Business is really booming, I say. Dez's mouth quirks, but the rest of his face is stoic. We stop in front of a door. Behind it, the moaning is louder. Whoever is foreseeing futures here, it sounds like they're busy ruining someone else's life. Maybe we should just come back later. Without any warning, the bargainer blasts the door open. Knock, knock. Inside the room, a naked woman shrieks from where she lays sprawled on the desk, the man on top of her scrambling to disentangle himself. Oh, shit, the man says, catching sight of Dez. He rapidly tries to shove his junk back into his slacks. Just, ew. The mostly naked woman screams again, trying pretty unsuccessfully to cover herself up. I guess that explains the moans. I thought you said we had an appointment. I hiss at Dez. My mate doesn't look at me, instead shaking his head at the man. You know better than to mix business with pleasure, Colin. Guess that's the seer. Color me unimpressed. The bargainer waves his hand idly, and the clothes the woman is trying to put on fit themselves to her body. She yelps, then scrambles from the room. Damn it! The man says, watching the woman leave before turning his attention to Dez. You could have called. He has a point. After all, forewarned is forearmed. My clients always say that, Dez says. Problem is, when I call, they have a bad habit of disappearing, and I have a bad habit of finding them and adding interest to their bill. Really, this is better for all parties involved. Colin grabs his discarded shirt and slips it back on. What do you want? He asks, disgruntled. He buttons up his shirt and leans back against the desk. 
going to need a Bible and some holy water to clean the deeds off that piece of furniture. I feel the breath of Dez's magic leave him. A moment later, it slides the seer's shirt sleeve up, revealing two jagged tally marks. I step forward, instantly curious. It's rare to see one of Dez's clients with more than one of his tattoos. Probably means that Dez trusts Colin. Remind me again how many months you've had these? The bargainer asks. The man pulls his sleeve back down, fidgeting with the cuff. I get a glimpse, then, of how young he really is. Mid-twenties, maybe? And now that I'm looking for it, there are indications that he's uncomfortable in the clothes he wears. After what we walked in on, I wasn't expecting that from this guy. I'm willing to pay off my debt, Colin says. Just tell me what you want. Now I hear Colin's rough-around-the-edges accent. A scenario takes shape. A kid with promise but not a lot of options approaches the bargainer. The bargainer sees something of himself in the young man, so he helps him a little more than his other clients, and thus the young seer has an inspiring rags-to-riches tale and only two debts to show for it. Colin's eyes move to me, and there they catch. Who's this? He asks with a tad more interest than is professional. It doesn't matter who she is. What matters is what you can do for her, Dez says. The seer's face turns cocky. He gestures for me to come forward. Wash your goddamn hands first, Dez growls. You're not touching her after having your fingers in some broad's pussy. Colin raises his eyebrow but gets up. I see our time apart hasn't made you any nicer. Dez's eyes flick briefly around the room. I see our time apart has made you richer. The seer grunts. Giving me a little nod, he leaves the room. I turn to the bargainer. Why are we doing this? Really don't want to be here. Cherub, I personally promise that if Colin does anything you don't like, I open my mouth. Other than foreseeing your future, damn it, I close my mouth. I will personally gut him from navel to throat. Jesus. Well, I'll collect my last favor from him, then I'll gut him navel to throat. Des amends. No one needs to gut anyone else, I just... The door opens and the rest of my words die away as Colin returns. All right, the seer says. Where were we? His eyes fall to me, brightening with interest. Oh, right, you want a reading. I don't want a reading, I say just because I figure that point needs clarifying. Colin turns to Dez. Give her a reading. Ugh. The seer clears his throat. Okay. Please take a seat, Mom. He gestures to a nearby couch. I'm sure I look like a petulant child as I take a seat. I mean, I get it, just because my stepfather was Satan. That's not literal. I've heard Satan is actually a lot nicer than Hugh Anders. Doesn't mean all seers suck but it also doesn't mean I have to be a good sport about this. Colin sits down next to me, and Dez moves to the wall across from the couch, leaning against it and folding his arms, his biceps stretching the sleeves of his ACDC shirt. Seriously unfair that the bargainer can look that tasty even when I'm annoyed at him. I'm Colin, the seer says, drawing my attention back to him. Figure you ought to know my name before I go peering into your future. I'm about to clap back that I already know his name, and this sucks, and everything sucks, but I force out a smile. Callie. Nice to meet you. Yeah, whatever. The seer takes my hands, his thumbs stroking my skin in a way that's not entirely professional, but maybe that's just me. I stare down at our hands, and as I look at them, I begin to sense his heartbeat pounding beneath his skin, moving magic with blood. His human power fills my senses. His ability is strong. Staggeringly so. My eyes flick up to Colin. I think I'm waiting for incense, incantations, at the very least an open flame or a shallow bowl of water to divine my future from. My stepfather had a bowl he used to carry around that was meant for scrying. He never used it on me. He never dared to face his monstrous deeds head on. But he liked using it with clients. 
This fear doesn't do any of that. He breathes in deeply, his gaze fixed on mine, his eyes searching, searching. They unfocus. My own gaze goes to Dez, who settled himself in a nearby chair. With one booted foot, he's tilted the seat so it rests on its two back legs. When he catches me staring, the edge of his mouth curls up. He begins to levitate himself and the chair, entertaining me like he used to when I was a teenager. I begin to snicker. Eyes on me, the seer says gently. My attention returns to Colin. The two of us stare at one another for a long time. Long enough to make me shift in my seat and for this to feel awkward. Long enough for me to vividly visualize those body shots. It takes another minute and then Colin begins to speak. I see another entity shadowing you, slipping into your consciousness when it has a chance. What can do that? The seer murmurs to himself. This is no incubus. This is no earthly being. It will continue to haunt you. It wants to... I'm not sure. It wants you. Enchantress. That name. I tense. Jess's chair lands harshly. Now Colin closes his eyes. Seconds pass and his breathing seems to slow. This feels like it's going off script. The seer's eyes snap open. I rear back. I know the creature staring behind those eyes. This is no seer. Not anymore. He begins to speak. Hurry, Enchantress, you're running out of time. I try to pull my hands free, but Colin's grip tightens. I'll devour you slowly. Your life is mine. The corner of Colin's mouth curls up into a sinister smile. So flee from me, for once I'm through, I'll be freeing myself and coming for you. The seer drops my hands, coughing and rubbing his throat. When he glances up again, the thief is no longer in his eyes. What the fuck was that? He rasps. I'm shivering, and not just from apprehension. The room's grown cold and dark. Dez steps out from the shadows. That was a creature in need of extermination, he says, helping me off the couch. What else did you foresee? He asks, staring at Colin. The seer clears his throat, still rubbing at it. I saw darkness and death, and something about it was... aware. Whatever that shit was, it's closing in on her, he says, nodding to me. If no one stops that thing, then it will get a hold of her. And in that case... Colin looks at me apologetically. Death is not what you should worry about. Death is not what you should worry about. That should be the thief's slogan. I've already seen that when it comes to this monster. There are other brutally twisted things he can do that circumnavigate death. And now my mind conjures up all sorts of impossible things that are worse than death. See, this is what I mean about wanting to have a normal life. Normal people don't have to worry about things worse than simply dying. Colin rolls his shirt sleeve up just as one of the two black lines disappears from his skin. That was all you really wanted? He asks. Would you like me to take more? The darkness still hasn't lifted. No, no, the seer rushes to say. Then I'll be around, Dez says. And professional tip, try to keep your dick in your pants during the workday. It's bad for business. Desmond puts a hand on my back. Ready to go, Cherub? He says, his voice gentling for me. I nod. More than ready. Colin reaches a hand out, presumably to shake Dez's. The bargainer looks down at it with mild distaste. Instead of taking the seer's hand, a black business card manifests between Dez's fingers. You know how this works. We're not fucking chums. Give my card to a friend in a tight place or don't, but don't forget where we stand. You still have a favor left. I guess that's as close as the bargainer ever gets to his nicer clients. Colin takes the card from Dez, and that should be the end of things. It's not. 
Maybe Colin is cocksure or curious, or maybe he just wants to make a point. But at the last minute, he grasps Dez's hand anyway, forcing the bargainer into a hostage handshake. The moment Colin's skin comes in contact with my mates, the seer sucks in a breath, his eyes unfocusing. Methinks someone else is getting their fortune read. Next to me, Dez's form flickers. One second, Colin has him in a handshake, and in the next, Dez grabs the seer by the throat. He slams Colin back against the wall. I'm sorry, but I don't remember asking you to fucking read my future. The bargainer says calmly. There's nothing to give away his simmering anger. No shadows, no outline of wings. Nothing. Colin pries at Dez's fingers uselessly, but the more their skin comes into contact, the worse off the seer appears to be. Colin's eyes roll back, his breath choking. His body spasms once, twice. I step forward. Des, what are you doing? I ask, alarmed. He frowns at the seer. Nothing. As if to prove his point, the bargainer releases the man. Colin crumples to the ground, his body weak and shaking. He moans, his eyelids fluttering. He coughs. Bargainer. The Night King stares impassively at him. You pull that stunt again, you'll lose those fingers one by one. Dez glances over at me. Ready, Cherub? Uh, yep. Dez places a hand on my back and leads me to the door. Wait! Colin calls out from behind us. The bargainer doesn't slow. There's something you should know, the seer says, his voice hoarse. The darkness. The darkness will betray you. Chapter 24 We don't speak until we're a block away from the building. How would you like a beer? The bargainer finally says. Des. It's barely a whisper. I need a beer. Des. I stop. I feel like I can't catch my breath. You can't just pretend the last ten minutes didn't happen. The bargainer mutters something under his breath. He turns to me, his hair looking like snow against the gray London backdrop. Callie, nothing is going to happen to me. He sounds so sure of himself, like he's impervious to harm. I want to shake him. That seer said the darkness would betray you, Des. The seer is a little prick who got too big for his britches. Why is he not listening? He looked into your future. Callie. He takes my hand, rolling my engagement ring a little. Always have to be wearing a piece of the bargainer's jewelry. It's all right. I'm not discounting Colin's words. What will come to pass will come to pass, but you need to trust in me. Can you do that? No. Ugh, yes. It feels like I just got you back. I glance down at my feet before looking at the bargainer again. I can't lose you twice. Who said anything about losing me? Des asks. Don't let your mind play tricks on you now, love. Betrayal is not the same as death. I take a deep breath. He's right. Begrudgingly, I nod. You good? Daz asks. Nope. Not really. I want those body shots. Desmond found us a themed club after all. One that offers body shots. Alchemy, a nightclub in London, is decked out to look like a sorcerer's paradise. Every last decoration tied into black magic and spellcasting. Cherub, this is a bad idea. Des gazes up at me from where he lays, fake flickering candles encircling him. He looks like a sacrificial offering among it all, and I guess that's the point. You love bad ideas, I say. I hold a little vial of salt in one hand and a lime in the other. So fucking excited. Normally, this one I'm not so sure of. Under his breath, he says, Would have been more fun if our roles were reversed. I lean in close, my mouth inches from his. I'll make sure you enjoy yourself. I punctuate the statement by running the lime wedge around the bargainer's navel. 
His eyes brighten, and through our bond I sense the barest hint of his excitement. He is such a liar. He's thrilled about the situation just as much as I am. My attention moves from his face to his torso. I follow the lime wedge with a circle of salt. Honestly, this is so sexy it should be illegal. Des flashes me a wolfish smile. Enjoying yourself, cherub. Just a little. I place the lime wedge in his mouth and flag down the waiter. A man dressed in sorcerer's robes comes over with a handle of tequila. At my signal, he pours the amber liquid into Dez's navel. Once he's done, I lean in. I smile at Dez as I lick the salt off his abdomen. A groan slips from between his teeth. Pressing my lips to his navel, I swallow down the tequila. Beneath my mouth, the bargainer's muscles flex. I place a hand against them as I rise, the alcohol burning down my throat. I lean in again, pressing my lips against the bargainer's, then take the lime wedge between my teeth, the citrus cutting through the bite of the alcohol. Once I set the lime aside, Dez sits up and swivels to face me, kicking off an array of candles in the process. He places his hand on a slab between his legs. Have you had your fill, love? That's a trick question, right? I lean in. Not even close. Des keeps his shirt off for the rest of the night, and the entire female population of this place can't handle it. Seriously, they can't. It's a problem. Everyone is looking at you, I say. Des sits on the bar, drinking straight from a bottle of fancy whiskey. He's really not supposed to be doing either, but when I told him that, he simply said, Rules are meant to be broken. Then he winked, took a sip of his whiskey, and I spontaneously orgasmed. Okay, the last one didn't happen, but it was a near thing. I sit on the bar stool like a normal, grown-ass woman, while my fairy king all but pins me in with his legs. Not that I'm complaining about it. At all. I mean, I'm right at eye level with his abs. There are worse views. Daz lowers his bottle of whiskey. Everyone is looking at you, cherub. He shakes his head. The years may pass, but at the end of the day, you're still that high school girl who's woefully unaware of her own beauty. A woman steps up to the bar next to us, her arm innocuously brushing Dez's thigh. Sorry, she says, apologizing even though half the people in this place are touching the other half. I give the bargainer a pointed look. See? He ignores the woman, instead leaning forward. Your wings are starting to show, baby siren. I'm keenly aware of that. Alcohol plus fey possessiveness plus all my lusty thoughts are making it nearly impossible to hide them. The woman leans into Dez, and this time when her arm brushes his thigh, it's no accident. Do you come here often? She asks Dez, ignoring me completely. My skin brightens, and I look at the woman. Scoot. Without another word, the woman pushes away from the bar, moving back into the crowd. So that was technically against the law, but God, it felt good. Is someone jealous? Des flashes a devilish smile, taking another swig from his bottle. Psh, no. Yes. I glance at my skin and frown as it dims. This is a supernatural bar, right? Not exclusively. Using the hand that holds the bottle of whiskey, Des crooks a finger at me. I don't move so much as his magic presses me up against him. Which means that, much as I love these, he touches a wing. Oh crap, they're out again. We're going to have to put them away. Beneath his palm, I feel Dez's magic pour into me, just as it did the last time he hid my wings back at my house. There's a momentary pressure as the magic forces them to disappear, and then they're gone. We stay at the nightclub for another hour, moving from the bar to the dance floor to an area where we can just stand and mingle. The entire time the patrons of this place watch me and Dez, and there's so much in their looks. Lust, envy... Avarice. The bargainer does nothing but seed it. 
I can taste his magic in the air, reckless and wild, beckoning people to make bad decisions. Eventually they do. They drink more, touch more, and creep ever closer to us. Soon fights are breaking out, at least two couples appear to be participating in some heavy petting, and Des and I have scared off a dozen people interested in poaching on this relationship. Do you do this at every party you attend? I ask. Do what? He asks, appearing innocent. Rile people up. He smiles. Are you not having a good time? I literally almost clawed a woman apart five minutes ago. She'd inserted herself between me and Des and then proceeded to flirt with my mate, at least until he conveniently sidestepped her to rejoin me. Shame I stopped that so soon. Ugh. This is what happens when your soulmate is a fairy. True shows of devotion often involve spilling blood. But you're forgetting all the men and women who've approached you, he adds. Men and women who then took one look at the menacing bargainer and rethought their game plans. Des sets the beer he now holds on a nearby table. Why don't we call it a night? The body shots have been drunk, the good times have been had, and everyone else here is now a sloppier mess than either of us. It's as good a time as any to get going. The two of us leave the club, heading down a couple blocks until we get to a local cemetery. Once there, Des leads me through a ley line entrance, the air wavering as we step through. It takes less than a minute to travel from London back to California, and when we step off the ley line, we're back in Des's house— the bargainer whisks me out of the circular portal room, the door clicking shut at my back, lock after intricate lock engaging. I glance at Des, who leans against the door for a moment. He's got the devil in his eyes when he looks at me. What? I say. My blood is beginning to rush through my veins. You didn't think I'd let you take those body shots without repayment now, did you? Des says. In a blink, he's in front of me. Shamefully, his shirt is back on. It brushes against mine as he steps into my space, backing me against a nearby wall. How do you want it? On the floor, against the wall, or over the counter? Christ! My skin begins to glow as my siren awakens, drawn by sex and magic. His hand dips into my pants and cups my sex. Or would you rather I choose for you? I gasp, my hands coming to his upper arms, my fingers digging in. It takes little effort for him to slide my panties aside and dip a finger into my core. I'm taking that as choose for me. Des. He's feral and overwhelming and silver-tongued and so very, very fey. A second finger dips in. I moan at the sensation. My fingernails sharpen as I clutch him, my claws pricking his skin. My nails dig deeper, and the king of the night grins when they pierce his flesh. We really are a twisted pair, getting off on blood and sex. My breath is coming in pants, my legs parting wider as I urge him on. His nose and lips brush my flushed cheeks. Or perhaps I'll choose none of that. How I do love seeing you fall apart at my touch. Perhaps my touch is all you'll get. He nips at my chin, toying with me, clearly enjoying that I'm clay in his hands right now, ready to be molded into whatever shape he wants. A minute ago, I wasn't thinking of sex. Now I'm lamenting the slow torture of him burning me up without properly filling me. I begin to reach for his pants when he catches my wrist and pins it to the wall. Uh-uh. That's not how this works. Des kisses my neck, then moves his attention to my mouth, tasting like liquor and dark deeds. All the while, his deft fingers stroke me up and down. He takes my lower lip between his teeth, rolling it around, his clever eyes particularly devious. He releases my lip. Come against my hand. Des demands. It's the same pushy order he used to give me back when I had a bracelet of beads. And even though the bracelet is long gone, I feel the bargainer's magic bloom between my legs. Strange and forbidden. 
My knees go weak as my orgasm is pulled from me, sweeping through my system. The pleasure is violent and sudden. It seems to stretch on and on, and even once the waves of it abate, the come-down seems to last a lifetime. I lean my head against the wall, breathless and flushed. You are such a bastard, I murmur. Oh, you don't really mean that, Cherub, Des says, removing his fingers from my panties. He places the two of them in his mouth, licking them clean. Have I mentioned how dirty he is? It only takes a minute or so for me to regroup from getting fingered within an inch of my life. My siren is riding high. Far from being satiated, she's only just gotten a taste of sex. Pushing off the wall, I prowl over to the bargainer. Taking his jaw gruffly, I kiss his mouth. For a guy that specializes in favors, your repayment plans lately could use some work. I say, tapping the side of his jaw with a clawed forefinger. I'm sure I look just as devious as he does. Releasing his jaw, I kneel down in front of him. Callie. I begin to unbutton his pants, glancing up at him. Dez's eyes are crackling with desire. Dez wants to tell me to stop, but he also wants my lips around his cock, and he wants that very badly. The zipper makes a hissing noise as I pull it down. Lucky for you, when it comes to repayment, I'm willing to help. Chapter 25 The world forms from chaos, blurs of color sharpening until they become things. The first thing I notice is the tickle of wheat against my open palm. Then it's the vivid blue sky bearing down on me, then it's the thief. He walks through the fields dressed in black, looking like a reaper come to collect my soul. Like the last dream, seeing him this way is disarming. If you take the monster living under your bed and put it in broad daylight, what then? He comes up to me, uncomfortably close. This is where I cringe away from him, where I revolt. You went to bed with one man and woke with another. How very confusing, he says. I'm not awake. It's on the tip of my tongue, but then I hesitate. I get the uncanny feeling that this is what I'm supposed to say, that the thief has our entire interaction choreographed, and it's all part of our little game. Only I no longer want to play. I'm done revolting, done being scared, done acting according to some preordained script. Rather than responding, I squint at our surroundings. From horizon to horizon, it's endless golden fields rippling under a painfully blue sky. The sifting sounds of wind sing through the wheat. How do you choose where we meet? I ask. His hair stirs as he answers. Whatever pleases me in the moment. That's what I choose. As my eyes take in that sharp blue sky, clouds begin to roll on the horizon. They move unnaturally swift, gathering on each other. The Thief of Souls can build dreamscapes and wear the faces of the dead. Two staggering powers. The clouds darken like bruises until they've shadowed the land. The sky splits open above us and the heavens unleash. Lightning flashes and thunder booms. Rain pelts down on me, and the wind lashes against my body, whipping my hair about. I feel like I'm at the center of some terrible vortex, and the magnitude of it all is dizzyingly beautiful. Does it frighten you? The thief asks. He watches me carefully, the wind and rain tearing at him. No. I turn to him, my wet hair slapping at my skin. Do you want it to? An enigmatic smile crosses his face, and his eyes flash alongside the lightning. Just as swiftly as the storm moves in, it retreats. The rain stops, the sky clears, and the sun peeks out again. I think you have better things to fear from me. He begins to circle me. Things worse than death. I remember Carnon's prison, the women shackled in iron, 
raped by the thief, slowly losing themselves to his dark magic. I think of the soldier I interviewed. It's dark here. Very dark. I want to rest. Why can't I rest? He comes back to my front. I will never leave you alone, Enchantress. Never. Banish the hope if you have it. You cannot ever escape my clutches, not even in death. I search his dark eyes. What have I done? Is it being a siren? Is it as simple and as shallow as pretty skin molded over pretty bones? Or is it something more specific to me? Something that went wrong long ago? There's a part of me, a long dormant part of me, that's awakening. It should have been pulled free back in high school, when my powers blossomed, or when Karnon altered me, or even when Dez fed me the lilac wine. But it wasn't. It didn't happen then, but I can feel it now, some long-buried strength upwelling from deep within me. The thief tilts his head. What have you done? He echoes. You have enlivened me. You make me feel the blood rushing through my veins. He steps in close. You have aroused me. Dirty human, beautiful woman, unlikely enchantress. You have caught my attention, and I will enjoy you. For a time. I'm not going to escape him. This is the one simple truth I've been denying for so long. And now I face it. I'm really not going to escape him. One day soon I will have to face the thief. Not in a dream, but in waking life. A reckoning is coming for us, and by the end of it, one of us will be the victor, and one the vanquished. I will break you again and again until there is nothing left to break. The thief says softly, running his knuckles over my cheek. Break me? I've been thinking about this wrong all my life. I'm not porcelain to be shattered. I'm something else entirely. Break me? I level my pitiless gaze on him. You can try. The next morning when I wake, I'm alone in Dez's bed. For a moment I simply lay there, gathering my pillow up and breathing in the bargainer's scent. Eventually I sit up, running my hands through my hair. On the bedside table, a cup of coffee sits. The note beside it says, Till darkness dies. A little smile slips out. I take the mug and sip, letting my mind drift. Inevitably, my thoughts move to last night's dream. For the first time since I started having them, I'm not frightened by the nightmare. The Thief of Souls and I are pitted against one another, not as hunter and hunted, but as adversaries. And that detail changes everything. Since Karnon's death, I've been in the business of running, so much so that I haven't truly done any chasing. Setting my coffee aside, I slip out of bed and rifle through Dez's things until I find a notebook and a pen. Clambering back into bed, I uncap the pen and press it to the page. The Thief of Souls controls dreams, small death, wears the bodies of the dead, wields dark magic, places fairies into a stupefied state, fathers children who drink blood and prophesies. Most of the attributes have something to do with death, and those that don't seem to be attributes of night fairies. Not that this knowledge brings me any closer to answers. Stupid mystery. I could just glamour the thief and force the confessions out of him. Holy shit. I could do that. Why have I not thought of this sooner? I'm elated for 2.5 seconds before I remember that I freaking already tried this hat trick after I drank the lilac wine when he came to me in a dream. It didn't do a damn thing but excite the freak. So much for that idea. Unless dreams have their own sort of logic to them, maybe he's only impervious to my glamour in dreams. I rub my forehead. I mean, who the fuck knows at this point? I'm running in circles here, and all I'm managing to do is to confuse myself. Setting my notes aside, I push myself out of Dez's bed. I steal an Iron Maiden shirt from his drawer, ignoring the folded set of women's clothing clearly meant for me, 
Grab my mug, then pad down the hall. I find the king of the night in his living room, blessedly shirtless as he paces back and forth. He stares down at an unrolled piece of parchment, his brow furrowed and his lower lip pinched between his fingers. His eyes move from his work to me. A grin spreads across his face when he catches sight of my T-shirt. That is a very good look on you, Callie. I hold up the mug. Thanks for the coffee. Any time, love. What are you reading? I ask, coming over to him. His gaze drops to the paper and his frown returns. Reports on the state of the other world. For a moment, the information is a shock. I'd almost managed to forget that even on Earth, Dez has a host of responsibilities he still must attend to. See, this is proof I'd make a shitty queen. What are they saying? I ask. Malachi tracked Galagar to the Fauna Kingdom, but lost him there. And as far as the kingdoms themselves go, Flora and Fauna are suffering massive casualties. The wholesale slaughter in those kingdoms continues— the thief soldiers are moving to all the big cities and killing any fay they come across. The sleeping soldiers are sustaining heavy losses themselves. Flora and Fauna Fay aren't just going down without a fight. But the carnage continues. This entire time, fairies have been dying. While I was taking body shots off of Dez, those soldiers were cutting through innocence. My stomach rolls at the thought. You let yourself be idle. My siren whispers. This is what happens. Why would the thief do that? Conquering is a blood sport, but these kingdoms have already fallen. There's no reason the deaths should continue. Why would he indeed? Des looks up from the paper, meeting my eyes. You have a box of memorabilia from some of the worst humans. What would they do if they came into power? They'd kill and maim and run their kingdoms lawlessly, and no one would be safe but for them. This isn't a human we're dealing with, I object. Humans have their own drives, Fay another. Evil doesn't work that differently between worlds, Des says, although Fay do have a knack for creativity and flair. Des sets the parchment aside. Oh, by the way, I thought you should know. Typhus Henbane is dead. It takes me a minute to place the name. The King of the Banished Lands. The one who we come to for news of Galagar. The man with a city's worth of stolen magic is now dead, and I'm at least partially responsible for it. Yesterday that piece of information would have sat like a stone in my stomach. Today... Today I'm in an odd mood. What happened? I asked. Exactly what you feared might happen. His people rose up against him and slaughtered him. They took back their magic. The magic he'd forced them to barter away. Bartered magic. My eyes snapped to Dez. What? I run back to his bedroom, only to find the bargainer is already there waiting for me. He stands, arms folded, watching me with curious eyes. Sidestepping him, I grab the paper I left on the bed and stare at my notes. Can I have my timeline? I beckon to Des with my hand. Wordlessly, the bargainer produces the timeline I'd created days ago, dropping it in my hand. I set the two papers side by side on the mattress. Over my shoulder, the bargainer stares down at them. It was right in front of me the entire time. Galagar and the thief share powers. Chapter 26 Galagar and the thief share powers. I don't know how or when or why the two of them are linked up, but I would stake serious money the two are co-bound. That would explain why Galagar keeps popping up during our search for the thief. He's hooked on the same magical power line that the Thief of Souls is. So long as their magic is bound together, you can't have one without the other. The proof of their strange partnership is mapped out on the timeline— Centuries ago, Galagar is killed. Only his body is incorruptible, defying the natural order. For two hundred years, he lay dormant, much like the sleeping soldiers, until he was awoken by a shadow, a shadow similar to the one that haunted the sleeping women and the casket children. 
When I turn to face Des, he looks... horrified. The expression is only there for a moment before he tucks it away. His gaze moves to mine. Gods. He takes a step closer. That would explain why my power wouldn't destroy the sleeping soldiers. Because the shadows are loyal to their own. Even if the thief isn't a night fay, his life and magic is co-bound to a man who is one. The darkness will betray you. I grab my notes and read over the list of the thief's traits. His powers obviously have something to do with necromancy, but necromancers are mortal and the thief is not. Des, can you think of any fay that can do what the thief can? It's an old question, one the two of us have run around a dozen times already, so I'm not surprised when Des shakes his head. Whatever the shadows tell Des, they won't tell him this. There are some secrets not even they will give up. Unfortunately, those are the secrets worth knowing. The day passes idly enough. Des and I have a proper breakfast, then lounge and bask in each other, and the hours flit by. By midday, I'm swimming in the ocean beneath Des's house. I even manage to drag the King of Night into those chilly waves. And far from shore, I show him that sirens don't just like killing men in the water. We enjoy fucking them, too. At some point, we head back over to my house. Des fixes the busted faucet in my spare bathroom, and I give him a very personal thank you. We cook, we chat, we enjoy each other. It's simple and lovely and quintessential, and yet... Neither Des nor I get to have this life. Not while the thief and Galagar are terrorizing the world, and no amount of bargaining can change that. At some point, our little vacation here on Earth will end, and we'll have to go back to the other world and deal with all the problems we left behind. I spin my engagement ring round and round my finger. And then, abruptly, I stop spinning it as a thought comes to me. There is one thing I'd like to do before our time here is up. My gaze moves to Dez's. Take me to Venice. It's been eight years since I've been to this place. Eight shockingly long years. And yet walking next to the canals, you'd think it was only yesterday that I convinced Des to take me on one of his bargains. Even now my heart skips a beat remembering that first time I watched him work. His world was supposed to frighten me, but it had the opposite effect. I got a taste for his secrets, his favors, his magic— that was the first night I peered into his world. So it feels only right to come back here now. Next to me, Des studies my face. I still haven't told him my reasons for coming here. Secrets, Cherub, are my thing, not yours, he says. But his eyes are bright, like he very much enjoys whatever little trick I have up my sleeve. It's a good trick, too. Give me an hour alone. Des raises his eyebrows. What mischief are you going to get into without my company? Aw, is someone feeling excluded? Too bad. The kind you're not privy to. Des narrows his eyes. Go find something to do for an hour, I say. I know how to reach you. Hmm, he says, assessing me. His eyes rise, taking in the glittering lights of Venice— it's late here, but the city is still alive with music, voices, laughter. The place is under its own sort of spell. I'm supposed to just entertain myself in the meantime? Here? Without you? He doesn't say this last bit, but I hear it nonetheless. And it warms me to my toes. I'm sure this is not the first night you found yourself with time to kill. He takes a lock of my hair and twists it around his finger. Fine, Callie. I'll find something to do. He says this like he's going to look for trouble. While I wait. I part my lips to respond when Des disappears into thin air. The lock of hair he'd been twisting now flutters back down to my shoulder. My heart pounds a little louder. I've got an hour. Best to make it count. I know what I want the moment my eyes land on it. I'm even surer once I run my fingers over it. 
Right now I hold the great secret I'm trying to keep from Dez. His wedding band. I angle the ring back and forth under the light of the jewelry shop. Tiny pieces of crushed mother of pearl catch the light. Their iridescent color isn't as flashy as I'm used to. It looks closer to moonstone than anything else. But it isn't the moon I want Dez to be reminded of. It's the sea. My mate gave me a piece of his night sky. I'm giving him a piece of my ocean. The siren practically purrs at the thought. I run my finger over the band again, my heart beating fast. I never thought I was the sentimental type, but here we are. I'll take this one, I tell the jeweler. I buy the wedding band and leave the shop. I haven't even taken ten steps when I stop and pull the ring out of the small velvet case it's nestled in. I roll it between my fingers as I stare down at it. There's one last thing I want. I've rarely tried to tap into Dez's magic, but then I've had no reason to. Now I do.